Chapter Seven, Part A of His Masterpiece by Emil Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. When Claude found himself once more on the pavement of Paris, he was seized with a feverish longing for hubbub and motion, a desire to gad about, scour the whole city, and see his chums. He was off the moment he awoke leaving Christine to get things ship-shape by herself in the studio which they had taken in the Rue de Douai, near the Boulevard du Clichy. In this way, on the second day of his arrival, he dropped in at Maudot's at eight o'clock in the morning, in the chill grey November dawn which had barely risen. However, the shop in the Rue de Cherchez-Midi, which the sculptor still occupied, was open, and Maudot himself, half asleep, with a white face, was shivering as he took down the shutters. "'Ah, oh, it's you! The devil! You've got into early habits in the country? So it's settled you're back for good?' "'Yes, since the day before yesterday.' "'That's all right. Then we shall see something of each other. Come in. It's sharp this morning.' But Claude felt colder in the shop than outside. He kept the collar of his coat turned up and plunged his hands deep into his pockets, shivering before the dripping moisture of the bare walls, the muddy heaps of clay, and the pools of water soddening the floor. A blast of poverty had swept into the place, emptying the shelves of the casts from the antique, and smashing stands and buckets, which were now held together with bits of rope. It was an abode of dirt and disorder a mason's cellar going to rack and ruin. On the window of the door, besmeared with whitewash, there appeared in mockery, as it were, a large beaming sun, roughly drawn with thumb-strokes, and ornamented in the centre with a face, the mouth of which, describing a semicircle, seemed likely to burst with laughter. "'Just wait,' said Maudot, "'a fire's being lighted.' These confounded workshops get chilly directly with the water from the covering cloths. At that moment, Claude, on turning round, noticed Shane, on his knees near the stove, pulling the straw from the seat of an old stool to light the coals with. He bade him good morning, but only elicited a muttered growl, without succeeding in making him look up. "'And what are you doing just now, old man?' he asked the sculptor. "'Oh, nothing of much account.' It's been a bad year, worse than the last one, which wasn't worth a rap. There's a crisis in the church statue business. Yes, the market for holy wares is bad, and, dash it, I've had to tighten my belt. Look, in the meanwhile, I'm reduced to this. He thereupon took the linen wraps off a bust, showing a long face still further elongated by whiskers, a face full of conceit and infinite imbecility. It's an advocate who lives nearby. Doesn't he look repugnant, eh? And the way he worries me about being very careful with his mouth. However, a fellow must eat, mustn't he? He certainly had an idea for the salon. An upright figure, a girl about to bathe, dipping her foot in the water, and shivering at its freshness with that slight shiver that renders a woman so adorable. He showed Claude a little model of it which was already cracking, and the painter looked at it in silence, surprised and displeased at certain concessions he noticed in it. A sprouting of prettiness from beneath a persistent exaggeration of form, a natural desire to please, blended with a lingering tendency to the colossal. However, Maudot began lamenting. An upright figure was no end of a job. He would want iron braces that cost money, and a modelling frame, which he had not got, in fact, a lot of appliances. So he would, no doubt, decide to model the figure in a recumbent attitude beside the water. "'Well, what do you say? What do you think of it?' he asked. "'Not bad,' answered the painter at last. "'A little bit sentimental, in spite of the strapping limbs. But it'll all depend upon the execution. And put her upright, old man.' upright, for there would be nothing in it otherwise. The stove was roaring, and Shane, still mute, rose up. He prowled about for a minute, entered the dark back shop where stood the bed that he shared with Maudot, and then reappeared, his hat on his head, 
but more silent, it seemed, than ever. With his awkward peasant fingers, he leisurely took up a stick of charcoal and then wrote on the wall, I am going to buy some tobacco, put some more coals in the stove, and forthwith he went out. Claude, who had watched him writing, turned to the other in amazement. What's up? We no longer speak to one another. We write, said the sculptor quietly. Since when? Since three months ago. And you sleep together? Yes. Claude burst out laughing. Oh, dash it all, they must have hard nuts. And what was the reason of this falling out? Then Maudot vented his rage against that brute of a Shane. Hadn't he, one night, on coming home unexpectedly, found him treating Mathilde, the herbalist woman, to a pot of jam? No, he would never forgive him for treating himself in that dirty fashion to delicacies on the sly, while he, Maudot, was half starving and eating dry bread. The deuce! One ought to share and share alike and the grudge had now lasted for nearly three months without a break, without an explanation. They had arranged their lives accordingly. They had reduced their strictly necessary intercourse to a series of short phrases charcoaled on the walls. As for the rest, they lived as before, sharing the same bed in the back shop. After all, there was no need for so much talk in life. People managed to understand one another all the same. While filling the stove, Maudot continued to relieve his mind. Well, you may believe me if you like, but when a fellow's almost starving, it isn't disagreeable to keep quiet. Yes, one gets numb amidst silence. It's like an inside coating that stills the gnawing of the stomach a bit. Oh, that Shane! You haven't a notion of his peasant nature. When he had spent his last copper without earning the fortune he expected by painting, he went into trade a petty trade, which was to enable him to finish his studies. Isn't the fellow a sharp an, eh? And just listen to his plan. He had some olive oil sent to him from Saint-Fermain, his village, and then he tramped the streets and found a market for the oil among well-to-do families from Provence living in Paris. Unfortunately, it did not last. He is such a clodhopper that they showed him the door on all sides, and as there was a jar of oil left which nobody would buy, well, old man, we live upon it. Yes, on the days we happen to have some bread, we dip our bread into it. Thereupon he pointed to the jar standing in a corner of the shop. Some of the oil having been spilt, the wall and the floor were darkened by large greasy stains. Claude left off laughing. Ah, misery, how discouraging it was! How could he show himself hard on those whom it crushed? He walked about the studio, no longer vexed at finding models weakened by concessions to middle-class taste. He even felt tolerant with regard to that hideous bust. But all at once he came across a copy that Shane had made at the Louvre, a Mantegna, which was marvellously exact in its dryness. Oh, the brute, he muttered. It's almost the original. He's never done anything better than that. Perhaps his only fault is that he was born four centuries too late. Then, as the heat became too great, he took off his overcoat, adding, He's a long while fetching his tobacco. Oh, his tobacco. I know what that means, said Maudot, who had set to work at his bust, finishing the whiskers. He has simply gone next door. Oh, so you still see the herbalist. Yes, she comes in and out. He spoke of Mathilde and Shane without the least show of anger, simply saying that he thought the woman crazy. Since little Jabouille's death, she had become devout again, though this did not prevent her from scandalizing the neighborhood. Her business was going to wreck, and bankruptcy seemed impending. One night, the gas company, having cut off the gas in default of payment, she had come to borrow some of their olive oil, which, after all, would not burn in the lamps. In short, it was quite a disaster. That mysterious shop with its fleeting shadows of priests' gowns, its discreet confessional-like whispers, and its odour of sacristy incense, was gliding to the abandonment of ruin. 
and the wretchedness had reached such a point that the dried herbs suspended from the ceiling swarmed with spiders, while defunct leeches which had already turned green floated on the tops of the glass jars. "'Hullo, here he comes,' resumed the sculptor. "'You'll see her arrive at his heels.' In fact, Shane came in. He made a great show of drawing a screw of tobacco from his pocket, then filled his pipe and began to smoke in front of the stove, remaining obstinately silent, as if there were nobody present. And immediately afterwards Mathilde made her appearance like a neighbour who comes in to say good morning. Claude thought that she had grown still thinner, but her eyes were all afire, and her mouth was seemingly enlarged by the loss of two more teeth. The smell of aromatic herbs, which she always carried in her uncombed hair, seemed to have become rancid. There was no longer the sweetness of chamomile, the freshness of aniseed. She filled the place with a horrid odour of peppermint that seemed to be her very breath. "'Already at work!' she exclaimed. "'Good morning!' And without minding Claude, she kissed Maudot. Then, after going to shake hands with the painter in her brazen way, she continued— what do you think? I've found a box of mallow root, and we will treat ourselves to it for breakfast. Isn't that nice of me now? We'll share. Thanks, said the sculptor. It makes my mouth sticky. I prefer to smoke a pipe. And seeing that Claude was putting on his overcoat again, he asked, Are you going? Yes, I want to get the rust off and breathe the air of Paris a bit. All the same, he stopped for another few minutes, watching Shane and Mathilde who stuffed themselves with mallow root, each taking a piece by turns. And though he had been warned, he was again amazed when he saw Maudo take up the stick of charcoal and write on the wall, Give me the tobacco you have shoved into your pocket. Without a word, Shane took out the screw and handed it to the sculptor who filled his pipe. Well, I'll see you again soon, said Claude. Yes, soon, at any rate next Thursday at Sandoz's. Outside, Claude gave an exclamation of surprise on jostling a gentleman who stood in front of the herbalists peering into the shop. "'What, Jory? What are you doing here?' Jory's big pink nose gave a sniff. "'I? Nothing. I was passing and looked in,' said he in dismay. Then he decided to laugh, and as if there were anyone to overhear him, lowered his voice to ask, "'She is next door with our friends, isn't she? All right, let's be off quick.' and he took the painter with him, telling him all manner of strange stories of that creature Mathilde. "'But she used to say that she was frightful,' said Claude, laughing. Jory made a careless gesture. "'Frightful? No, he had not gone as far as that. Besides, there might be something attractive about a woman, even though she has a plain face.' Then he expressed his surprise at seeing Claude in Paris, and when he had been fully posted, and learned that the painter meant to remain there for good, he all at once exclaimed, "'Listen, I am going to take you with me. You must come to lunch with me at Irma's.' The painter, taken aback, refused energetically, and gave as a reason that he wasn't even wearing a frock-coat. "'What does that matter? On the contrary, it makes it more droll. She'll be delighted. I believe she has a secret partiality for you. She's always talking about you to us. Come, don't be a fool. I tell you, she expects me this morning.' and we shall be received like princes. He did not relax his hold on Claude's arm, and they both continued their way towards the Madeleine, talking all the while. As a rule, Jory kept silent about his many love adventures, just as a drunkard keeps silent about his potations, but that morning he brimmed over with revelations, chaffed himself, and owned to all sorts of scandalous things. After all, he was delighted with existence, his affairs went apace. His miserly father had certainly cut off the supplies once more, cursing him for obstinately pursuing a scandalous career. But he did not care a rap for that now. He earned between seven and eight thousand francs a year by journalism, in which he was making his way as a gossipy leader-writer and an art critic. The noisy days of The Drummer, the articles at a Louis apiece, had been left far behind. He was getting steady, wrote for two widely circulated papers, and although in his inmost heart he remained a sceptical voluptuary, a worshipper of success at any price, 
he was acquiring importance, and readers began to look upon his opinions as fiat's. Swayed by hereditary meanness, he already invested money every month in petty speculations, which were only known to himself, for never had his vices cost him less than nowadays. As he and Claude reached the Rue de Moscou, he told the painter that it was there that Irma Beko now lived. "'Oh, she's rolling in wealth,' said he, "'paying twenty thousand francs a year rent, and talking of building a house which would cost half a million.' Then, suddenly pulling up, he exclaimed, "'Come, here we are. In with you, quick!' But Claude still objected. His wife was waiting for him to lunch. He really couldn't. And Jory was obliged to ring the bell and then push him inside the hall, repeating that his excuse would not do, for they would send the valet to the Rue de Douai to tell his wife. A door opened and they found themselves face to face with Irma Beko, who uttered a cry of surprise as soon as she perceived the painter. "'What? Is it you, savage?' she said. She made him feel at home at once by treating him like an old chum, and, in fact, he saw well enough that she did not even notice his old clothes. He himself was astonished, for he barely recognized her. In the course of four years she had become a different thing, her head was made up with an actress's skill, her brow hidden beneath a mass of curly hair, and her face elongated by a sheer effort of will, no doubt. And from a pale blonde she had become flaringly carroty, so that a Titianesque creature seemed to have sprung from the little urchin-like girl of former days. Her house, with all its show of luxury, still had its bald spots. What struck the painter were some good pictures on the walls, a courbet, and above all an unfinished study by Delacroix. So this wild, willful creature was not altogether a fool, although there was a frightful cat in coloured biscuit standing on a console in the drawing-room. When Jory spoke of sending the valet to his friend's place, she exclaimed in great surprise, "'What, you are married?' "'Why, yes,' said Claude simply. She glanced at Jory, who smiled. Then she understood, and added, "'Ah, but why did people tell me that you were a woman-hater? I'm awfully vexed, you know. I frightened you, don't you remember, eh? You still think me very ugly, don't you? Well, well, we'll talk about it all some other day.' It was the coachman who went to the Rue de Douai, with a note from Claude, for the valet had opened the door of the dining-room to announce that lunch was served. The repast, a very delicate one, was partaken of in all propriety under the icy stare of the servant. They talked about the great building-works that were revolutionizing Paris, and then discussed the price of land, like middle-class people with money to invest. But at dessert, when they were all three alone with the coffee and liqueurs, which they had decided upon taking there, without leaving the table, they gradually became animated, and dropped into their old familiar ways, as if they had met each other at the Café Baudequin. "'Ah, my lads,' said Irma, "'this is the only real enjoyment, to be jolly together and to snap one's fingers at other people.' She was twisting cigarettes. She had just placed the bottle of chartreuse near her, and had begun to empty it, looking the while very flushed, and lapsing once more to her low street drollery. So, continued Jory, who was apologizing for not having sent her that morning a book she wanted, I was going to buy it last night at about ten o'clock, when I met Fagerolles. You are telling a lie, said she, interrupting him in a clear voice, and to cut short his protestations, Fagerolles was here, she added, so you see that you are telling a lie. Then, turning to Claude, "'No, it's too disgusting. You can't conceive what a liar he is. He tells lies like a woman, for the pleasure of it, for the merest trifle. Now the whole of his story amounts simply to this, that he didn't want to spend three francs to buy me that book. Each time he was to have sent me a bouquet, he had dropped it under the wheels of a carriage, or there was no flowers to be had in all Paris.' Oh, there's a fellow who only cares for himself, and no mistake. Jory, without getting in the least angry, tilted back his chair and sucked his cigar, merely saying with a sneer, 
Oh, if you see Fasherel now. Well, what of it? she cried, becoming furious. It's no business of yours. I snap my fingers at your Fasherel, do you hear? He knows very well that people don't quarrel with me. We know each other. We sprouted in the same crack between the paving stones. Look here, whenever I like I have only to hold up my finger, and your Fagerolle will be there on the floor licking my feet. She was growing animated, and Jory thought it prudent to beat a retreat. My Fagerolle, he muttered, my Fagerolle. Yes, your Fagerolle. Do you think that I don't see through you both? He is always patting you on the back, as he hopes to get articles out of you and you affect generosity and calculate the advantage you'll derive if you write up an artist liked by the public. This time Jory stuttered, feeling very much annoyed on account of Claude being there. He did not attempt to defend himself, however, preferring to turn the quarrel into a joke. Wasn't she amusing, eh, when she blazed up like that, with her lustrous wicked eyes and her twitching mouth eager to indulge in vituperation? But remember, my dear, this sort of thing cracks your Titianesque makeup, he added. She began to laugh, mollified at once. Claude, basking in physical comfort, kept on sipping small glasses of cognac one after another without noticing it. During the two hours they had been there, a kind of intoxication had stolen over them, the hallucinatory intoxication produced by liqueurs and tobacco smoke. They changed the conversation. The high prices that pictures were fetching came into question. Irma, who no longer spoke, kept a bit of extinguished cigarette between her lips and fixed her eyes on the painter. At last she abruptly began to question him about his wife. Her questions did not appear to surprise him. His ideas were going astray. She had just come from the provinces, he said. She was in a situation with a lady and was a very good and honest girl. Pretty? Why, yes, pretty. For a moment Irma relapsed into her reverie. Then she said, smiling, Dash it all! How lucky you are! Then she shook herself and exclaimed, rising from the table, Nearly three o'clock. Oh, my children, I must turn you out of the house. Yes, I have an appointment with an architect. I am going to see some ground near the Parc Manson, you know, in the new quarter which is being built. I have scented a stroke of business in that direction. They had returned to the drawing-room. She stopped before a looking-glass, annoyed at seeing herself so flushed. "'It's about that house, isn't it?' asked Jory. "'You have found the money, then?' She brought her hair down over her brow again, then, with her hands, seemed to efface the flush on her cheeks, elongated the oval of her face, and rearranged her tawny head, which had all the charm of a work of art, and finally, turning round, she merely threw Jory these words by way of reply. Look, there's my Titianesque effect back again. She was already, amidst their laughter, edging them towards the hall, where once more, without speaking, she took Claude's hands in her own, her glance yet again diving into the depths of his eyes. When he reached the street he felt uncomfortable. The cold air dissipated his intoxication. He remorsefully reproached himself for having spoken of Christine in that house, and swore to himself that he would never set foot there again. Indeed, a kind of shame deterred Claude from going home, and when his companion, excited by the luncheon and feeling inclined to loaf about, spoke of going to shake hands with Bongrand, he was delighted with the idea, and both made their way to the boulevard de Clichy. For the last twenty years, Bongrand had there occupied a very large studio, in which he had in no wise sacrificed to the tastes of the day, to that magnificence of hangings and knick-knacks with which young painters were then beginning to surround themselves. It was the bare, greyish studio of the old style, exclusively ornamented with sketches by the master, which hung there unframed, and in close array like the votive offerings in a chapel. The only tokens of elegance consisted of a cheval glass of the First Empire style, a large Norman wardrobe, and two armchairs upholstered in Utrecht velvet and threadbare with usage. In one corner, too, a bearskin which had lost nearly all its hair covered a large couch. However, the artist had retained since his youthful days, which had been spent in the camp of the Romanticists, 
the habit of wearing a special costume, and it was in flowing trousers, in a dressing gown secured at the waist by a silken cord, and with his head covered with a priest's skull cap, that he received his visitors. He came to the door himself, holding his palette and brushes. So here you are. It was a good idea of yours to come. I was thinking about you, my dear fellow. Yes, I don't know who it was told me of your return, but I said to myself that it wouldn't be long before I saw you. The hand that he had free clasped Claude's in a burst of sincere affection. He then shook Jory's, adding, And you, young pontiff, I read your last article, and thank you for your kind mention of myself. Come in, come in, both of you. You don't disturb me. I'm taking advantage of the daylight to the very last minute, for there's hardly time to do anything in this confounded month of November. He had resumed his work, standing before his easel, on which there was a small canvas, which showed two women, mother and daughter, sitting sewing in the embrasure of a sunlit window. The young fellows stood looking behind him. "'Exquisite!' murmured Claude at last. Bongrand shrugged his shoulders without turning round. "'Pooh! A mere nothing at all. A fellow must occupy his time, eh? I did this from life at a friend's house, and I am cleaning it a bit. "'But it's perfect. It is a little gem of truth and light,' replied Claude, warming up. "'And do you know what overcomes me is its simplicity, its very simplicity?' On hearing this, the painter stepped back and blinked his eyes, looking very much surprised. "'You think so? It really pleases you? Well, when you came in, I was just thinking it was a foul bit of work. I give you my word I was in the dumps, and felt convinced that I hadn't a scrap of talent left.' His hands shook, his stalwart frame trembled, as with the agony of travail. He rid himself of his palate, and came back towards them, his arms sawing the air, as it were, and this artist, who had grown old amidst success, who was assured of ranking in the French school, cried to them, "'It surprises you, eh? But there are days when I ask myself whether I shall be able to draw a nose correctly. Yes, with every one of my pictures. I still feel the emotion of a beginner. My heart beats, anguish parches my mouth. In fact, I funk abominably. Ah, you youngsters, you think you know what funk means, but you haven't as much as a notion of it. For if you fail with one work, you get quits by trying to do something better. Nobody is down upon you, whereas we, the veterans, who have given our measure, who are obliged to keep up to the level previously attained, if not to surpass it, we mustn't weaken under penalty of rolling down into the common grave." And so, Mr. Celebrity, Mr. Great Artist, wear out your brains, consume yourself in striving to climb higher, still higher, ever higher, and if you happen to kick your heels on the summit, think yourself lucky. Wear your heels out in kicking them as long as possible, and if you feel that you are declining, why make an end of yourself by rolling down amid the death rattle of your talent, which is no longer suited to the period. Roll down, forgetful of such of your works as are destined to immortality, and in despair at your powerless efforts to create still further. His full voice had risen to a final outburst like thunder, and his broad flushed face wore an expression of anguish. He strode about and continued as if carried away in spite of himself by a violent whirlwind. I have told you a score of times that one was forever beginning one's career afresh, that joy did not consist in having reached the summit, but in the climbing, in the gaiety of scaling the heights. Only you don't understand, you cannot understand. A man must have passed through it. Just remember, you hope for everything, you dream of everything. It is the hour of boundless illusions, and your legs are so strong that the most fatiguing roads seem short. You are consumed with such an appetite for glory that the first petty successes fill your mouth with a delicious taste. What a feast it will be when you are able to gratify ambition to satiety. You have nearly reached that point, and you look right cheerfully on your scratches. Well, the thing is accomplished. The summit has been gained. It is now a question of remaining there. Then a life of abomination begins. 
you have exhausted intoxication and you have discovered that it does not last long enough that it is not worth the struggle it has cost and that the dregs of the cup taste bitter there is nothing left to be learnt no new sensation to be felt pride has had its allowance of fame you know that you have produced your greatest works and you are surprised that they did not bring keener enjoyment with them from that moment the horizon becomes void no fresh hope inflames you there is nothing left but to die and yet you still cling on you won't admit that it's all up with you you obstinately persist in trying to produce just as old men cling to love with painful ignoble efforts ah a man ought to have the courage and the pride to strangle himself before his last masterpiece while he spoke he seemed to have increased in stature reaching to the elevated ceiling of the studio and shaken by such keen emotion that the tears started to his eyes and he dropped into a chair before his picture asking with the anxious look of a beginner who has need of encouragement then this really seems to you all right i myself no longer dare to believe anything my unhappiness springs from the possession of both too much and not enough critical acumen the moment i begin to sketch i exalt it then if it's not successful i torture myself it would be better not to know anything at all about it like that brute jean bouvard or else to see very clearly into the business and then give up painting really now you like this little canvas claude and jory remained motionless astonished and embarrassed by those tokens of the intense anguish of art in its travail had they come at a moment of crisis that this master thus groaned with pain and consulted them like comrades the worst was that they had been unable to disguise some hesitation when they found themselves under the gaze of the ardent, dilated eyes with which he implored them, eyes in which one could read the hidden fear of decline. They knew current rumours well enough. They agreed with the opinion that since his village wedding the painter had produced nothing equal to that famous picture. Indeed, after maintaining something of that standard of excellence in a few works, he was now gliding into a more scientific, drier manner. Brightness of colour was vanishing. Each work seemed to show a decline. However, these were things not to be said. So Claude, when he had recovered his composure, exclaimed, "'You never painted anything so powerful!' Bongrand looked at him again, straight in the eyes then he turned to his work in which he became absorbed making a movement with his herculean arms as if he were breaking every bone of them to lift that little canvas which was so very light and he muttered to himself confound it how heavy it is never mind i'll die at it rather than show a falling off he took up his palette and grew calm at the first strokes of the brush while bending his manly shoulders and broad neck about which one noticed traces of peasant build remaining amid the bourgeois refinement contributed by the crossing of classes of which he was the outcome silence had ensued but jory his eyes still fixed on the picture asked is it sold bongrand replied leisurely like the artist who works when he likes without care of profit no i feel paralyzed when i've a dealer at my back and without pausing in his work he went on talking, growing waggish. Ah, people are beginning to make a trade of painting now. Really and truly I have never seen such a thing before, old as I am getting. For instance, you, Mr. Amiable Journalist, what a quantity of flowers you fling to the young ones in that article in which you mentioned me. There were two or three youngsters spoken of who were simply geniuses, nothing less jory burst out laughing well when a fellow has a paper he must make use of it besides the public likes to have great men discovered for it no doubt public stupidity is boundless and i am quite willing that you should trade on it only i remember the first starts that we old fellows had dash it we were not spoiled like that i can tell you we had ten years labour and struggle before us ere we could impose on people a picture the size of your hand 
whereas nowadays the first hobbledehoy who can stick a figure on its legs makes all the trumpets of publicity blare. And what kind of publicity is it? A hullabaloo from one end of France to the other, sudden reputations that shoot up of a night and burst upon one like thunderbolts amid the gaping of the throng. And I say nothing of the works themselves, those works announced with the salvos of artillery, awaited amid a delirium of impatience, maddening Paris for a week, and then falling into everlasting oblivion. "'This is an indictment against journalism,' said Jory, who had stretched himself on the couch and lighted another cigar. "'There is a great deal to be said for and against it, but devil a bit, a man must keep pace with the times.' Bongrand shook his head, and then started off again amid a tremendous burst of mirth. "'No, no, one can no longer throw off the merest daub without being hailed as a young master. Well, if you only knew how your young masters amuse me!' But as if these words had led to some other ideas, he cooled down and turned towards Claude to ask this question. "'By the way, have you seen Fagerolles' picture?' "'Yes,' said the young fellow quietly. They both remained looking at each other. A restless smile had risen to their lips, and Bongrand eventually added, "'There's a fellow who pillages you right and left.' Jory, becoming embarrassed, had lowered his eyes, asking himself whether he should defend Fagerolles. He, no doubt, concluded that it would be profitable to do so, for he began to praise the picture of the actress in her dressing-room, an engraving of which was then attracting a great deal of notice in the print-shops. Was not the subject a really modern one? Was it not well painted in the bright, clear tone of the new school? A little more vigour might perhaps have been desirable, but every one ought to be left to his own temperament. And besides, refinement and charm were not so common by any means nowadays. Bending over his canvas, Bongrand, who as a rule had nothing but paternal praise for the young ones, shook and made a visible effort to avoid an outburst. The explosion took place, however, in spite of himself. "'Just shut up, eh, about your Fagerolles? Do you think us greater fools than we really are? There, you see the great painter here present. Yes, I mean the young gentleman in front of you. Well, the whole trick consists in pilfering his originality and dishing it up with the wishy-washy sauce of the School of Arts. Quite so.' You select a modern subject, and you paint it in the clear, bright style, only you adhere to correctly commonplace drawing, to all the habitual pleasing style of composition, in short, to the formula which is taught over yonder for the pleasure of the middle classes. And you souse all that with deftness, that execrable deftness of the fingers, which would just as well carve coconuts, the flowing, pleasant deftness that begets success, and which ought to be punished with penal servitude, do you hear? He brandished his palette and brushes aloft in his clenched fists. You are severe, said Claude, feeling embarrassed. Fagerolles shows delicacy in his work. I have been told, muttered Jory mildly, that he has just signed a very profitable agreement with Naudet. That name, thrown haphazard into the conversation, had the effect of once more soothing Bongrand, who repeated, shrugging his shoulders, Ah, no day, ah, no day. And he greatly amused the young fellows by telling them about no day, with whom he was well acquainted. He was a dealer who, for some few years, had been revolutionizing the picture trade. There was nothing of the old fashion about his style. The greasy coat and keen taste of Papa Malgras the watching for the pictures of beginners, bought at ten francs, to be resold at fifteen, all the little humdrum comedy of the connoisseur, turning up his nose at a coveted canvas in order to depreciate it, worshipping painting in his inmost heart, and earning a meagre living by quickly and prudently turning over his petty capital. No, no, the famous Naudet had the appearance of a nobleman with a fancy pattern jacket, a diamond pin in his scarf, and patent leather boots. He was well pomaded and brushed, and lived in fine style, with a livery stable carriage by the month, a stall at the opera, and his particular table at Bignon's, and he showed himself wherever it was the correct thing to be seen. For the rest, he was a speculator, a stock-exchange gambler, not caring one single rap about art. 
but he unfailingly scented success. He guessed what artist ought to be properly started, not the one who seemed likely to develop the genius of a great painter, furnishing food for discussion, but the one whose deceptive talent, set off by a pretended display of audacity, would command a premium in the market. And that was the way in which he revolutionized that market, giving the amateur of taste the cold shoulder, and only treating with the moneyed amateur, who knew nothing about art, but who bought a picture as he might buy a share at the stock exchange, either from vanity or with the hope that it would rise in value. At this stage of the conversation, Bongrand, very jocular by nature, and with a good deal of the mummer about him, began to enact the scene. Enter Naudet in Fagerolles' studio. "'You've real genius, my dear fellow. Your last picture is sold, then? For how much?' "'For five hundred francs.' "'But you must be mad. It was worth twelve hundred. And this one, which you have by you, how much?' "'Well, my faith, I don't know. Suppose we say twelve hundred? "'What are you talking about? Twelve hundred francs? "'You don't understand me, then, my boy. "'It's worth two thousand. "'I take it at two thousand. "'And from this day forward you must work for no one but myself, "'for me, no day. "'Good-bye, good-bye, my dear fellow. "'Don't overwork yourself. "'Your fortune is made. "'I have taken it in hand.' Wherewith he goes off, taking the picture with him in his carriage. He trots it round among his amateurs, among whom he has spread the rumour that he has just discovered an extraordinary painter. One of the amateurs bites at last and asks the price. Five thousand. What, five thousand francs for the picture of a man whose name hasn't the least notoriety? Are you playing the fool with me? Look here, I'll make you a proposal. I'll sell it you for five thousand francs, and I'll sign an agreement to take it back in a twelve-month at six thousand, if you no longer care for it. Of course the amateur is tempted. What does he risk, after all? In reality, it's a good speculation, and so he buys. After that, Naudet loses no time, but disposes in a similar manner of nine or ten paintings by the same man during the course of the year. Vanity gets mingled with the hope of gain, the prices go up, the pictures get regularly quoted, so that when Naudet returns to see his amateur, the latter, instead of returning the picture, buys another one for 8,000 francs, and the prices continue to go up, and painting degenerates into something shady, a kind of gold mine situated on the heights of Montmartre, promoted by a number of bankers, and around which there is a constant battle of banknotes. Claude was growing indignant, but Jory thought it all very clever, when there came a knock at the door. Bongrand, who went to open it, uttered a cry of surprise. Naudet, as I live, we were just talking about you. Naudet, very correctly dressed, without a speck of mud on him, despite the horrible weather, bowed and came in with the reverential politeness of a man of society entering a church. "'Very pleased. Feel flattered, indeed, dear master. "'And you only spoke well of me, I'm sure of it.' "'Not at all, Naudet, not at all,' said Bongrand, in a quiet tone. "'We were saying that your manner of trading was giving us a nice generation of artists, "'tricksters crossed with dishonest businessmen.' Naudet smiled, without losing his composure. "'The remark is harsh, but so charming.' "'Never mind, never mind, dear master. "'Nothing that you say offends me.' "'And dropping into ecstasy before the picture "'of the two little women at needlework. "'Oh, good heavens! "'I didn't know this. "'It's a little marvel. "'Ah, that light! "'That broad, substantial treatment! "'One has to go back to Rembrandt for anything like it. "'Yes, to Rembrandt! "'Look here, I only came in to pay my respects, "'but I thank my lucky star for having brought me here. "'Let us do a little bit of business.' Let me have this gem. Anything you like to ask for it, I'll cover it with gold. One could see Bongrand's back shake, as if his irritation were increasing at each sentence. He curtly interrupted the dealer. Too late. It's sold. Sold, you say? And you cannot annul your bargain? Tell me, at any rate, to whom it's sold. I'll do everything. I'll give everything. Ah, oh, what a horrible blow. Sold. Are you quite sure of it? Suppose you were offered double the sum. It's sold, no day. That's enough, isn't it? However, the dealer went on lamenting. 
he remained for a few minutes longer, going into raptures before other sketches, while making the tour of the studio with the keen glances of a speculator in search of luck. When he realized that his time was badly chosen, and that he would be able to take nothing away with him, he went off, bowing with an air of gratitude, and repeating remarks of admiration as far as the landing. And as soon as he had gone, Jory, who had listened to the conversation with surprise, ventured to ask a question. "'But you told us, I thought. It isn't sold, is it?' Without immediately answering, Bongrand went back to his picture. Then, in his thundering voice, resuming in one cry all his hidden suffering, the whole of the nascent struggle within him which he dared not avow, he said, "'He plagues me! He shall never have anything of mine! Let him go and buy of Fagerolles!' A quarter of an hour later, Claude and Jory also said good-bye, leaving Bongrand struggling with his work in the waning daylight. Once outside, when the young painter had left his companion, he did not at once return home to the Rue de Douai, in spite of his long absence. He still felt the want of walking about, of surrendering himself up to that great city of Paris, where the meetings of one single day sufficed to fill his brain, and this need of motion made him wander about till the black night had fallen, through the frozen mud of the streets, beneath the gas-lamps which, lighted up one by one, showed like nebulous stars amidst the fog. End of chapter 7, part A Chapter 7, part B of His Masterpiece by Emil Zola Translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Read by Lisa Reichert Claude impatiently awaited the Thursday when he was to dine at Sandoz's, for the latter, immutable in his habits, still invited his cronies to dinner once a week. All those who chose could come, their covers were laid. His marriage, his change of life, the ardent literary struggle into which he had thrown himself, made no difference. He kept to his day at home, that Thursday, which dated from the time he had left college, from the time they had all smoked their first pipes. As he himself expressed it, alluding to his wife, there was only one chum more. "'I say, old man,' he had frankly said to Claude, "'I'm greatly worried.' "'What about?' "'Why, about inviting Madame Christine. There are a lot of idiots, a lot of Philistines watching me, who would say all manner of things. You're quite right, old man, but Christine herself would decline to come. Oh, we understand the position very well.' I'll come alone, depend upon it. At six o'clock, Claude started for Sandoz's place in the Rue Nollet, in the depths of Batignol, and he had no end of trouble in finding the small pavilion which his friend had rented. First of all, he entered a large house facing the street and applied to the doorkeeper, who made him cross three successive courtyards. Then he went down a passage between two other buildings, descended some steps, and tumbled upon the iron gate of a small garden. That was the spot. The pavilion was there at the end of a path. But it was so dark, and he had nearly broken his legs coming down the steps, that he dared not venture any further, the more so as a huge dog was barking furiously. At last he heard the voice of Sandoz, who was coming forward and trying to quiet the dog. "'Oh, it's you! We are quite in the country, aren't we?' We are going to set up a lantern so that our company may not break their necks. Come in, come in. Will you hold your noise, you brute of a Bertrand? Don't you see that it's a friend, fool? Thereupon the dog accompanied them as far as the pavilion, wagging his tail and barking joyously. A young servant girl had come out with a lantern, which she fastened to the gate, in order to light up the breakneck steps. In the garden there was simply a small central lawn, on which there stood a large plum-tree, diffusing a shade around that rotted the grass. And just in front of the low house, which showed only three windows, there stretched an arbour of Virginia creeper, with a brand-new seat, shining there as an ornament amid the winter showers, pending the advent of the summer sun. "'Come in,' repeated Sandoz. 
On the right-hand side of the hall he ushered Claude into the parlour, which he had turned into a study. The dining-room and kitchen were on the left. Upstairs his mother, who was now altogether bedridden, occupied the larger room, while he and his wife contented themselves with the other one, and a dressing-room that parted the two. That was the whole place, a real cardboard box, with rooms like little drawers, separated by partitions as thin as paper. Withal it was the abode of work and hope, vast in comparison with the ordinary garrets of youth, and already made bright by a beginning of comfort and luxury. "'There's room here, eh?' he exclaimed. "'Ah, it's a jolly sight more comfortable than the Rue d'Enfer. You see that I've a room to myself, and I have bought myself an oaken writing-table, and my wife made me a present of that dwarf palm in that pot of old Rouen where... Isn't it swell, eh? His wife came in at that very moment, tall with a pleasant, tranquil face and beautiful brown hair. She wore a large white apron over her plainly made dress of black poplin. For although they had a regular servant, she saw to the cooking, for she was proud of certain of her dishes, and she put the household on a footing of middle-class cleanliness and love of cheer. She and Claude became old chums at once. Call him Claude, my darling. And you, old man, call her Henriette. No, madame, nor monsieur, or I shall fine you five sous each time. They laughed, and she scampered away, being wanted in the kitchen to look after a southern dish, a bouillabaisse, with which she wished to surprise the placent friend. She had obtained the recipe from her husband himself, and had become marvellously deft at it, so he said. Your wife is charming, said Claude and I see she spoils you. But Sandoz, seated at the table, with his elbows among such pages of the book he was working at, as he had written that morning, began to talk of the first novel of his series, which he had published in October. Ah, oh, they had treated his poor book nicely. It had been a throttling, a butchering, all the critics yelling at his heels, a broadside of imprecations, as if he had murdered people in a wood. He himself laughed at it, excited rather than otherwise, for he had sturdy shoulders and the quiet bearing of a toiler who knows what he's after. Mere surprise remained to him at the profound lack of intelligence shown by those fellows, the critics, whose articles, knocked off on the corner of some table, bespattered him with mud without appearing as much as to guess at the least of his intentions. Everything was flung into the same slop pail of abuse, his studies of physiological man, the important part he assigned to circumstances and surroundings, his allusions to nature ever and ever creating, in short, life, entire, universal life, existent through all the animal world, without there really being either high or low, beauty or ugliness. He was insulted, too, for his boldness of language, for the conviction he expressed that all things ought to be said, that there are abominable expressions which become necessary, like branding irons, and that a language emerges enriched from such strength-giving baths. He easily granted their anger, but he would at least have liked them to do him the honour of understanding him, and getting angry at his audacity, not at the idiotic, filthy designs of which he was accused. Really, he continued, I believe that the world still contains more idiots than downright spiteful people. They are enraged with me on account of the form I give to my productions, the written sentences, the similes, the very life of my style. Yes, the middle classes fairly split with hatred of literature. Then he became silent, having grown sad. Never mind, said Claude, after an interval. You are happy. You at least work. You produce. Sandoz had risen from his seat with a gesture of sudden pain. True, I work. I work out my books to their last pages. And if you only knew, if I told you amidst what discouragement, amidst what torture, won't those idiots take it into their heads to accuse me of pride? I, whom the imperfection of my work pursues even in my sleep, I, who never look over the pages of the day before, lest I should find them so execrable, that I might afterwards lack the courage to continue. Oh, I work, no doubt I work. I go on working, as I go on living, because I am born to it. 
but I am none the gayer on account of it. I am never satisfied. There is always a great collapse at the end. He was interrupted by a loud exclamation outside, and Jory appeared, delighted with life, and relating that he had just touched up an old article in order to have the evening to himself. Almost immediately afterwards, Gagnière and Maudot, who had met at the door, came in conversing together. The former, who had been absorbed for some months in a theory of colours, was explaining his system to the other. "'I paint my shade in,' he continued, as if in a dream. "'The red of the flag loses its brightness and becomes yellowish because it stands out against the blue of the sky, the complementary shade of which, orange, blends with red.' Claude, interested at once, was already questioning him when the servant brought in a telegram. "'All right,' said Sandoz. "'It's from Dubouche, who apologizes. "'He promises to come and surprise us at about eleven o'clock.' At this moment, Henriette threw the door wide open and personally announced that dinner was ready. She had doffed her white apron and cordially shook hands as hostess with all of them. "'Take your seats, take your seats,' was her cry, it was half-past seven already. The bouillabaisse could not wait. Jory, having observed that Fagerolles had sworn to him that he would come, they would not believe it. Fagerolles was getting ridiculous with his habit of aping the great artist overwhelmed with work. The dining-room into which they passed was so small that in order to make room for a piano, a kind of alcove had been made out of a dark closet, which had formerly served for the accommodation of crockery. However, on grand occasions, half a score of people still gathered round the table under the white porcelain hanging lamp, but this was only accomplished by blocking up the sideboard, so that the servant could not even pass to take a plate from it. However, it was the mistress of the house who carved, while the master took his place facing her, against the blockaded sideboard, in order to hand round whatever things might be required. Henriette had placed Claude on her right hand, Maudot on her left, while Gagnière and Jory were seated next to Sandoz. "'Françoise,' she called, "'give me the slices of toast. They are on the range.' And the girl, having brought the toast, she distributed two slices to each of them, and was beginning to ladle the bouillabaisse into the plates, when the door opened once more. "'Fagerolles, at last,' she said. "'I have given your seat to Maudot.' "'Sit down there next to Claude.' He apologised with an air of courtly politeness by alleging a business appointment. Very elegantly dressed, tightly buttoned up in clothes of an English cut, he had the carriage of a man about town, relieved by the retention of a touch of artistic free and easiness. Immediately on sitting down he grasped his neighbour's hand, affecting great delight. "'Ah, oh, my old Claude! I have such a long time wanted to see you!' A score of times I intended going after you into the country, but then you know circumstances. Claude, feeling uncomfortable at these protestations, endeavoured to meet them with a light cordiality. But Henriette, who was still serving, saved the situation by growing impatient. Come, Fagerolles, just answer me. Do you wish two slices of toast? Certainly, madame, two if you please. I am very fond of bouillabaisse. Besides, yours is delicious, a marvel. In fact, they all went into raptures over it, especially Jory and Maudot, who declared they had never tasted anything better at Marseilles. So much so that the young wife, delighted and still flushed with the heat of the kitchen, her ladle in her hand, had all she could do to refill the plates held out to her, and indeed she rose up and ran in person to the kitchen to fetch the remains of the soup, for the servant girl was losing her wits. "'Come, eat something,' said Sandoz to her. "'We'll wait well enough till you have done.' But she was obstinate and remained standing. "'Never mind me. You had better pass the bread. Yes, there, behind you on the sideboard. Jory prefers crumb, which he can soak in the soup.' Sandoz rose in his turn and assisted his wife, while the others chaffed Jory on his love for sops and Claude, moved by the pleasant cordiality of his hosts, and awaking, as it were, from a long sleep, looked at them all, asking himself whether he had only left them on the previous night, or whether four years had really elapsed, since he had dined with them one Thursday. They were different, however, 
he felt them to be changed. Mahoudeau soured by misery, Jory wrapped up in his own pleasures, Gagnière more distant with his thoughts elsewhere, and it especially seemed to him that Fagerolles was chilly, in spite of his exaggerated cordiality of manner. No doubt their features had aged somewhat amid the wear and tear of life, but it was not only that which he noticed, it seemed to him also as if there was a void between them. He beheld them isolated and estranged from each other, although they were seated elbow to elbow in close array round the table. Then the surroundings were different. Nowadays a woman brought her charm to bear on them, and calmed them by her presence. Then why did he, face to face with the irrevocable current of things, which die and are renewed, experience that sensation of beginning something over again? Why was it that he could have sworn that he had been seated at that same place only last Thursday? At last he thought he understood. It was Sandoz who had not changed, who remained as obstinate as regards his habits of friendship, as regards his habits of work, as radiant at being able to receive his friends at the board of his new home as he had formerly been when sharing his frugal bachelor fare with them. A dream of eternal friendship made him changeless. Thursdays, similar one to another, followed and followed on until the furthest stages of their lives. All of them were eternally together, all started at the self-same hour and participated in the same triumph. Sandoz must have guessed the thought that kept Claude mute, for he said to him across the table with his frank, youthful smile, "'Well, old man, here you are again. Ah, oh, confound it, we missed you sorely. But you see, nothing has changed. We are all the same, aren't we, all of you?' They answered by nodding their heads, "'No doubt, no doubt.' With this difference, he went on, beaming, with this difference, that the cookery is somewhat better than in the Rue d'Enfer. What a lot of messes I did make you swallow. After the bouillabaisse there came a civet of hare, and a roast fowl and salad terminated the dinner. But they sat for a long time at table, and the dessert proved a protracted affair, although the conversation lacked the fever and violence of yore. Everyone spoke of himself, and ended by relapsing into silence on perceiving that the others did not listen to him. With the cheese, however, when they had tasted some burgundy, a sharp little growth, of which the young couple had ordered a cask, out of the profits of Sandoz's first novel, their voices rose to a higher key, and they all grew animated. "'So you have made an arrangement with Naudet, eh?' asked Mahoudeau, whose bony cheeks seemed to have grown yet more hollow." Is it true that he guarantees you fifty thousand francs for the first year? Fagerolles replied with affected carelessness, Yes, fifty thousand francs, but nothing is settled. I'm thinking it over. It is hard to engage oneself like that. I'm not going to do anything precipitately. The deuce, muttered the sculptor. You are hard to please. For twenty francs a day I'd sign whatever you like. They all now listened to Fagerolles, who posed as being wearied by his budding success. He still had the same good-looking, disturbing, hussy-like face, but the fashion in which he wore his hair, and the cut of his beard, lent him an appearance of gravity. Although he still came at long intervals to Sandoz's, he was separating himself from the band. He showed himself on the boulevards, frequented the cafés and newspaper offices, all the places where a man can advertise himself and make useful acquaintances. These were tactics of his own, a determination to carve his own victory apart from the others, the smart idea that if he wished to triumph, he ought to have nothing more in common with those revolutionists, neither dealer, nor connections, nor habits. It was even said that he had interested the female element of two or three drawing-rooms in his success, not in Jory's style, but like a vicious fellow who rises superior to his passions, and is content to adulate superannuated baronesses. Just then, Jory, in view of lending importance to himself, called Fagerolles' attention to a recently published article. He pretended that he had made Fagerolles just as he pretended that he had made Claude. I say, have you read that article of Vernier's about yourself? There's another fellow who repeats my ideas. 
Ah, he does get articles, and no mistake, sighed Ma Udo. Fagerolles made a careless gesture, but he smiled with secret contempt for all those poor beggars who were so utterly deficient in shrewdness that they clung, like simpletons, to their crude style when it was so easy to conquer the crowd. Had it not sufficed for him to break with them, after pillaging them, to make his own fortune? He benefited by all the hatred that folks had against him. His pictures, of a softened, attenuated style, were held up in praise, so as to deal the death-blow to their ever obstinately violent works. "'Have you read Vernier's article?' asked Jory of Gagnière. "'Doesn't he say exactly what I said?' For the last few moments Gagnière had been absorbed in contemplating his glass, the wine in which cast a ruddy reflection on the white tablecloth. He started. "'Eh? What? Vernier's article?' Why, yes, in fact, all those articles which appear about Fagerolles. Gagnère, in amazement, turned to the painter. What, are they writing articles about you? I know nothing about them. I haven't seen them. Ah, oh, they are writing articles about you. But whatever for? There was a mad roar of laughter. Fagerolles alone grinned with an ill grace, for he fancied himself the butt of some spiteful joke. But Gagnère spoke in absolute good faith. He felt surprised at the success of a painter who did not even observe the laws regulating the value of tints. Success for that trickster? Never! For in that case what would become of conscientiousness? This boisterous hilarity enlivened the end of the dinner. They all left off eating, though the mistress of the house still insisted upon filling their plates. "'My dear, do attend to them,' she kept saying to Sandoz, who had grown greatly excited amidst the din. Just stretch out your hand. The biscuits are on the sideboard. They all declined anything more and rose up. As the rest of the evening was to be spent there, round the table, drinking tea, they leaned back against the walls and continued chatting, while the servant cleared away. The young couple assisted, Henriette putting the salt cellars in a drawer, and Sandoz helping to fold the cloth. You can smoke, said Henriette. You know that it doesn't inconvenience me in the least. Fagerolles, who had drawn Claude into the window recess, offered him a cigar, which was declined. True, I forgot, you don't smoke. Ah, I say, I must go to see what you have brought back with you. Some very interesting things, no doubt. You know what I think of your talent. You are the cleverest of us all. He showed himself very humble, sincere at heart, and allowing his admiration of former days to rise once more to the surface. Indeed, he forever bore the imprint of another's genius, which he admitted, despite the complex calculations of his cunning mind. But his humility was mingled with a certain embarrassment very rare with him, the concern he felt at the silence which the master of his youth preserved respecting his last picture. At last he ventured to ask, with quivering lips, "'Did you see my actress at the salon? Do you like it? Tell me candidly.' Claude hesitated for a moment, then, like the good-natured fellow he was, said, "'Yes, there are some very good bits in it.' Fagerolles already repented having asked that stupid question, and he ended by altogether floundering. He tried to excuse himself for his plagiarisms and his compromises. When with great difficulty he had got out of the mess, enraged with himself for his clumsiness, he for a moment became the joker of yore again, made even Claude laugh till he cried, and amused them all. At last he held out his hand to take leave of Henriette. "'What, going so soon?' "'Alas, yes, dear madame. This evening my father is entertaining the head of a department at one of the ministries, an official whom he's trying to influence in view of obtaining a decoration. And as I am one of his titles to that distinction, I had to promise that I would look in.' When he was gone, Henriette, who had exchanged a few words in a low voice with Sandoz, disappeared, and her light footfall was heard on the first floor. Since her marriage, it was she who tended the old, infirm mother, absenting herself in this fashion several times during the evening, just as the son had done formerly. Not one of the guests, however, had noticed her leave the room. Maudot and Gagnière were now talking about Fagerolles, showing themselves covertly bitter without openly attacking him. 
as yet they contented themselves with ironical glances and shrugs of the shoulders all the silent contempt of fellows who don't wish to slash a chum then they fell back on claude they prostrated themselves before him overwhelmed him with the hopes they set in him ah oh, it was high time for him to come back for he alone with his great gifts his vigorous touch could become the master the recognized chief since the salon of the rejected the school of the open air had increased in numbers a growing influence was making itself felt but unfortunately the efforts were frittered away the new recruits contented themselves with producing sketches impressions thrown off with a few strokes of the brush they were awaiting the necessary man of genius the one who would incarnate the new formula in masterpieces what a position to take to master the multitude to open up a century to create a new art claude listened to them with his eyes turned to the floor and his face very pale yes that indeed was his unavowed dream the ambition he dared not confess to himself only with the delight that the flattery caused him there was mingled a strange anguish a dread of the future as he heard them raising him to the position of dictator as if he had already triumphed don't he exclaimed at last there are others as good as myself i am still seeking my real line jory who felt annoyed was smoking in silence suddenly as the others obstinately kept at it he could not refrain from remarking all this my boys is because you are vexed at fagerolles success they energetically denied it they burst out in protestations fagerol the young master what a good joke oh you are turning your back upon us we know it said mahoudeau there's no fear of your writing a line about us nowadays well my dear fellow answered jory vexed everything i write about you is cut out you make yourselves hated everywhere oh if i had a paper of my own henriette came back and sandoz's eyes having sought hers she answered him with a glance and the same affectionate quiet smile that he had shown when leaving his mother's room in former times then she summoned them all they sat down again round the table while she made the tea and poured it out but the gathering grew sad benumbed as it were with lassitude sandoz vainly tried a diversion by admitting bertrand the big dog who grovelled at sight of the sugar basin and ended by going to sleep near the stove where he snored like a man since the discussion on fagerolles there had been intervals of silence a kind of bored irritation which fell heavily upon them amidst the dense tobacco smoke and in fact gagnière felt so out of sorts that he left the table for a moment to seat himself at the piano murdering some passages from wagner in a subdued key with the stiff fingers of an amateur who tries his first scale at thirty towards eleven o'clock dubuche arriving at last contributed the finishing touch to the general frost he had made his escape from a ball to fulfil what he considered a remaining duty towards his old comrades and his dress coat his white necktie his fat pale face all proclaimed his vexation at having come the importance he attached to the sacrifice and the fear he felt of compromising his new position he avoided mentioning his wife so that he might not have to bring her to sandoz's when he had shaken hands with claude without showing more emotion than if he had met him the day before he declined a cup of tea and spoke slowly puffing out his cheeks the while of his worry in settling in a brand new house and of the work that had overwhelmed him since he had attended to the business of his father-in-law who was building a whole street near the parc monceau then claude distinctly felt that something had snapped had life then already carried away the evenings of former days those evenings so fraternal in their very violence when nothing had as yet separated them when not one of them had thought of keeping his part of glory to himself nowadays the battle was beginning each hungry one was eagerly biting and a fissure was there a scarcely perceptible crack that had rent the old sworn friendships and some day would make them crumble into a thousand pieces however sandoz with his craving for perpetuity had so far noticed nothing 
he still beheld them as they had been in the Rue d'Enfer, all arm in arm, starting off to victory. Why change what was well? Did not happiness consist in one pleasure selected from among all, and then enjoyed for ever afterwards? And when an hour later the others made up their minds to go off, wearied by the dull egotism of Dubouche, who had not left off talking about his own affairs, when they had dragged Gagnière in a trance away from the piano, Sandoz, followed by his wife, absolutely insisted, despite the coldness of the night, on accompanying them all to the gate at the end of the garden. He shook hands all round and shouted after them, "'Till Thursday, Claude. Till next Thursday, all of you, eh? Mind you all come.' "'Till Thursday,' repeated Henriette, who had taken the lantern and was holding it aloft so as to light the steps. And amid the laughter, Gagnière and Maudot replied jokingly, "'Till Thursday, young master. Good night, young master.' Once in the Rue Nollet, Dubouche immediately hailed a cab, in which he drove away. The other four walked together as far as the outer boulevards, scarcely exchanging a word, looking dazed, as it were, at having been in each other's company so long. At last Jory decamped, pretending that some proofs were waiting for him at the office of his newspaper. Then Gagnière mechanically stopped Claude in front of the Café Baudequin, the gas of which was still blazing away. Maudot refused to go in, and went off alone, sadly ruminating, towards the Rue de Cherchez midi Without knowing how, Claude found himself seated at their old table, opposite Gagnière, who was silent. The café had not changed. The friends still met there of a Sunday, showing a deal of fervour, in fact, since Sandoz had lived in the neighbourhood. But the band was now lost amid a flood of newcomers, it was slowly being submerged by the increasing triteness of the young disciples of the open air. At that hour of night, however, the establishment was getting empty. Three young painters, whom Claude did not know, came to shake hands with him as they went off, and then there merely remained a petty, retired tradesman of the neighbourhood, asleep in front of a saucer. Gagnère, quite at his ease, as if he had been at home, absolutely indifferent to the yawns of the solitary waiter, who was stretching his arms, glanced towards Claude, but without seeing him, for his eyes were dim. "'By the way,' said the latter, "'what were you explaining to Maudot this evening? Yes, about the red of a flag turning yellowish amid the blue of the sky. That was it, eh? You are studying the theory of complementary colours.' But the other did not answer. He took up his glass of beer, set it down again without tasting its contents, and with an ecstatic smile ended by muttering, Hayden has all the gracefulness of a rhetorician. His is a gentle music, quivering like the voice of a great grandmother in powdered hair. Mozart, he's the precursory genius, the first who endowed an orchestra with an individual voice. And those two will live mostly because they created Beethoven. Ah, Beethoven! power and strength amidst serene suffering, Michelangelo at the tomb of the Medici, a heroic logician, a kneader of human brains, for the symphony with choral accompaniments was the starting point of all the great ones of today. The waiter, tired of waiting, began to turn off the gas, wearily dragging his feet along as he did so. Mournfulness pervaded the deserted room, dirty with saliva and cigar ends, and reeking of spilt drink, while from the hushed boulevard the only sound that came was the distant blubbering of some drunkard. Gagnère, still in the clouds, however, continued to ride his hobby-horse. Weber passes by us amid a romantic landscape, conducting the ballads of the dead amidst weeping willows and oaks with twisted branches. Schumann follows him beneath the pale moonlight along the shores of silvery lakes. And behold, here comes Rossini, incarnation of the musical gift so gay, so natural, without the least concern for expression, caring nothing for the public, and who isn't my man by a long way. Ah, oh, certainly not. But then, all the same, he astonishes one by his wealth of production, 
and the huge effects he derives from an accumulation of voices and an ever-swelling repetition of the same strain. These three led to Meyerbeer, a cunning fellow who profited by everything, introducing symphony into opera after Weber, and giving dramatic expression to the unconscious formulas of Rossini. Oh, the superb bursts of sound, the feudal pomp, the martial mysticism, the quivering of fantastic legends, the cry of passion ringing out through history, and such finds, each instrument endowed with a personality, the dramatic recitativos accompanied symphoniously by the orchestra, the typical musical phrase on which an entire work is built. Ah, he was a great fellow, a very great fellow indeed. I am going to shut up, sir, said the waiter, drawing near, and, seeing that Gagnière did not as much as look round, he went to awaken the petty retired tradesman, who was still dozing in front of his saucer. I am going to shut up, sir. The belated customer rose up, shivering, fumbled in the dark corner where he was seated for his walking stick, and when the waiter had picked it up for him from under the seats, he went away. And Gagnière rambled on. Berlioz has mingled literature with his work. He is the musical illustrator of Shakespeare, Virgil, and Goethe. But what a painter! the Delacroix of music, who makes sound blaze forth amidst effulgent contrasts of colour. And withal he has romanticism in his brain, a religious mysticism that carries him away, an ecstasy that soars higher than mountain summits. A bad builder of operas, but marvellous in detached pieces, asking too much at times of the orchestra which he tortures, having pushed the personality of instruments to its furthest limits for each instrument represents a character to him. Ah, that remark of his about clarinets! They typify beloved women. Ah, it has always made a shiver run down my back. And Chopin, so dandified in his Bryanism, the dreamy poet of those who suffer from neurosis. And Mendelssohn, that faultless chiseller, a Shakespeare in dancing pumps, whose songs without words are gems for women of intellect, and after that, after that, a man should go down on his knees. There was now only one gas lamp alight, just above his head, and the waiter standing behind him stood waiting amid the gloomy, chilly void of the room. Gagnier's voice had come to a reverential tremolo, he was reaching devotional fervour as he approached the inner tabernacle, the Holy of Holies. Oh, Schumann, typical of despair, the voluptuousness of despair, yes, the end of everything, the last song of saddened purity hovering above the ruins of the world. Oh, Wagner, the god in whom centuries of music are incarnated. His work is the immense ark, all the arts blended in one, the real humanity of the personages at last expressed, the orchestra itself living apart the life of the drama, and what a massacre of conventionality, of inept formulas, what a revolutionary emancipation amid the infinite, the overture of Tannhauser, oh, that's the sublime hallelujah of the new era. First of all comes the chant of the pilgrims, the religious strain, calm, deep, and slowly throbbing. Then the voices of the sirens gradually drown it, the voluptuous pleasures of Venus, full of enervating delight and languor, grow more and more imperious and disorderly, and soon the sacred air gradually returns, like the aspiring voice of space, and seizes hold of all other strains, and blends them in one supreme harmony, to waft them away on the wings of a triumphal hymn. I am going to shut up, sir, repeated the waiter. Claude, who no longer listened, he also, being absorbed in his own passion, emptied his glass of beer and cried, Eh, hey, old man, they are going to shut up. Then Gagné trembled, a painful twitch came over his ecstatic face, and he shivered as if he had dropped from the stars. 
he gulped down his beer and once on the pavement outside after pressing his companion's hand in silence he walked off into the gloom it was nearly two o'clock in the morning when claude returned to the rue de douai during the week that he had been scouring paris anew he had each time brought back with him the feverish excitement of the day but he had never before returned so late, with his brain so hot and smoky. Christine, overcome with fatigue, was asleep under the lamp which had gone out, her brow resting on the edge of the table. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight, Part A of His Masterpiece by Emil Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. At last, Christine gave a final stroke with her feather broom, and they were settled. The studio in the Rue du Douai, small and inconvenient, had only one little room and a kitchen as big as a cupboard attached to it. They were obliged to take their meals in the studio. They had to live in it, with the child always tumbling about their legs, and Christine had a deal of trouble in making their few sticks suffice, as she wished to do in order to save expense. After all, she was obliged to buy a second-hand bedstead, and yielded to the temptation of having some white muslin curtains, which cost her seven sous the metre. The den then seemed charming to her, and she began to keep it scrupulously clean, resolving to do everything herself, and to dispense with a servant, as living would be a difficult matter. During the first months Claude lived in ever-increasing excitement. His peregrinations through the noisy streets, his feverish discussions on the occasion of his visits to friends, all the rage and all the burning ideas he thus brought home from out of doors, made him hold forth aloud, even in his sleep. Paris had seized hold of him again, and in the full blaze of that furnace, a second youth, enthusiastic ambition to see, do, and conquer, had come upon him. Never had he felt such a passion for work, such hope, as if it sufficed for him to stretch out his hand, in order to create masterpieces, that should set him in the right rank which was the first. While crossing Paris he discovered subjects for pictures everywhere. The whole city with its streets, squares, bridges, and panoramas of life suggested immense frescoes, which he, however, always found too small, for he was intoxicated with the thought of doing something colossal. Thus he returned home quivering, his brain seething with projects, and of an evening threw off sketches on bits of paper in the lamplight without being able to decide by what he ought to begin the series of grand productions that he dreamt about. One serious obstacle was the smallness of his studio. If he had only had the old garret of the Quai de Bourbon, or even the huge dining-room of Bencourt. But what could he do in that oblong strip of space, that kind of passage which the landlord of the house impudently let to painters for four hundred francs a year, after roofing it in with glass. The worst was that the sloping glazed roof looked to the north, between two high walls, and only admitted a greenish, cellar-like light. He was therefore obliged to postpone his ambitious projects, and he decided to begin with average-sized canvases, wisely saying to himself that the dimensions of a picture are not a proper test of an artist's genius. The moment seemed to him favourable for the success of a courageous artist who, amidst the breaking up of the old schools, would at length bring some originality and sincerity into his work. The formulas of recent times were already shaken. Delacroix had died without leaving any disciples. Courbet had barely a few clumsy imitators behind him. Their best pieces would merely become so many museum pictures, blackened by age, tokens only of the art of a certain period. It seemed easy to foresee the new formula that would spring from theirs, the rush of sunshine, that limpid dawn which was rising in new works under the nascent influence of the open-air school. It was undeniable, 
those light-toned paintings over which people had laughed so much at the Salon of the Rejected, were secretly influencing many painters, and gradually brightening every palette. Nobody, as yet, admitted it, but the first blow had been dealt, and an evolution was beginning, which became more perceptible at each succeeding Salon and what a stroke it would be if, amidst the unconscious copies of impotent essayists, amidst the timid artful attempts of tricksters, a master were suddenly to reveal himself, giving body to the new formula by dint of audacity and power, without compromise, showing it such as it should be, substantial, entire, so that it might become the truth of the end of the century." In that first hour of passion and hope, Claude, usually so harassed by doubts, believed in his genius. He no longer experienced any of those crises, the anguish of which had driven him for days into the streets in quest of his vanished courage. A fever stiffened him. He worked on with the blind obstinacy of an artist who dives into his entrails, to drag therefrom the fruit that tortures him. His long rest in the country had endowed him with singular freshness of visual perception, and joyous delight in execution. He seemed to have been born anew to his art, and endowed with it a facility and balance of power he had never hitherto possessed. He also felt certain of progress, and experienced great satisfaction at some successful bits of work, in which his former sterile efforts at last culminated. As he had said at Bencourt, he had got hold of his open air, that caroling gaiety of tints which astonished his comrades when they came to see him. They all admired, convinced that he would only have to show his work to take a very high place with it. Such was its individuality of style, for the first time showing nature flooded with real light amid all the play of reflections and the constant variations of colours. Thus for three years Claude struggled on, without weakening, spurred to further efforts by each rebuff, abandoning naught of his ideas, but marching straight before him with all the vigour of faith. During the first year he went forth amid the December snows to place himself, for four hours a day, behind the heights of Montmartre, on the corner of a patch of wasteland, whence as a background he painted some miserable, low, tumble-down buildings, overtopped by factory chimneys, whilst in the foreground, amid the snow, he set a girl and a ragged street rough devouring stolen apples. His obstinacy in painting from nature greatly complicated his work, and gave rise to almost insuperable difficulties. However, he finished this picture out of doors. He merely cleaned and touched it up a bit in his studio. When the canvas was placed beneath the wan daylight of the glazed roof, he himself was startled by its brutality. It showed like a scene beheld through a doorway open on the street. The snow blinded one. The two figures of a muddy grey in tint stood out lamentable. He at once felt that such a picture would not be accepted, but he did not try to soften it. He sent it to the salon all the same. After swearing that he would never again try to exhibit, he now held the view that one should always present something to the hanging committee, if merely to accentuate its wrongdoing. Besides, he admitted the utility of the salon, the only battlefield on which an artist might come to the fore at one stroke. The hanging committee refused his picture. The second year Claude sought a contrast. He selected a bit of the public garden at Batignolles in May, in the background were some large chestnut trees, casting their shade around a corner of greensward, and several six-storied houses, while in front, on a seat of a crude green hue, some nurses and petty sits of the neighbourhood sat in a line watching three little girls making sand-pies. When permission to paint there had been obtained, he had needed some heroism to bring his work to a successful issue amid the bantering crowd. At last he made up his mind to go there at five in the morning, in order to paint in the background. Reserving the figures, he contented himself with making mere sketches of them from nature, and finishing them in his studio. This time his picture seemed to him less crude. It had acquired some of the wan, softened light which descended through the glass roof. 
he thought his picture accepted, for all his friends pronounced it to be a masterpiece, and went about saying that it would revolutionize the salon. There was stupefaction and indignation when a fresh refusal of the hanging committee was rumoured. The committee's intentions could not be denied. It was a question of systematically strangling an original artist. He, after his first burst of passion, vented all his anger upon his work, which he stigmatized as false, dishonest, and execrable. It was a well-deserved lesson which he should remember. Ought he to have relapsed into that cellar-like studio light? Was he going to revert to the filthy cooking of imaginary figures? When the picture came back, he took a knife and ripped it from top to bottom. And so, during the third year, he obstinately toiled on a work of revolt. He wanted the blazing sun, that Paris sun which, on certain days, turns the pavement to a white heat in the dazzling reflection from the house frontages. Nowhere is it hotter. Even people from burning climes mop their faces. You would say you were in some region of Africa beneath the heavily raining glow of a sky on fire. The subject Claude chose was a corner of the Place du Carousel, at one o'clock in the afternoon, when the sun rays fall vertically. A cab was jostling along, its driver half asleep, its horse steaming with drooping head, vague amid the throbbing heat. The passers-by seemed, as it were, intoxicated, with the one exception of a young woman, who, rosy and gay under her parasol, walked on with an easy, queen-like step, as if the fiery element were her proper sphere. But what especially rendered this picture terrible was a new interpretation of the effects of light, a very accurate decomposition of the sun-rays, which ran counter to all the habits of eyesight, by emphasizing blues, yellows, and reds, where nobody had been accustomed to see any. In the background the Tuileries vanished in a golden shimmer. The paving stones bled, so to say. The figures were only so many indications, sombre patches eaten into by the vivid glare. This time his comrades, while still praising, looked embarrassed, all seized with the same apprehensions. Such painting could only lead to martyrdom. He, amid their praises, understood well enough the rupture that was taking place and when the hanging committee had once more closed the salon against him, he dolorously exclaimed in a moment of lucidity, All right, it's an understood thing. I'll die at the task. However, although his obstinate courage seemed to increase, he now and then gradually relapsed into his former doubts, consumed by the struggle he was waging with nature. Every canvas that came back to him seemed bad to him, above all incomplete, not realizing what he had aimed at. It was this idea of impotence that exasperated him even more than the refusals of the hanging committee. No doubt he did not forgive the latter. His works, even in an embryo state, were a hundred times better than all the trash which was accepted. But what suffering he felt at being ever unable to show himself in all his strength in such a masterpiece as he could not bring his genius to yield! There were always some superb bits in his paintings. He felt satisfied with this, that, and the other. Why, then, were there sudden voids? Why were there inferior bits which he did not perceive while he was at work, but which afterwards utterly killed the picture, like ineffaceable defects? And he felt quite unable to make any corrections. At certain moments a wall rose up, an insuperable obstacle beyond which he was forbidden to venture. If he touched up the part that displeased him a score of times, so a score of times did he aggravate the evil, till everything became quite muddled and messy. He grew anxious and failed to see things clearly. His brush refused to obey him, and his will was paralyzed. Was it his hands or his eyes that ceased to belong to him amid those progressive attacks of the hereditary disorder that had already made him anxious? Those attacks became more frequent. He once more lapsed into horrible weeks, wearing himself out, oscillating betwixt uncertainty and hope, and his only support during those terrible hours, which he spent in a desperate hand-to-hand -hand struggle with his rebellious work, 
was the consoling dream of his future masterpiece, the one with which he would at last be fully satisfied, in painting which his hands would show all the energy and deftness of true creative skill. By some ever-recurring phenomenon, his longing to create outstripped the quickness of his fingers. He never worked at one picture without planning the one that was to follow. Then all that remained to him was an eager desire to rid himself of the work on which he was engaged, for it brought him torture. No doubt it would be good for nothing. He was still making fatal concessions, having recourse to trickery, to everything that a true artist should banish from his conscience. But what he meant to do after that? Ah, what he meant to do! He beheld it superb and heroic, above attack and indestructible. All this was the everlasting mirage that goads on the condemned disciples of art, a falsehood that comes in a spirit of tenderness and compassion, and without which production would become impossible to those who die of their failure to create life. In addition to those constantly renewed struggles with himself, Claude's material difficulties now increased. Was it not enough that he could not give birth to what he felt existing within him? must he also battle with everyday cares though he refused to admit it painting from nature in the open air became impossible when a picture was beyond a certain size how could he settle himself in the streets amidst the crowd how obtain from each person the necessary number of sittings that sort of painting must evidently be confined to certain determined subjects landscapes small corners of the city in which the figures would be but so many silhouettes painted in afterwards there were also a thousand and one difficulties connected with the weather the wind which threatened to carry off the easel the rain which obliged one to interrupt one's work on such days claude came home in a rage shaking his fist at the sky and accusing nature of resisting him in order that he might not take and vanquish her he also complained bitterly of being poor, for his dream was to have a movable studio, a vehicle in Paris, a boat on the Seine, in both of which he would have lived like an artistic gypsy. But nothing came to his aid. Everything conspired against his work. And Christine suffered with Claude. She had shared his hopes very bravely, brightening the studio with her housewifely activity, but now she sat down, discouraged, when she saw him powerless. At each picture which was refused, she displayed still deeper grief, hurt in her womanly self-love, taking that pride in success which all women have. The painter's bitterness soured her also. She entered into his feelings and passions, identified herself with his tastes, defended his painting which had become, as it were, part of herself, the one great concern of their lives. Indeed, the only important one henceforth, since it was the one whence she expected all her happiness. She understood well enough that art robbed her more and more of her lover each day, but the real struggle between herself and art had not yet begun. For the time she yielded, and let herself be carried away with clothes so that they might be but one, but only in the self-same effort. From that partial abdication of self there sprang, however, a sadness, a dread of what might be in store for her later on. Every now and then a shudder chilled her to the very heart. She felt herself growing old, while intense melancholy upset her, an unreasoning longing to weep, which she satisfied in the gloomy studio for hours together when she was alone there. At that period her heart expanded, as it were, and a mother sprang from the loving woman. That motherly feeling for her big artist child was made up of all the vague infinite pity which filled her with tenderness, of the illogical fits of weakness into which she saw him fall each hour, of the constant pardons which she was obliged to grant him. He was beginning to make her unhappy. His caresses were few and far between. A look of weariness constantly overspread his features. How could she love him, then, if not with that other affection of every moment, remaining in adoration before him and unceasingly sacrificing herself? In her inmost being insatiable passion still lingered. She was still the sensuous woman with thick lips set in obstinately prominent jaws. 
yet there was a gentle melancholy in being merely a mother to him, in trying to make him happy amid that life of theirs which now was spoilt. Little Jacques was the only one to suffer from that transfer of tenderness. She neglected him more. The man, his father, became her child, and the poor little fellow remained as mere testimony of their great passion of yore. As she saw him grow up and no longer require so much care, she began to sacrifice him, without intentional harshness, but merely because she felt like that. At meal times, she only gave him the inferior bits. The coziest nook near the stove was not for his little chair. If ever the fear of an accident made her tremble now and then, her first cry, her first protecting movement, was not for her helpless child. She ever relegated him to the background, suppressed him as it were. Jacques, be quiet, you tire your father. Jacques, keep still, don't you see that your father is at work? The urchin suffered from being cooped up in Paris. He, who had had the whole countryside to roll about in, felt stifled in the narrow space where he now had to keep quiet. His rosy cheeks became pale. He grew up puny, serious like a little man, with eyes which stared at things in wonder. He was five by now, and his head, by a singular phenomenon, had become disproportionately large, in such wise as to make his father say, He has a great man's nut. But the child's intelligence seemed, on the contrary, to decrease in proportion as his skull became larger. Very gentle and timid, he became absorbed in thought for hours, incapable of answering a question and when he emerged from that state of immobility, he had mad fits of shouting and jumping, like a young animal giving rein to instinct. At such times warnings to keep quiet rained upon him, for his mother failed to understand his sudden outbursts, and became uneasy at seeing the father grow irritated as he sat before his easel. Getting cross herself, she would then hastily seat the little fellow in his corner again, quieted all at once, giving the startled shudder of one who has been too abruptly awakened, the child would, after a time, doze off with his eyes wide open, so careless of enjoying life, that his toys, corks, pictures, and empty colour tubes dropped listlessly from his hands. Christine had already tried to teach him his alphabet, but he had cried and struggled, so they had decided to wait another year or two, before sending him to school, where his masters would know how to make him learn. Christine at last began to grow frightened at the prospect of impending misery. In Paris, with that growing child beside them, living proved expensive, and the end of each month became terrible, despite her efforts to save in every direction. They had nothing certain but Claude's thousand francs a year, and how could they live on fifty francs a month, which was all that was left to them, after deducting four hundred francs for the rent. At first they had got out of embarrassment, thanks to the sale of a few pictures, Claude having found Gagnère's old amateur, one of those detested bourgeois who possess the ardent souls of artists, despite the monomaniacal habits in which they are confined. This one, Monsieur Hu, a retired chief clerk in a public department, was unfortunately not rich enough to be always buying, and he could only bewail the purblindness of the public which once more allowed a genius to die of starvation. For he himself, convinced, struck by grace at the first glance, had selected Claude's crudest works, which he hung by the side of his Delacroix, predicting equal fortune for them. The worst was that Papa Malgras had just retired after making his fortune. It was but a modest competence, after all, an income of about ten thousand francs, upon which he had decided to live in a little house at bois Colombe, like the careful man he was. It was highly amusing to hear him speak of the famous Naudet, full of disdain for the millions turned over by that speculator. Millions that would some day fall upon his nose, said Malgras. Claude, having casually met him, only succeeded in selling him a last picture, one of his sketches from the nude made at the Boutin studio, that superb study of a woman's trunk which the erstwhile dealer had not been able to see afresh without feeling a revival of his old passion for it. So misery was imminent. Outlets were closing instead of new ones opening. 
disquieting rumours were beginning to circulate concerning the young painter's works, so constantly rejected at the salon. And besides, Claude's style of art, so revolutionary and imperfect, in which the startled eye found naught of admitted conventionality, would of itself have sufficed to drive away wealthy buyers. One evening, being unable to settle his bill at his colour shop, the painter had exclaimed that he would live upon the capital of his income rather than lower himself to the degrading production of trade pictures. But Christine had violently opposed such an extreme measure. She would retrench still further. In short, she preferred anything to such madness, which would end by throwing them into the streets without even bread to eat. After the rejection of Claude's third picture, the summer proved so wonderfully fine that the painter seemed to derive new strength from it. There was not a cloud. Limpid light streamed, day after day, upon the giant activity of Paris. Claude had resumed his peregrinations through the city, determined to find a master-stroke, as he expressed it, something huge, something decisive, he did not exactly know what. September came, and still he had found nothing that satisfied him. He simply went mad for a week about one or another subject, and then declared that it was not the thing after all. His life was spent in constant excitement. He was ever on the watch, on the point of setting his hand on the realization of his dream, which always flew away. In reality, beneath his intractable realism lay the superstition of a nervous woman, he believed in occult and complex influences everything luck or ill luck must depend upon the view selected one afternoon it was one of the last fine days of the season claude took christine out with him leaving little jacques in the charge of the housekeeper a kind old woman as was their wont when they wanted to go out together that day the young painter was possessed by a sudden whim to ramble about and revisit in Christine's company the nooks beloved in other days, and behind this desire of his there lurked a vague hope that she would bring him luck, and thus they went as far as the Pont Louis-Philippe, and remained for a quarter of an hour on the Quai des Ormes, silent, leaning against the parapet, and looking at the old Hôtel de Martoy across the Seine where they had first loved each other. Then, still without saying a word, they went their former round. They started along the quays under the plane trees, seeing the past rise up before them at every step. Everything spread out again, the bridges with their arches opening upon the sheeny water, the cité enveloped in shade, above which rose the flavescent towers of Notre Dame, the great curve of the right bank flooded with sunlight, and ending in the indistinct silhouette of the Pavilion des Flores, together with the broad avenues, the monuments and edifices on both banks, and all the life of the river, the floating washhouses, the baths, and the lighters. As of old, the orb in its decline followed them, seemingly rolling along the distant housetops and assuming a crescent shape as it appeared from behind the dome of the Institute. There was a dazzling sunset, they had never beheld a more magnificent one, such a majestic descent amidst tiny cloudlets that changed into purple network between the meshes of which a shower of gold escaped. But of the past that thus rose up before their eyes there came to them naught but invisible sadness, a sensation that things escaped them, and that it was impossible for them to retrace their way upstream and live their life over again. All those old stones remained cold, the constant current beneath the bridge, the water that had ever flowed onward and onward, seemed to have borne away something of their own selves, the delight of early desire and the joyfulness of hope. Now that they belonged to one another, they no longer tasted the simple happiness born of feeling the warm pressure of their arms as they strolled on slowly, enveloped by the mighty vitality of Paris. On reaching the Pont des Saint-Pères, Claude, in sheer despair, stopped short. He had relinquished Christine's arm, and had turned his face towards the point of the Cité. She no doubt felt the severance that was taking place, and became very sad. Seeing that he lingered there obliviously, she wished to regain her hold upon him. "'My dear,' she said, 
Let us go home. It's time. Jacques will be waiting for us, you know. But he went halfway across the bridge, and she had to follow him. Then once more he remained motionless, with his eyes still fixed on the cité, on that island which ever rode at anchor, the cradle and heart of Paris, where, for centuries, all the blood of her arteries had converged amid the constant growth of faubourgs invading the plain. And a glow came over Claude's face, his eyes sparkled, and at last he made a sweeping gesture. Look, look! In the immediate foreground, beneath them, was the port of San Nicolas, with the low shanties serving as offices for the inspectors of navigation, and the large paved river bank sloping down, littered with piles of sand, barrels and sacks, and edged with a row of lighters, still full, in which busy lumpers swarmed beneath the gigantic arm of an iron crane. Then, on the other side of the river, above a cold swimming bath, resounding with the shouts of the last bathers of the season, the strips of grey linen that served as a roofing flapped in the wind. In the middle, the open stream flowed up in rippling greenish wavelets, tipped here and there with white, blue, and pink. And then there came the Pont des Arts, standing back, high above the water on its iron girders, like black lacework, and animated by a ceaseless procession of foot-passengers, who looked like ants careering over the narrow line of the horizontal plain. Below, the Seine flowed away to the far distance. You saw the old arches of the Pont Neuf, browny with stone rust. On the left, as far as the Isle of Saint-Louis, came a mirror-like gap, and the other arm of the river curved sharply, the lock gates of the Mint shutting out the view with a bar of foam. Along the Pont Neuf passed big yellow omnibuses, motley vehicles of all kinds, with the mechanical regularity of so many children's toys. The whole of the background was enframed within the perspective of the two banks. On the right were houses on the quays, partly hidden by a cluster of lofty trees, from behind which, on the horizon, there emerged a corner of the Hôtel de Ville, together with the square clock tower of Saint-Gervais both looking as indistinct as if they had stood far away in the suburbs. And on the left bank there was a wing of the Institute, the flat frontage of the Mint, and yet another enfilade of trees. But the centre of the immense picture, that which rose most prominently from the stream and soared to the sky, was the Cité, showing like the prow of an antique vessel, ever burnished by the setting sun. Down below, the poplars on the strip of ground that joins the two sections of the Pont Neuf hid the statue of Henri XIV with a dense mass of green foliage. Higher up, the sun set the two lines of frontages in contrast, wrapping the grey buildings of the Quai de l'Horloge in shade and illuminating with a blaze those of the Quai des Orières. Rows of irregular houses which stood out so clearly that one distinguished the smallest details, the shops, the signboards, even the curtains at the windows. Higher up, amid the jagged outlines of chimney stacks, behind a slanting chessboard of smaller roofs, the pepper-caster turrets of the Palais de Justice and the garrets of the Prefecture of Police displayed sheets of slate intersected by a colossal advertisement painted in blue upon a wall with gigantic letters which visible to all paris seemed like some efflorescence of the feverish life of modern times sprouting on the city's brow higher higher still betwixt the twin towers of notre dame of the colour of old gold two arrows darted upwards the spire of the cathedral itself and to the left that of the Saint-Chapelle, both so elegantly slim that they seemed to quiver in the breeze, as if they had been the proud topmasts of the ancient vessel rising into the brightness of the open sky. "'Are you coming, dear?' asked Christine gently. Claude did not hear her. This, the heart of Paris, had taken full possession of him. The splendid evening seemed to widen the horizon. There were patches of vivid light, and of clearly defined shadow. There was a brightness in the precision of each detail, a transparency in the air which throbbed with gladness, and the river life, the turmoil of the keys, 
all the people streaming along the streets, rolling over the bridges, arriving from every side of that huge cauldron, Paris, steamed there in visible billows with a quiver that was apparent in the sunlight. There was a light breeze, high aloft a flight of small cloudlets crossed the paling azure sky, and one could hear a slow but mighty palpitation, as if the soul of Paris here dwelt around its cradle. But Christine, frightened at seeing Claude so absorbed, and seized herself with a kind of religious awe, took hold of his arm and dragged him away, as if she had felt that some great danger was threatening him. "'Let us go home. You are doing yourself harm. I want to get back.' At her touch he started like a man disturbed in sleep. Then, turning his head to take a last look, he muttered, "'Oh, heavens! Oh, heavens! How beautiful!' He allowed himself to be led away. But throughout the evening, first at dinner, afterwards beside the stove, and until he went to bed, he remained like one dazed, so deep in his cogitations, that he did not utter half a dozen sentences and Christine, failing to draw from him any answer to her questions, at last became silent also. She looked at him anxiously. Was it the approach of some serious illness? Had he inhaled some bad air whilst standing midway across the bridge yonder? His eyes stared vaguely into space. His face flushed as if with some inner straining. One would have thought it the mute travail of germination, as if something were springing into life within him. End of chapter 8, part A Chapter 8, part B of His Masterpiece by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. The next morning, immediately after breakfast, he set off, and Christine spent a very sorrowful day, for although she had become more easy in mind on hearing him whistle some of his old southern tunes as he got up, she was worried by another matter, which she had not mentioned to him for fear of damping his spirits again. That day they would for the first time lack everything. A whole week separated them from the date when their little income would fall due and she had spent her last copper that morning. She had nothing left for the evening, not even the wherewithal to buy a loaf. To whom could she apply? How could she manage to hide the truth any longer from him when he came home hungry? She made up her mind to pledge the black silk dress which Madame Van Zad had formerly given her, but it was with a heavy heart. She trembled with fear and shame at the idea of the pawn-shop, that familiar resort of the poor which she had never as yet entered, and she was touched by such apprehension about the future that from the ten francs which were lent her she only took enough to make a sorrel soup and a stew of potatoes. On coming out of the pawn-office, a meeting with somebody she knew had given her the finishing stroke. As it happened, Claude came home very late, gesticulating merrily, and his eyes very bright as if he were excited by some secret joy. He was very hungry and grumbled because the cloth was not laid. Then, having sat down between Christine and little Jacques, he swallowed his soup and devoured a plateful of potatoes. "'Is that all?' he asked when he had finished. "'You might as well have added a scrap of meat. Did you have to buy some boots again?' She stammered, not daring to tell him the truth, but hurt at heart by this injustice. He, however, went on chaffing her about the coppers she juggled away to buy herself things with, and getting more and more excited amid the egotism of feelings which he seemingly wished to keep to himself, he suddenly flew out at Jacques. "'Hold your noise, you brat! You drive one mad!' The child, forgetting all about his dinner, had been tapping the edge of his plate with his spoon, his eyes full of mirthful delight at this music. "'Jacques, be quiet,' scoldingly said his mother, in her turn. "'Let your father have his dinner in peace.' Then the little one, abashed, at once became very quiet and relapsed into gloomy stillness, with his lustreless eyes fixed on his potatoes, which, however, he did not eat. Claude made a show of stuffing himself with cheese, while Christine, quite grieved, 
offered to fetch some cold meat from a ham and beef shop, but he declined and prevented her going by words that pained her still more. Then, the table having been cleared, they all sat round the lamp for the evening, she sewing, the little one turning over a picture-book in silence, and Claude drumming on the table with his fingers, his mind the while wandering back to the spot whence he had come. Suddenly he rose, sat down again with a sheet of paper and a pencil, and began sketching rapidly in the vivid circle of light that fell from under the lampshade and such was his longing to give outward expression to the tumultuous ideas beating in his skull, that soon his sketch did not suffice for his relief. On the contrary, it goaded him on, and he finished by unburthening his mind in a flood of words. He would have shouted to the walls, and if he addressed himself to his wife, it was because she happened to be there. "'Look, that's what we saw yesterday. It's magnificent. I spent three hours there today. I've got hold of what I want.' something wonderful, something that'll knock everything else to pieces. Just look, I station myself under the bridge. In the immediate foreground I have the port of San Nicolas, with its crane, its lighters which are being unloaded, and its crowd of labourers. Do you see the idea? It's Paris at work, all those brawny fellows displaying their bare arms and chests. Then, on the other side, I have the swimming baths, Paris at play, and some skiff there, no doubt, to occupy the centre of the composition, but of that I am not yet certain. I must feel my way. As a matter of course, the Seine will be there in the middle, broad, immense. While talking, he kept on indicating outlines with his pencil, thickening his strokes over and over again, and tearing the paper in his very energy. She, in order to please him, bent over the sketch, pretending to grow very interested in his explanations but there was such a labyrinth of lines, such a confusion of summary details, that she failed to distinguish anything. "'You are following me, aren't you?' "'Yes, yes, very beautiful indeed.' "'Then I have the background, the two arms of the river with their keys, the Cité rising up triumphantly in the centre, and standing out against the sky. Ah, that background, what a marvel! People see it every day, pass before it without stopping, but it takes hold of one all the same.' One's admiration accumulates, and one fine afternoon it bursts forth. Nothing in the world can be grander. It is Paris herself, glorious in the sunlight. Oh, what a fool I was not to think of it before! How many times I have looked at it without seeing! However, I stumbled on it, after that ramble along the quays. And do you remember, there's a dash of shadow on that side, while here the sunrays fall quite straight. The towers are yonder, the spire of the Sainte chapelle tapers upward as slim as a needle pointing to the sky. But no, it's more to the right. Wait, I'll show you. He began again, never wearying, but constantly retouching the sketch, and adding innumerable little characteristic details, which his painter's eye had noticed. Here the red signboard of a distant shop vibrated in the light. Closer by was a greenish bit of the Seine, on whose surface large patches of oil seemed to be floating and then there was the delicate tone of a tree, the gamut of greys supplied by the house frontages, and the luminous cast of the sky. She complacently approved of all he said, and tried to look delighted. But Jacques once again forgot what he had been told. After long remaining silent before his book, absorbed in the contemplation of a woodcut depicting a black cat, he began to hum some words of his own composition, Oh, you pretty cat, oh, you ugly cat, oh, you pretty ugly cat, and so on, ad infinitum, ever in the same lugubrious manner. Claude, who was made fidgety by the buzzing noise, did not at first understand what was upsetting him, but after a time the child's harassing phrase fell clearly upon his ear. Haven't you done worrying us with your cat? he shouted furiously. Hold your tongue, Jacques, while your father is talking, repeated Christine. "'Upon my word, I do believe he is becoming an idiot. "'Just look at his head if it isn't like an idiot's. "'It's dreadful. "'Just say, what do you mean by your pretty and ugly cat?' "'The little fellow, turning pale and wagging his big head, "'looked stupid and replied, "'Don't know.' "'Then, as his father and mother gazed at each other with a discouraged air, "'he rested his cheek on the open picture-book "'and remained like that, neither stirring nor speaking.' but with his eyes wide open. 
It was getting late. Christine wanted to put him to bed, but Claude had already resumed his explanations. He now told her that, the very next morning, he should go and make a sketch on that spot, just in order to fix his ideas. And as he rattled on, he began to talk of buying a small camp easel, a thing upon which he had set his heart for months. He kept harping on the subject, and spoke of money matters, till she at last became embarrassed, and ended by telling him of everything, the last copper she had spent that morning, and the silk dress she had pledged in order to dine that evening. Thereupon he became very remorseful and affectionate. He kissed her and asked her forgiveness for having complained about the dinner. She would excuse him, surely. He would have killed father and mother, as he kept on repeating, when that confounded painting got hold of him. As for the pawn-shop, it made him laugh. He defied misery. "'I tell you that we are all right,' he exclaimed. "'That picture means success.' She kept silent, thinking about her meeting of the morning, which she wished to hide from him, but without apparent cause or transition in the kind of torpor that had come over her. The words she would have kept back rose invincibly to her lips. "'Madame Van Zad is dead,' she said. He looked surprised. "'Oh, really? How did she, Christine, know it?' "'I met the old man-servant. Oh, he's a gentleman by now, looking very sprightly, in spite of his seventy years. I did not know him again. It was he who spoke to me. Yes, she died six weeks ago. Her millions have gone to various charities, with the exception of an annuity to the old servants, upon which they are living snugly, like people of the middle classes.' He looked at her, and at last murmured in a saddened voice, "'My poor Christine, you are regretting things now, aren't you? She would have given you a marriage portion, have found you a husband. I told you so in days gone by. She would, perhaps, have left you all her money. And you wouldn't now be starving with a crazy fellow like myself.' She then seemed to wake from her dream. She drew her chair to his, caught hold of one of his arms and nestled against him, as if her whole being protested against his words. "'What are you saying? Oh, no! Oh, no! It would have been shameful to have thought of her money. I would confess it to you if it were the case, and you know that I never tell lies. But I myself don't know what came over me when I heard the news. I felt upset and saddened, so sad that I imagined everything was over for me. It was no doubt remorse, yes, remorse, at having deserted her so brutally, poor invalid that she was, the good old soul who called me her daughter. I behaved very badly, and it won't bring me luck. Ah, don't say no, I feel it well enough, henceforth there's an end to everything for me. Then she wept, choked by those confused regrets, the significance of which she failed to understand, regrets mingling with the one feeling that her life was spoilt, and that she now had nothing but unhappiness before her. "'Come, wipe your eyes,' said Claude, becoming affectionate once more. "'Is it possible that you, who were never nervous, can conjure up chimeras and worry yourself in this way? Dash it all, we shall get out of our difficulties. First of all, you know that it was through you that I found the subject for my picture. There cannot be much of a curse upon you, since you bring me luck.' He laughed, and she shook her head, seeing well enough that he wanted to make her smile. She was suffering on account of his picture already, for on the bridge he had completely forgotten her, as if she had ceased to belong to him. And since the previous night she had realized that he was farther and farther removed from her, alone in a world to which she could not ascend. But she allowed him to soothe her, and they exchanged one of their kisses of yore, before rising from the table to retire to rest. Little Jacques had heard nothing. Benumbed by his stillness, he had fallen asleep with his cheek on his picture-book, and his big head, so heavy at times that it bent his neck, looked pale in the lamplight. Poor little offspring of genius, which, when it begets at all, so often begets idiocy or physical imperfection. When his mother put him to bed, Jacques did not even open his eyes. It was only at this period that the idea of marrying Christine came to Claude. Though yielding to the advice of Sandoz, who expressed his surprise at the prolongation of an irregular situation which no circumstances justified, 
he more particularly gave way to a feeling of pity, to a desire to show himself kind to his mistress, and to win forgiveness for his delinquencies. He had seen her so sad of late, so uneasy with respect to the future, that he did not know how to revive her spirits. He himself was growing soured, and relapsing into his former fits of anger, treating her at times like a servant to whom one flings a week's notice. Being his lawful wife, she would no doubt feel herself more in her rightful home, and would suffer less from his rough behaviour. She herself, for that matter, had never again spoken of marriage. She seemed to care nothing for earthly things, but entirely reposed upon him. However, he understood well enough that it grieved her that she was not able to visit at Sandoz's. Besides, they no longer lived amid the freedom and solitude of the country. They were in Paris, with its thousand and one petty spites, everything that is calculated to wound a woman in an irregular position. In reality, he had nothing against marriage, save his old prejudices, those of an artist who takes life as he lists. Since he was never to leave her, why not afford her that pleasure? And, in fact, when he spoke to her about it, she gave a loud cry and threw her arms round his neck, surprised at experiencing such great emotion. During a whole week it made her feel thoroughly happy, but her joy subsided long before the ceremony. Moreover, Claude did not hurry over any of the formalities, and they had to wait a long while for the necessary papers. He continued getting the sketches for his picture together, and she, like himself, did not seem in the least impatient. What was the good? It would assuredly make no difference in their life. They had decided to be married merely at the municipal offices, not in view of displaying any contempt for religion, but to get the affair over quickly and simply. That would suffice. The question of witnesses embarrassed them for a moment. As she was absolutely unacquainted with anybody, he selected Sandoz and Maudot to act for her. For a moment he had thought of replacing the latter by Dubouche, but he never saw the architect now, and he feared to compromise him. He, Claude, would be content with Jory and Gagnière. In that way the affair would pass off among friends, and nobody would talk of it. Several weeks had gone by. They were in December, and the weather proved terribly cold. On the day before the wedding, although they barely had thirty-five francs left them, they agreed that they could not send their witnesses away with a mere shake of the hand. And rather than have a lot of trouble in the studio, they decided to offer them a lunch at a small restaurant on the Boulevard de Clichy, after which they would all go home. In the morning, while Christine was tacking a collar to a grey linsey gown, which, with the coquetry of women, she had made for the occasion, it occurred to Claude, who was already wearing his frock coat and kicking his heels impatiently, to go and fetch Maudot, for the latter, he asserted, was quite capable of forgetting all about the appointment. Since autumn the sculptor had been living at Montmartre, in a small studio in the Rue des Tilleuls. He had moved thither in consequence of a series of affairs that had quite upset him. First of all, he had been turned out of the fruiter's shop in the Rue de Cherche Midi for not paying his rent. Then had come a definite rupture with Shane, who, despairing of being able to live by his brush, had rushed into commercial enterprise, betaking himself to all the fairs around Paris as the manager of a kind of fortune's wheel belonging to a widow. While last of all had come the sudden flight of Mathilde, her herbalist business sold up, and she herself disappearing, it seemed, with some mysterious admirer. At present Maudot lived all by himself in greater misery than ever, only eating when he secured a job at scraping some architectural ornaments, or preparing work for some more prosperous fellow-sculptor. "'I'm going to fetch him, do you hear?' Claude repeated to Christine. "'We still have a couple of hours before us, and if the others come, make them wait.' We'll go to the municipal offices altogether. Once outside, Claude hurried along in the nipping cold which loaded his moustache with icicles. Maudot's studio was at the end of a conglomeration of tenements, rents, so to say, and he had to cross a number of small gardens, white with rime, and showing the bleak, stiff melancholy of cemeteries. He could distinguish his friend's place from afar on account of the colossal plaster statue of the vintaging girl, the once successful exhibit of the salon, for which there had not been sufficient space in the narrow ground-floor studio. 
Thus it was rotting out in the open, like so much rubbish shot from a cart, a lamentable spectacle, weather-bitten, riddled by the rain's big grimy tears. The key was in the door, so Claude went in. "'Hallo, have you come to fetch me?' said Maudot in surprise. "'I've only got my hat to put on. But wait a bit, I was asking myself whether it wouldn't be better to light a little fire. I am uneasy about my woman there.' Some water in a bucket was ice-bound. So cold was the studio that it froze inside as hard as it did out of doors. For having been penniless for a whole week, Maudot had gingerly eked out the little coal remaining to him, only lighting the stove for an hour or two of a morning. His studio was a kind of tragic cavern, compared with which the shop of former days evoked reminiscences of snug comfort. Such was the tomb-like chill that fell on one's shoulders from the creviced ceiling and the bare walls. In the various corners some statues, of less bulky dimensions than the vintaging girl, plaster figures which had been modelled with passion and exhibited, and which had then come back for want of buyers, seemed to be shivering with their noses turned to the wall, forming a melancholy row of cripples, some already badly damaged, showing mere stumps of arms, and all dust-begrimed and clay-bespattered. Under the eyes of their artist-creator, who had given them his heart's blood, those wretched nudities dragged out years of agony. At first, no doubt, they were preserved with jealous care, despite the lack of room. But then they lapsed into the grotesque horror of all lifeless things, until a day came when, taking up a mallet, he himself finished them off breaking them into mere lumps of plaster so as to be rid of them. "'You say we've got two hours, eh?' resumed Maudo. "'Well, I'll just light a bit of fire. It'll be the wiser, perhaps.' Then, while lighting the stove, he began bewailing his fate in an angry voice. "'What a dog's life a sculptor's was! The most bungling stonemason was better off. A figure which the government bought for three thousand francs cost well nigh two thousand what with its model, clay, marble, or bronze, all sorts of expenses, indeed, and for all that it remained buried in some official cellar, on the pretext that there was no room for it elsewhere. The niches of the public building remained empty. Pedestals were awaiting statues in the public gardens. No matter, there was never any room. And there were no possible commissions from private people. At best one received an order for a few busts, and at very rare intervals, one for a memorial statue, subscribed for by the public and hurriedly executed at reduced terms. Sculpture was the noblest of arts, the most manly, yes, but the one which led the most surely to death by starvation. "'Is your machine progressing?' asked Claude. "'Without this confounded cold it would be finished,' answered Maudot. "'I'll show it you.' He rose from his knees after listening to the snorting of the stove. In the middle of the studio, on a packing case, strengthened by cross pieces, stood a statue swathed in linen wraps which was quite rigid, hard frozen, draping the figure with the whiteness of a shroud. This statue embodied Maudot's old dream, unrealized until now from lack of means. It was an upright figure of that bathing girl of whom more than a dozen small models had been knocking about his place for years. In a moment of impatient revolt, he himself had manufactured trusses and stays out of broom handles, dispensing with the necessary ironwork in the hope that the wood would prove sufficiently solid. From time to time he shook the figure to try it, but as yet it had not budged. "'The devil!' he muttered. Some warmth will do her good. These wraps seem glued to her. They form quite a breastplate. The linen was cracking between his fingers, and splinters of ice were breaking off. He was obliged to wait until the heat produced a slight thaw, and then with great care he stripped the figure, bearing the head first, then the bosom, and then the hips, well pleased at finding everything intact, and smiling like a lover at a woman fondly adored. "'Well, what do you think of it?' Claude, who had only previously seen a little rough model of the statue, nodded his head in order that he might not have to answer immediately. Decidedly, that good fellow, Maudot, was turning traitor, and drifting towards gracefulness in spite of himself, 
for pretty things ever sprang from under his big fingers, former stone-cutter though he was. Since his colossal vintaging girl, he had gone on reducing and reducing the proportions of his figures, without appearing to be aware of it himself, always ready to stick out ferociously for the gigantic, which agreed with his temperament, but yielding to the partiality of his eyes for sweetness and gracefulness. And indeed real nature broke at last through inflated ambition. Exaggerated still, his bathing girl was already possessed of great charm, with her quivering shoulders and her tightly crossed arms that supported her breast. "'Well, you don't like her?' he asked, looking annoyed. "'Oh, yes, I do. I think you are right to tone things down a bit, seeing that you feel like that. You'll have a great success with this. Yes, it's evident it will please people very much.' Maudo, who such praises would once have thrown into consternation, seemed delighted. He explained that he wished to conquer public opinion without relinquishing a tithe of his convictions. "'Ah, oh, dash it! It takes a weight off my mind to find you pleased,' said he. "'For I should have destroyed it if you had told me to do so. I give you my word. Another fortnight's work, and I'll sell my skin to no matter whom, in order to pay the moulder. I say I shall have a fine show at the salon. Perhaps get a medal.' He laughed, waved his arms about, and then, breaking off, as we are not in a hurry, sit down a bit. I want to get the wraps quite thawed. The stove, which was becoming red-hot, diffused great heat. The figure, placed close by, seemed to revive under the warm air that now crept up her from her shins to her neck. And the two friends, who had sat down, continued looking the statue full in the face, chatting about it and noting each detail. The sculptor especially grew excited in his delight, and indulged in caressing gestures. All at once, however, Claude fancied he was the victim of some hallucination. To him the figure seemed to be moving. A quiver, like the ripple of a wavelet, crossed her stomach, and her left hip became straightened, as if the right leg were about to step out. "'Have you noticed the smooth surface just about the loins?' Maudo went on without noticing anything. Ah, my boy, I took great pains over that. But by degrees the whole statue was becoming animated. The loins swayed and the bosom swelled, as with a deep sigh between the parted arms. And suddenly the head drooped, the thighs bent, and the figure came forward like a living being, with all the wild anguish, the grief-inspired spring of a woman who is flinging herself down. Claude at last understood things when Maudo uttered a terrible cry. By heavens, she's breaking to pieces. She is coming down. The clay in thawing had snapped the weak wooden trusses. There came a cracking noise, as if bones indeed were splitting, and Maudo, with the same passionate gesture with which he had caressed the figure from afar, working himself into a fever, opened both arms, at the risk of being killed by the fall. For a moment the bathing girl swayed to and fro, and then with one crash came down on her face, broken in twain at the ankles, and leaving her feet sticking to the boards. Claude had jumped up to hold his friend back. "'Dash it, you'll be smashed!' he cried. But dreading to see her finish herself off on the floor, Maudo remained with hands outstretched, and the girl seemed to fling herself on his neck. He caught her in his arms, winding them tightly round her. Her bosom was flattened against his shoulder, and her thighs beat against his own, while her decapitated head rolled upon the floor. The shock was so violent that Maudot was carried off his legs and thrown over, as far back as the wall. And there, without relaxing his hold on the girl's trunk, he remained, as if stunned, lying beside her. "'Oh, confound it!' repeated Claude furiously, believing that his friend was dead. With great difficulty, Maudot rose to his knees and burst into violent sobs. He had only damaged his face in the fall, some blood dribbling down one of his cheeks, mingling with his tears. "'Oh, curse poverty!' he said. "'It's enough to make a fellow drown himself not to be able to buy a couple of rods. And there she is! There she is!' His sobs grew louder. They became an agonizing wail, the painful shrieking of a lover before the mutilated corpse of his affections. 
With unsteady hands he touched the limbs lying in confusion around him. The head, the torso, the arms that had snapped in twain. Above aught else the bosom now caved in. That bosom, flattened as if it had been operated upon for some terrible disease, suffocated him, and he unceasingly returned to it, probing the sore, trying to find the gash by which life had fled, while his tears, mingling with blood, flowed freely and stained the statue's gaping wounds with red. "'Do help me!' he gasped. "'One can't leave her like this!' Claude was overcome also, and his own eyes grew moist from a feeling of artistic brotherliness. He hastened to his comrade's side, but the sculptor, after claiming his assistance, persisted in picking up the remains by himself, as if dreading the rough handling of anybody else. He slowly crawled about on his knees, took up the fragments one by one, and put them together on a board. The figure soon lay there in its entirety, as if it had been one of those girls who, committing suicide from love, throw themselves from some monument, and are shattered by their fall, and put together again, looking both grotesque and lamentable, to be carried to the morgue. Maudot, seated on the floor before his statue, did not take his eyes from it, but became absorbed in heart-rending contemplation. However, his sobs subsided, and at last he said with a long-drawn sigh, I shall have to model her lying down. There's no other way. Oh, my poor woman, I had such trouble to set her on her legs, and I thought her so grand like that. But all at once Claude grew uneasy. What about his wedding? Maudot must change his clothes. As he had no other frock coat than the one he was wearing, he was obliged to make a jacket do. Then the figure, having been covered with linen wraps once more, like a corpse over which a sheet had been pulled, they both started off at a run. The stove was roaring away, the thaw filled the whole studio with water, and slush streamed from the old dust-begrimed plaster casts. When they reached the Rue de Douai, there was no one there except little Jacques in charge of the doorkeeper. Christine, tired of waiting, had just started off with the three others, thinking that there had been some mistake, that Claude might have told her that he would go straight to the mayor's offices with Maudot. The pair fell into a sharp trot, but only overtook Christine and her comrades in the Rue Drouot, in front of the municipal edifice. They all went upstairs together, and as they were late they met with a very cool reception from the usher on duty. The wedding was got over in a few minutes, in a perfectly empty room. The mayor mumbled on, and the bride and bridegroom curtly uttered the binding, yes, while their witnesses were marvelling at the bad taste of the appointments of the apartment. Once outside, Claude took Christine's arm again, and that was all. It was pleasant walking in the clear, frosty weather. Thus the party quietly went back on foot, climbing the Rue des Matières to reach the restaurant on the Boulevard de Clichy. A small private room had been engaged. The lunch was a very friendly affair, and not a word was said about the simple formality that had just been gone through. Other subjects were spoken of all the while, as at one of their customary gatherings. It was thus that Christine, who in reality was very affected despite her pretended indifference, heard her husband and his friends excite themselves for three mortal hours about Maudot's unfortunate statue. Since the others had been more acquainted with the story, they kept harping on every particular of it. Sandoz thought the whole thing very wonderful. Jory and Gagnier discussed the strength of stays and trusses, the former mainly concerned about the monetary loss involved, and the other demonstrating with a chair that the statue might have been kept up. As for Maudot, still very shaky and growing dazed, he complained of a stiffness which he had not felt before. His limbs began to hurt him. He had strained his muscles and bruised his skin as if he had been caught in the embrace of a stone siren. Christine washed the scratch on his cheek, which had begun to bleed again, and it seemed to her as if the mutilated bathing girl had sat down to table with them, as if she alone was of any importance that day for she alone seemed to interest Claude, whose narrative, repeated a score of times, was full of endless particulars about the emotion he had felt on seeing that bosom 
and those hips of clay shattered at his feet. However, at dessert there came a diversion, for Gagnière all at once remarked to Jory, "'By the way, I saw you with Matilda the day before yesterday. Yes, yes, in the Rue Dauphine.' Jory, who had turned very red, tried to deny it. "'Oh, a mere accidental meeting, honour bright,' he stammered. "'I don't know where she hangs out, or I would tell you.' "'What, is it you who are hiding her?' exclaimed Mahoudeau. "'Well, nobody wants to see her again.' The truth was that Jory, throwing to the winds all his habits of prudence and parsimony, was now secretly providing for Mathilde. She had gained an ascendancy over him by his vices. They still lingered at table, and night was falling when they escorted Mahoudeau to his own door. Claude and Christine, on reaching home, took Jacques from the doorkeeper and found the studio quite chilly, wrapped in such dense gloom that they had to grope about for several minutes before they were able to light the lamp. They also had to light the stove again, and it struck seven o'clock before they were able to draw breath at their ease. They were not hungry, so they merely finished the remains of some boiled beef, mainly by way of encouraging the child to eat his soup, and when they had put him to bed, they settled themselves with the lamp betwixt them, as was their habit every evening. However, Christine had not put out any work. She felt too much moved to sew. She sat there with her hands resting idly on the table, looking at Claude, who on his side had at once become absorbed in a sketch, a bit of his picture, some workmen of the Port Saint-Nicolas unloading plaster. Invincible dreaminess came over the young woman. All sorts of recollections and regrets became apparent in the depth of her dim eyes. And by degrees, growing sadness, great mute grief took absolute possession of her amid the indifference, the boundless solitude into which she seemed to be drifting, although she was so near to Claude. He was indeed on the other side of the table, yet how far away she felt him to be. He was yonder before that point of the Cité. He was even farther still in the infinite, inaccessible regions of art, so far indeed that she would now never more be able to join him. She several times tried to start a conversation, but without eliciting any answer. She grew weary and numb with doing nothing, and she ended by taking out her purse and counting her money. Do you know how much we have to begin our married life with? Claude did not even raise his head. We've nine sous. Ah, oh, talk of poverty. He shrugged his shoulders and finally growled, We shall be rich some day, don't fret. Then the silence fell again, and she did not even attempt to break it, but gazed at her nine coppers laid in a row upon the table. At last, as it struck midnight, she shivered, ill with waiting, and chilled by the cold. "'Let's go to bed, dear,' she murmured. "'I'm dead tired.' He, however, was working frantically and did not even hear her. "'The fire's gone out,' she began again. "'We shall make ourselves ill. Let's go to bed.' Her imploring voice reached him at last and made him start with sudden exasperation. "'Oh, go if you like. You can see very well that I want to finish something.' She remained there for another minute, amazed by his sudden anger, her face expressive of deep sorrow. Then, feeling that he would rather be without her, that the very presence of a woman doing nothing upset him, she rose from the table and went off, leaving the door wide open. Half an hour, three quarters went by, nothing stirred, not a sound came from her room. But she was not asleep, her eyes were staring into the gloom and at last she timidly ventured upon a final appeal from the depths of the dark alcove. An oath was the only reply she received, and nothing stirred after that. She perhaps dozed off. The cold in the studio grew keener, and the wick of the lamp began to carbonize and burn red, while Claude, still bending over his sketch, did not seem conscious of the passing minutes. At two o'clock, however, he rose up, furious to find the lamp going out for lack of oil. He only had time to take it into the other room so that he might not have to undress in the dark. But his displeasure increased on seeing that Christine's eyes were wide open. He felt inclined to complain of it. However, after some random remarks, he suddenly exclaimed, The most surprising thing is that her trunk wasn't hurt. What do you mean? asked Christine in amazement. Why, Mahoudeau's girl! 
he answered. At this she shook nervously, turned and buried her face in the pillow, and he was quite surprised on hearing her burst into sobs. "'What? You are crying?' he exclaimed. She was choking, sobbing with heart-rending violence. "'Come, what's the matter with you? I've said nothing to you. Come, darling, what's the matter?' But while he was speaking, the cause of her great grief dawned upon him. No doubt on a day like that he ought to have shown more affection. But his neglect was unintentional enough. He had not even given the matter a thought. She surely knew him, said he. He became a downright brute when he was at work. Then he bent over and embraced her. But it was as if something irreparable had taken place, as if something had forever snapped, leaving a void between them. The formality of marriage seemed to have killed love. End of chapter 8Chapter 9, Part A of His Masterpiece by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. As Claude could not paint his huge picture in the small studio of the Rue du Douai, he made up his mind to rent some shed that would be spacious enough elsewhere, and strolling one day on the heights of Montmartre, he found what he wanted halfway down the slope of the Rue Tourlac, a street that descends abruptly behind the cemetery, and whence one overlooks Clichy as far as the marshes of Genevilliers. It had been a dyer's drying shed, and was nearly fifty feet long and more than thirty broad, with walls of board and plaster, admitting the wind from every point of the compass. The place was let to him for three hundred francs, summer was at hand he would soon work off his picture and then quit this settled feverish with hope claude decided to go to all the necessary expenses as fortune was certain to come in the end why trammel its advent by unnecessary scruples taking advantage of his right he broke in upon the principle of his income and soon grew accustomed to spend money without counting at first he kept the matter from christine for she had already twice stopped him from doing so and when he was at last obliged to tell her she also after a week of reproaches and apprehension fell in with it happy at the comfort in which she lived and yielding to the pleasure of always having a little money in her purse thus there came a few years of easy unconcern claude soon became altogether absorbed in his picture he had furnished the huge studio in a very summery style a few chairs the old couch from the quai de bourbon and a deal table bought second-hand for five francs sufficed him in the practice of his art he was entirely devoid of that vanity which delights in luxurious surroundings the only real expense to which he went was that of buying some steps on casters with a platform and a movable footboard Next he busied himself about his canvas, which he wished to be six and twenty feet in length and sixteen in height. He insisted upon preparing it himself, ordered a framework, and bought the necessary seamless canvas, which he and a couple of friends had all the work in the world to stretch properly by the aid of pincers. Then he just coated the canvas with ceruse, laid on with a palette knife, refusing to size it previously in order that it might remain absorbent, by which method he declared that the painting would be bright and solid. An easel was not to be thought of. It would not have been possible to move a canvas of such dimensions on it. So he invented a system of ropes and beams, which held it slightly slanting against the wall in a cheerful light. And backwards and forwards in front of the big white surface rolled the steps, looking like an edifice, like the scaffolding, by means of which a cathedral is to be reared. But when everything was ready, Claude once more experienced misgivings. An idea that he had perhaps not chosen the proper light in which to paint his picture fidgeted him. Perhaps an early morning effect would have been better. Perhaps, too, he ought to have chosen a dull day, and so he went back to the Pont des Saint-Pères and lived there for another three months. The Cité rose up before him between the two arms of the river, at all hours and in all weather. 
After a late fall of snow he beheld it wrapped in ermine, standing above mud-coloured water against a light, slaty sky. On the first sunshiny days he saw it cleanse itself of everything that was wintry, and put on an aspect of youth, when verdure sprouted from the lofty trees which rose from the ground below the bridge. He saw it, too, on a somewhat misty day, recede to a distance and almost evaporate, delicate and quivering, like a fairy palace. Then again there were pelting rains which submerged it, hid it as with a huge curtain drawn from the sky to the earth, storms with lightning flashes which lent it a tawny hue, the opaque light of some cutthroat place half destroyed by the fall of the huge copper-coloured clouds and there were winds that swept over it tempestuously, sharpening its angles and making it look hard, bare, and beaten against the pale blue sky. Then again, when the sunbeams broke into dust amidst the vapours of the Seine, it appeared steeped in diffused brightness, without a shadow about it, lighted up equally on every side, and looking as charmingly delicate as a cut gem set in fine gold. He insisted on beholding it when the sun was rising and transpiercing the morning mists, when the quai de l'horloge flushes and the quai des orfèves remains wrapped in gloom, when, up in the pink sky, it is already full of life with the bright awakening of its towers and spires, while night, similar to a falling cloak, slides slowly from its lower buildings. He beheld it also at noon when the sun-rays fall on it vertically, when a crude glare bites into it, and it becomes discoloured and mute like a dead city, retaining naught but the life of heat, the quiver that darts over its distant housetops. He beheld it, moreover, beneath the setting sun, surrendering itself to the night which was slowly rising from the river, with the salient edges of its buildings still fringed with a glow as of embers, and with final conflagrations rekindling in its windows, from whose panes leapt tongue-like flashes. But in presence of those twenty different aspects of the Cité, no matter what the hour or the weather might be, he ever came back to the Cité that he had seen the first time, at about four o'clock one fine September afternoon, a Cité all serenity under a gentle breeze, a cité which typified the heart of Paris, beating in the limpid atmosphere, and seemingly enlarged by the vast stretch of sky which a flight of cloudlets crossed. Claude spent his time under the Pont des Saints-Pères, which he had made his shelter, his home, his roof. The constant din of the vehicles overhead, similar to the distant rumbling of thunder, no longer disturbed him. Settling himself against the first abutment, beneath the huge iron arches, he took sketches and painted studies. The employés of the River Navigation Service, whose offices were hard by, got to know him, and, indeed, the wife of an inspector, who lived in a sort of tarred cabin with her husband, two children, and a cat, kept his canvases for him, to save him the trouble of carrying them to and from each day. It became his joy to remain in that secluded nook beneath Paris, which rumbled in the air above him, whose ardent life he ever felt rolling overhead. He at first became passionately interested in Port Saint-Nicolas, with its ceaseless bustle suggesting that of a distant, genuine seaport. The steam crane, the Sophia, worked regularly, hauling up blocks of stone. Tumbrels arrived to fetch loads of sand, men and horses pulled, panting for breath on the big paving stones which sloped down as far as the water, to a granite margin, alongside which two rows of lighters and barges were moored. For weeks Claude worked hard at a study of some lightermen, unloading a cargo of plaster, carrying white sacks on their shoulders, leaving a white pathway behind them, and be powdered with white themselves, whilst hard by... The coal removed from another barge had stained the waterside with a huge inky smear. Then he sketched the silhouette of a swimming bath on the left bank, together with a floating wash house somewhat in the rear, showing the windows open and the washerwomen kneeling in a row on a level with the stream and beating their dirty linen. In the middle of the river he studied a boat which a waterman sculled over the stern. Then farther behind, 
a steamer of the towing service straining its chain and dragging a series of rafts loaded with barrels and boards upstream. The principal backgrounds had been sketched a long while ago. Still, he did several bits over again. The two arms of the Seine, and a sky all by itself, into which rose only towers and spires gilded by the sun. And under the hospitable bridge, in that nook as secluded as some far-off cleft in a rock, he was rarely disturbed by anybody. Anglers passed by with contemptuous unconcern. His only companion was, virtually, the overseer's cat, who cleaned herself in the sunlight, ever placid beneath the tumult of the world overhead. At last Claude had all his materials ready. In a few days he threw off an outline sketch of the whole, and the great work was begun. However, the first battle between himself and his huge canvas raged in the Rue Tourlac throughout the summer, for he obstinately insisted upon personally attending to all the technical calculations of his composition, and he failed to manage them, getting into constant muddles about the slightest deviation from mathematical accuracy, of which he had no experience. It made him indignant with himself, so he let it go, deciding to make what corrections might be necessary afterwards. He covered his canvas with a rush, in such a fever as to live all day on his steps, brandishing huge brushes and expending as much muscular force as if he were anxious to move mountains. And when evening came he reeled about like a drunken man, and fell asleep as soon as he had swallowed his last mouthful of food. His wife even had to put him to bed like a child. From those heroic efforts, however, sprang a masterly first draft, in which genius blazed forth amidst the somewhat chaotic masses of colour. Bongrand, who came to look at it, caught the painter in his big arms and stifled him with embraces, his eyes full of tears. Sandoz, in his enthusiasm, gave a dinner. The others, Jory, Maudo, and Gagnier, again went about announcing a masterpiece. As for Fagerolles, he remained motionless before the painting for a moment, then burst into congratulations, pronouncing it too beautiful. And in fact, subsequently, as if the irony of that successful trickster had brought him bad luck, Claude only spoilt his original draft. It was the old story over again. He spent himself in one effort, one magnificent dash. He failed to bring out all the rest. He did not know how to finish. He fell into his former impotence, for two years he lived before that picture only, having no feeling for anything else. At times he was in a seventh heaven of exuberant joy. At others flung to earth so wretched, so distracted by doubt, that dying men gasping in their beds in a hospital were happier than himself. Twice already had he failed to be ready for the salon, for invariably at the last moment, when he hoped to have finished in a few sittings, he found some void, felt his composition crack and crumble beneath his fingers. When the third salon drew nigh, there came a terrible crisis. He remained for a fortnight without going to his studio in the Rue Tourlac, and when he did so, it was as to a house desolated by death. He turned the huge canvas to the wall and rolled his steps into a corner. He would have smashed and burned everything if his faltering hands had found strength enough. Nothing more existed. Amid a blast of anger he swept the floor clean and spoke of setting to work at little things, since he was incapable of perfecting paintings of any size. In spite of himself, his first idea of a picture on a smaller scale took him back to the Cité. Why should not he paint a simple view on a moderate-sized canvas? but a kind of shame, mingled with strange jealousy, prevented him from settling himself in his old spot under the Pont des Saint-Pères. It seemed to him as if that spot were sacred now, that he ought not to offer any outrage to his great work, dead as it was. So he stationed himself at the end of the bank, above the bridge. This time, at any rate, he would work directly from nature, and he felt happy at not having to resort to any trickery, as was unavoidable with works of a large size. The small picture, very carefully painted, more highly finished than usual, met, however, with the same fate as the others before the hanging committee, who were indignant with this style of painting, executed with a tipsy brush, 
as was said at the time in the studios. The slap in the face which Claude thus received was all the more severe, as a report had spread of concessions, of advances made by him to the School of Arts, in order that his work might be received and when the picture came back to him, he, deeply wounded, weeping with rage, tore it into narrow shreds which he burned in his stove. It was not sufficient that he should kill that one with a knife thrust. It must be annihilated. Another year went by for Claude in desultory toil. He worked from force of habit, but finished nothing. He himself saying, with a dolorous laugh, that he had lost himself and was trying to find himself again. In reality, tenacious consciousness of his genius left him a hope which nothing could destroy, even during his longest crises of despondency. He suffered like someone damned, forever rolling the rock which slipped back and crushed him. But the future remained with the certainty of one day seizing that rock in his powerful arms and flinging it upward to the stars. His friends at last beheld his eyes light up with passion once more. It was known that he again secluded himself in the Rue Tourlac, he who formerly had always been carried beyond the work on which he was engaged, by some dream of a picture to come, now stood at bay before that subject of the Cité. It had become his fixed idea, the bar that closed up his life, and soon he began to speak freely of it again in a new blaze of enthusiasm, exclaiming with childish delight that he had found his way and that he felt certain of victory. One day Claude, who so far had not opened his door to his friends, condescended to admit Sandoz. The latter tumbled upon a study with a deal of dash in it, thrown off without a model, and again admirable in colour. The subject had remained the same, the Port Saint-Nicolas on the left, the swimming baths on the right, the Seine and Cité in the background. But Sandoz was amazed at perceiving, instead of the boat sculled by a waterman, another large skiff taking up the whole centre of the composition, a skiff occupied by three women. One in a bathing costume was rowing, another sat over the edge with her legs dangling in the water, her costume partially unfastened, showing her bare shoulder, while the third stood erect and nude on the prow, so bright in tone that she seemed effulgent like the sun. "'Why, what an idea!' muttered Sandoz. "'What are those women doing there?' "'Why, they are bathing,' Claude quietly answered. Don't you see that they have come out of the swimming baths? It supplies me with a motive for the nude. It's a real find, eh? Does it shock you? His old friend, who knew him well by now, dreaded lest he should give him cause for discouragement. I? Oh, no! Only I am afraid that the public will again fail to understand. That nude woman in the very midst of Paris, it's improbable. Claude looked naively surprised. Ah, you think so? Well, so much the worse. What's the odds, as long as the woman is well painted? Besides, I need something like that to get my courage up. On the following occasions, Sandoz gently reverted to the strangeness of the composition, pleading, as was his nature, the cause of outraged logic. How could a modern painter who prided himself on painting merely what was real, how could he so bastardize his work as to introduce fanciful things into it? It would have been so easy to choose another subject in which the nude would have been necessary. But Claude became obstinate, and resorted to lame and violent explanations, for he would not avow his real motive, an idea which had come to him and which he would have been at a loss to express clearly. It was, however, a longing for some secret symbolism. A recrudescence of romanticism made him see an incarnation of Paris in that nude figure. He pictured the city bare and impassioned, resplendent with the beauty of woman. Before the pressing objections of his friend, he pretended to be shaken in his resolutions. Well, I'll see. I'll dress my old woman later on, since she worries you, he said. "'But meanwhile I shall do her like that. "'You understand, she amuses me.' "'He never reverted to the subject again, "'remaining silently obstinate, 
merely shrugging his shoulders and smiling with embarrassment whenever any illusion betrayed the general astonishment which was felt at the sight of that venus emerging triumphantly from the froth of the seine amidst all the omnibuses on the quays and the lightermen working at the port of san nicolas spring had come round again and claude had once more resolved to work at his large picture when in a spirit of prudence he and christine modified their daily life she at times could not help feeling uneasy at seeing all their money so quickly spent since the supply had seemed inexhaustible they had ceased counting but at the end of four years they had woke up one morning quite frightened when on asking for accounts they found that barely three thousand francs were left out of the twenty thousand they immediately verted to severe economy stinting themselves as to bread planning the cutting down of the most elementary expenses and it was thus that in the first impulse of self-sacrifice they left the rue de douai what was the use of paying two rents there was room enough in the old drying shed in the rue tourlac still stained with the dyes of former days to afford accommodation for three people settling there was none the less a difficult affair for however big the place was it provided them after all with but one room it was like a gypsy's shed where everything had to be done in common as the landlord was unwilling the painter himself had to divide it at one end by a partition of boards behind which he devised a kitchen and a bedroom they were then delighted with the place despite the chinks through which the wind blew and although on rainy days they had to set basins beneath the broader cracks in the roof the whole looked mournfully bare their few poor sticks seemed to dance alongside the naked walls they themselves pretended to be proud at being lodged so spaciously they told their friends that jacques would at least have a little room to run about poor jacques in spite of his nine years did not seem to be growing his head alone became larger and larger they could not send him to school for more than a week at a stretch for he came back absolutely dazed ill from having tried to learn in such wise that they nearly always allowed him to live on all fours around them crawling from one corner to another christine who for quite a long while had not shared claude's daily work now once more found herself beside him throughout his long hours of toil she helped him to scrape and pumice the old canvas of the big picture and gave him advice about attaching it more securely to the wall but they found that another disaster had befallen them the steps had become warped by the water constantly trickling through the roof and for fear of an accident claude had to strengthen them with an oak cross piece she handing him the necessary nails one by one then once more and for the second time everything was ready she watched him again outlining the work standing behind him the while till she felt faint with fatigue and finally dropping to the floor where she remained squatting and still looking at him oh how she would have liked to snatch him from that painting which had seized hold of him it was for that purpose that she made herself his servant only too happy to lower herself to a labourer's toil since she shared his work again since the three of them he she and the canvas were side by side her hope revived if he had escaped her when she all alone cried her eyes out in the rue de douai if he lingered till late in the rue tourlac fascinated as by a mistress perhaps now that she was present she might regain her hold over him ah painting painting in what jealous hatred she held it hers was no longer the revolt of a girl of the bourgeoisie who painted neatly in water colours against independent brutal magnificent art no little by little she had come to understand it drawn towards it at first by her love for the painter and gained over afterwards by the feast of light by the original charm of the bright tints which claude's works displayed and now she had accepted everything even lilac tinted soil and blue trees indeed a kind of respect made her quiver before those works which had at first seemed so horrid to her she recognized their power well enough and treated them like rivals about whom one could no longer joke 
but her vindictiveness grew in proportion to her admiration. She revolted at having to stand by and witness, as it were, a diminution of herself, the blow of another love beneath her own roof. At first there was a silent struggle of every minute. She thrust herself forward, interposed whatever she could, a hand, a shoulder, between the painter and his picture. She was always there, encompassing him with her breath, reminding him that he was hers. Then her old idea revived. She also would paint. She would seek and join him in the depths of his art fever. Every day for a whole month she put on a blouse and worked like a pupil by the side of a master, diligently copying one of his sketches, and she only gave in when she found the effort turn against her object. For, deceived, as it were, by their joint work, he finished by forgetting that she was a woman and lived with her on a footing of mere comradeship as between man and man. Accordingly, she resorted to what was her only strength. To perfect some of the small figures of his latter pictures, Claude had many a time already taken the hint of a head, the pose of an arm, the attitude of a body from Christine. He threw a cloak over her shoulders and caught her in the posture he wanted, shouting to her not to stir. These were little services which she showed herself only too pleased to render him. But she had not hitherto cared to go further, for she was hurt by the idea of being a model now that she was his wife. However, since Claude had broadly outlined the large upright female figure which was to occupy the centre of his picture, Christine had looked at the vague silhouette in a dreamy way, worried by an ever-pursuing thought before which all scruples vanished. And so, when he spoke of taking a model, she offered herself, reminding him that she had posed for the small figure in the open-air subject long ago. A model, she added, would cost you seven francs a sitting. We are not so rich, we may as well save the money." The question of economy decided him at once. I'm agreeable, and it's even very good of you to show such courage, for you know that it is not a bit of pastime to sit for me. Never mind, you had better confess to it, you big silly. You are afraid of another woman coming here. You are jealous. Jealous. Yes, indeed, she was jealous, so jealous that she suffered agony. But she snapped her fingers at other women. All the models in Paris might have sat to him for what she cared. She had but one rival, that painting, that art which robbed her of him. Claude, who was delighted, at first made a study, a simple academic study, in the attitude required for his picture. They waited until Jacques had gone to school, and the sitting lasted for hours. During the earlier days, Christine suffered a great deal from being obliged to remain in the same position. Then she grew used to it, not daring to complain, lest she might vex him, and even restraining her tears when he roughly pushed her about. And he soon acquired the habit of doing so, treating her like a mere model, more exacting with her, however, than if he had paid her, never afraid of unduly taxing her strength, since she was his wife. He employed her for every purpose, at every minute, for an arm, a foot, the most trifling detail that he stood in need of and thus, in a way, he lowered her to the level of a living lay figure, which he stuck in front of him, and copied as he might have copied a pitcher or a stew-pan for a bit of still life. This time Claude proceeded leisurely, and before roughing in the large figure he tired Christine for months by making her pose in twenty different ways. At last, one day, he began the roughing in. It was an autumnal morning, the north wind was already sharp, and it was by no means warm even in the big studio, although the stove was roaring. As little Jacques was poorly again and unable to go to school, they had decided to lock him up in the room at the back, telling him to be very good, and then the mother settled herself near the stove, motionless, in the attitude required. During the first hour, the painter, perched upon his steps, kept glancing at her but did not speak a word. Unutterable sadness stole over her, and she felt afraid of fainting, no longer knowing whether she was suffering from the cold or from a despair that had come from afar, and the bitterness of which she felt to be rising within her. 
Her fatigue became so great that she staggered and hobbled about on her numbed legs. "'What, already?' cried Claude. "'Why, you haven't been at it more than a quarter of an hour. You don't want to earn your seven francs, then?' He was joking in a gruff voice, delighted with his work. And she had scarcely recovered the use of her limbs, beneath the dressing-gown she had wrapped round her, when he went on shouting, "'Come on, come on, no idling. It's a grand day today is. I must either show some genius or else kick the bucket.' Then, in a weary way, she at last resumed the pose. The misfortune was that before long, both by his glances and the language he used, she fully realized that she herself was as nothing to him. If ever he praised a limb, a tint, a contour, it was solely from the artistic point of view. Great enthusiasm and passion he often showed, but it was not passion for herself, as in the old days. She felt confused and deeply mortified. Oh, this was the end. In her he no longer loved aught but his art, the example of nature and life. And then, with her eyes gazing into space, she would remain rigid, like a statue, keeping back the tears which made her heart swell, lacking even the wretched consolation of being able to cry. And day by day the same sorry life began afresh for her. To stand there as his model had become her profession. She could not refuse, however bitter her grief. Their once happy life was all over. There now seemed to be three people in the place. It was as if Claude had introduced a mistress into it, that woman he was painting. The huge picture rose up between them, parted them as with a wall, beyond which he lived with the other. That duplication of herself well-nigh drove Christine mad with jealousy, and yet she was conscious of the pettiness of her sufferings, and did not dare to confess them, lest he should laugh at her. However, she did not deceive herself. She fully realized that he preferred her counterfeit to herself, that her image was the worshipped one, the sole thought, the affection of his every hour. He almost killed her with long sittings in that cold, draughty studio, in order to enhance the beauty of the other, upon whom depended all his joys and sorrows according as to whether he beheld her live or languish beneath his brush. Was not this love? And what suffering to have to lend herself so that the other might be created, so that she might be haunted by a nightmare of that rival, so that the latter might for ever rise between them more powerful than reality? To think of it, so much dust, the veriest trifle, a patch of colour on a canvas, a mere semblance destroying all their happiness. He, silent, indifferent, brutal at times, and she, tortured by his desertion, in despair at being unable to drive away that creature who ever encroached more and more upon their daily life. And it was then that Christine, finding herself altogether beaten in her efforts to regain Claude's love, felt all the sovereignty of art weigh down upon her. That painting, which she had already accepted without restriction, she raised still higher in her estimation, placed inside an awesome tabernacle before which she remained overcome, as before those powerful divinities of wrath which one honours from the very hatred and fear that they inspire. Hers was a holy awe, a conviction that struggling was henceforth useless, that she would be crushed like a bit of straw if she persisted in her obstinacy. Each of her husband's canvases became magnified in her eyes. The smallest assumed triumphal dimensions. Even the worst painted of them overwhelmed her with victory, and she no longer judged them, but grovelled, trembling, thinking them all formidable, and invariably replying to Claude's questions, "'Oh, yes, very good. Oh, superb. Oh, very, very extraordinary, that one.' Nevertheless, she harboured no anger against him. She still worshipped him with tearful tenderness, as she saw him thus consume himself with efforts. After a few weeks of successful work, everything got spoilt again. He could not finish his large female figure. At times he almost killed his model with fatigue, keeping hard at work for days and days together. 
then leaving the picture untouched for a whole month. The figure was begun anew, relinquished, painted all over again at least a dozen times. One year, two years went by without the picture reaching completion. Though sometimes it was almost finished, it was scratched out the next morning and painted entirely over again. Ah, what an effort of creation it was, an effort of blood and tears, filling Claude with agony in his attempt to beget flesh and instill life. Ever battling with reality and ever beaten, it was a struggle with the angel. He was wearing himself out with this impossible task of making a canvas hold all nature. He became exhausted at last with the pains which racked his muscles, without ever being able to bring his genius to fruition. What others were satisfied with, a more or less faithful rendering, the various necessary bits of trickery, filled him with remorse, made him as indignant as if in resorting to such practices one were guilty of ignoble cowardice. And thus he began his work over and over again, spoiling what was good through his craving to do better. He would always be dissatisfied with his women, so his friends jokingly declared, until they flung their arms round his neck. What was lacking in his power that he could not endow them with life? Very little, no doubt. Sometimes he went beyond the right point, sometimes he stopped short of it. One day the words, an incomplete genius, which he overheard, both flattered and frightened him. Yes, it must be that. He jumped too far, or not far enough. He suffered from a want of nervous balance. He was afflicted with some hereditary derangement which, because there were a few grains the more or less of some substance in his brain, was making him a lunatic instead of a great man. Whenever a fit of despair drove him from his studio, whenever he fled from his work, he now carried about with him that idea of fatal impotence, and he heard it beating against his skull like the obstinate tolling of a funeral bell. His life became wretched. Never had doubt of himself pursued him in that way before. He disappeared for whole days together. He even stopped out a whole night coming back the next morning stupefied, without being able to say where he had gone. It was thought that he had been tramping through the outskirts of Paris, rather than find himself face to face with his spoilt work. His sole relief was to flee the moment that work filled him with shame and hatred, and to remain away until he felt sufficient courage to face it once more. And not even his wife dared to question him on his return, Indeed, she was only too happy to see him back again, after her anxious waiting. At such times he madly scoured Paris, especially the outlying quarters, from a longing to debase himself and hobnob with labourers. He expressed at each recurring crisis his old regret at not having been some mason's hodman. Did not happiness consist in having solid limbs and in performing the work one was built for well and quickly? He had wrecked his life. He ought to have got himself engaged in the building line. In the old times, when he had lunched at the Dog of Montargis, Gomard's tavern, where he had known a limousin, a big strapping merry fellow, whose brawny arms he envied. Then, on coming back to the Rue Tourlac, with his legs faint and his head empty, he gave his picture much the same distressful frightened glance as one casts at a corpse in a mortuary until fresh hope of resuscitating it, of endowing it with life, brought a flush to his face once more. One day Christine was posing, and the figure of the woman was again well-nigh finished. For the last hour, however, Claude had been growing gloomy, losing the childish delight that he had displayed at the beginning of the sitting. So his wife scarcely dared to breathe, feeling by her own discomfort that everything must be going wrong once more, and afraid that she might accelerate the catastrophe if she moved as much as a finger. And, surely enough, he suddenly gave a cry of anguish and launched forth an oath in a thunderous voice. Oh, curse it! Curse it! He had flung his handful of brushes from the top of the steps, then, blinded with rage, with one blow of his fist, he transpierced the canvas. Christine held out her trembling hands. My dear, my dear! 
but when she had flung a dressing gown over her shoulders and approached the picture she experienced keen delight a burst of satisfied hatred claude's fist had struck the other one full in the bosom and there was a gaping hole at last then the other one was killed motionless horror-struck by the murder claude stared at the perforated bosom poignant grief came upon him at the sight of the wound whence the blood of his work seemed to flow was it possible was it he who had thus murdered what he loved best of all on earth his anger changed into stupor his fingers wandered over the canvas drawing the ragged edges of the rent together as if he had wished to close the bleeding gash he was choking he stammered distracted with boundless grief she's killed she is killed then christine in her maternal love for the big child of an artist felt moved to her very entrails she forgave him as usual she saw well enough that he now had but one thought to mend the rent to repair the evil at once and she helped him it was she who held the shreds together whilst he from behind glued a strip of canvas against them when she dressed herself the other one was there again immortal simply retaining near her heart a slight scar which seemed to make her doubly dear to the painter as this unhinging of claude's faculties increased he drifted into a sort of superstition into a devout belief in certain processes and methods he banished oil from his colours and spoke of it as of a personal enemy on the other hand he held that turpentine produced a solid unpolished surface and he had some secrets of his own which he hid from everybody solutions of amber liquefied copal and other resinous compounds that made colours dry quickly and prevented them from cracking but he experienced some terrible worries as the absorbent nature of the canvas at once sucked in the little oil contained in the paint then the question of brushes had always worried him greatly he insisted on having them with special handles and objecting to sable he used nothing but oven-dried badger hair more important however than everything else was the question of palette knives which like courbet he used for his backgrounds he had quite a collection of them some long and flexible others broad and squat and one which was triangular like a glazier's and which had been expressly made for him it was the real delacroix knife besides he never made use of the scraper or razor which he considered beneath an artist's dignity but on the other hand he indulged in all sorts of mysterious practices in applying his colours concocted recipes and changed them every month and suddenly fancied that he had hit on the right system of painting when after repudiating oil and its flow he began to lay on successive touches until he arrived at the exact tone he required one of his fads for a long while was to paint from right to left for without confessing as much he felt sure that it brought him luck but the terrible affair which unhinged him once more was an all-invading theory respecting the complementary colours gagnier had been the first to speak to him on the subject being himself equally inclined to technical speculation after which claude impelled by the exuberance of his passion took to exaggerating the scientific principles whereby from the three primitive colours yellow red and blue one derives the three secondary ones orange green and violet and further a whole series of complementary and similar hues whose composites are obtained mathematically from one another thus science entered into painting there was a method for logical observation already one only had to take the predominating hue of a picture and note the complementary or similar colours to establish experimentally what variations would occur for instance red would turn yellowish if it were near blue and a whole landscape would change in tint by the refractions and the very decomposition of light according to the clouds passing over it claude then accurately came to this conclusion that objects have no real fixed colour that they assume various hues according to ambient circumstances but the misfortune was that when he took to direct observation 
with his brain throbbing with scientific formulas, his prejudiced vision lent too much force to delicate shades, and made him render what was theoretically correct in too vivid a manner. Thus his style, once so bright, so full of palpitation of sunlight, ended in a reversal of everything to which the eye was accustomed, giving, for instance, flesh of a violet tinge under tricoloured skies. Insanity seemed to be at the end of it all. Poverty finished off Claude. It had gradually increased while the family spent money without counting, and when the last copper of the twenty thousand francs had gone, swooped down upon them, horrible and irreparable. Christine, who wanted to look for work, was incapable of doing anything, even ordinary needlework. She bewailed her lot, twirling her fingers and inveighing against the idiotic young lady's education that she had received, since it had given her no profession, and her only resource would be to enter into domestic service, should life still go against them. Claude, on his side, had become a subject of chaff with the Parisians, and no longer sold a picture. An independent exhibition, at which he and some friends had shown some pictures, had finished him off as regards amateurs. So merry had the public become at the sight of his canvases, streaked with all the colours of the rainbow. The dealers fled from him. Monsieur Hu alone now and then made a pilgrimage to the Rue Tourlac, and remained in ecstasy before the exaggerated bits, those which blazed in unexpected, pyrotechnical fashion, in despair at being unable to cover them with gold. And though the painter wanted to make him a present of them, implored him to accept them, the old fellow displayed extraordinary delicacy of feeling. He pinched himself to amass a small sum of money from time to time, and then religiously took away the seemingly delirious picture to hang it beside his masterpieces. Such windfalls came too seldom, and Claude was obliged to descend to trade art, repugnant as it was to him. Such indeed was his despair at having fallen into that poison-house, where he had sworn never to set foot, that he would have preferred starving to death but for the two poor beings who were dependent on him, and who suffered like himself. He became familiar with Vie Dolorose, painted at reduced prices, and with male and female saints at so much per gross, even with pounced shop blinds. In short, all the ignoble jobs that degrade painting and make it so much idiotic delineation, lacking even the charm of naivete. He even suffered the humiliation of having portraits at five and twenty francs apiece refused because he failed to produce a likeness. And he reached the lowest degree of distress. He worked according to size for the petty dealers who sell daubs on the bridges and export them to semi-civilized countries. They bought his pictures at two and three francs apiece, according to the regulation dimensions. This was like physical decay. It made him waste away. He rose from such tasks feeling ill, incapable of serious work looking at his large picture in distress, and leaving it sometimes untouched for a week, as if he felt his hands befouled and unworthy of working at it. They scarcely had bread to eat, and the huge shanty, which Christine had shown herself so proud of, on settling in it, became uninhabitable in the winter. She, once such an active housewife, now dragged herself about the place, without courage even to sweep the floor, and thus everything lapsed into abandonment. In the disaster little Jacques was sadly weakened by unwholesome and insufficient food, for their meals often consisted of a mere crust eaten standing. With their lives thus ill-regulated, uncared for, they were drifting to the filth of the poor who lose even all self-pride. End of chapter 9, part A Chapter 9, Part B of His Masterpiece by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. 
At the close of another year, Claude, on one of those days of defeat, when he fled from his miscarried picture, met an old acquaintance. This time he had sworn he would never go home again, and he had been tramping across Paris since noon, as if at his heels he had heard the wan spectre of the big nude figure of his picture, ravaged by constant retouching, and always left incomplete, pursuing him with a passionate craving for birth. The mist was melting into a yellowish drizzle, befouling the muddy streets. It was about five o'clock, and he was crossing the Rue Royale like one walking in his sleep, at the risk of being run over, his clothes in rags and mud bespattered up to his neck, when a brougham suddenly drew up. "'Claude, eh? Claude! Is that how you pass your friends?' It was Irma Bacot who spoke, Irma in a charming grey silk dress covered with chantilly lace. She had hastily let down the window, and she sat smiling, beaming in the framework of the carriage door. "'Where are you going?' He, staring at her open-mouthed, replied that he was going nowhere, at which she merrily expressed surprise in a loud voice, looking at him with her saucy eyes. "'Get in, then. It's such a long while since we met.' said she. Get in or you'll be knocked down. And, in fact, the other drivers were getting impatient and urging their horses on amidst a terrible din. So he did as he was bidden, feeling quite dazed. And she drove him away, dripping with the unmistakable signs of his poverty upon him, in the broom lined with blue satin, where he sat partly on the lace of her skirt, while the cab drivers jeered at the elopement before falling into line again. When Claude came back to the Rue Tourlac, he was in a dazed condition, and for a couple of days remained musing whether, after all, he might not have taken the wrong course in life. He seemed so strange that Christine questioned him, whereupon he at first stuttered and stammered, and finally confessed everything. There was a scene. She wept for a long while, then pardoned him once more, full of infinite indulgence for him and indeed amidst all her bitter grief there sprang up a hope that he might yet return to her for if he could deceive her thus he could not care as much as she had imagined for that hateful painted creature who stared down from the big canvas the days went by and towards the middle of the winter claude's courage revived once more one day, while putting some old frames in order, he came upon a roll of canvas which had fallen behind the other pictures. On opening the roll he found on it the nude figure, the reclining woman of his old painting, in the open air, which he had cut out when the picture had come back to him from the Salon of the Rejected, and as he gazed at it he uttered a cry of admiration. "'By the gods! How beautiful it is!' He at once secured it to the wall with four nails, and remained for hours in contemplation before it. His hands shook, the blood rushed to his face. Was it possible that he had painted such a masterly thing? He had possessed genius in those days then. So his skull, his eyes, his fingers had been changed. He became so feverishly excited, and felt such a need of unburthening himself to somebody, that at last he called his wife. Just come and have a look. Isn't her attitude good, eh? How delicately her muscles are articulated. Just look at that bit there, full of sunlight, and at the shoulder here. Oh, heavens, it's full of life. I can feel it throb as I touch it. Christine, standing by, kept looking and answering in monosyllables. This resurrection of herself, after so many years, had at first flattered and surprised her, but on seeing him become so excited, she gradually felt uncomfortable and irritated, without knowing why. "'Tell me,' he continued, "'don't you think her beautiful enough for one to go on one's knees to her?' "'Yes, yes, but she has become rather blackish.' Claude protested vehemently. "'Become blackish! What an idea! That woman would never grow black. She possessed immortal youth.' Veritable passion had seized hold of him. He spoke of the figure as if of a living being. He had sudden longings to look at her that made him leave everything else, as if he were hurrying to an appointment. Then one morning he was taken with a fit of work. But confound it all, as I did that, I can surely do it again, he said. 
Ah, this time, unless I'm a downright brute, we'll see about it. And Christine had to give him a sitting there and then. For eight hours a day, indeed, during a whole month he kept her before him, without compassion for her increasing exhaustion or for the fatigue he felt himself. He obstinately insisted upon producing a masterpiece. He was determined that the upright figure of his big picture should equal that reclining one which he saw on the wall, beaming with life. He constantly referred to it, compared it with the one he was painting, distracted by the fear of being unable to equal it. He cast one glance at it, another at Christine, and a third at his canvas, and burst into oaths whenever he felt dissatisfied. He ended by abusing his wife. She was no longer young. Age had spoiled her figure, and that it was which spoiled his work. She listened and staggered in her very grief. Those sittings, from which she had already suffered so much, were becoming unbearable torture now. What was this new freak of crushing her with her own girlhood, of fanning her jealousy by filling her with regret for vanished beauty? She was becoming her own rival. She could no longer look at that old picture of herself without being stung at the heart by hateful envy. Oh, how heavily had that picture, that study she had sat for long ago, weighed upon her existence. The whole of her misfortunes sprang from it. It had changed the current of her existence, and it had come to life again. It rose from the dead, endowed with greater vitality than herself, to finish killing her for there was no longer aught but one woman for Claude, she who was shown reclining on the old canvas, and who now arose and became the upright figure of his new picture. Then Christine felt herself growing older and older at each successive sitting, and she experienced the infinite despair which comes upon passionate women when love, like beauty, abandons them. Was it because of this that Claude no longer cared for her, that he sought refuge in an unnatural passion for his work? She soon lost all clear perception of things. She fell into a state of utter neglect, going about in a dressing jacket and dirty petticoats, devoid of all coquettish feeling, discouraged by the idea that it was useless for her to continue struggling, since she had become old. There were occasionally abominable scenes between her and Claude, who this time, however, obstinately stuck to his work and finished his picture, swearing that, come what might, he would send it to the salon. He lived on his steps, cleaning up his backgrounds until dark. At last, thoroughly exhausted, he declared that he would touch the canvas no more, and Sandoz, on coming to see him one day at four o'clock, did not find him at home. Christine declared that he had just gone out to take a breath of air on the height of the Montmartre. The breach between Claude and his friends had gradually widened. With time the latter's visits had become brief and far between, for they felt uncomfortable when they found themselves face to face with that disturbing style of painting, and they were more and more upset by the unhinging of a mind which had been the admiration of their youth. Now all had fled none excepting Sandoz ever came. Gagnier had even left Paris to settle down in one of the two houses he owned at Melun, where he lived frugally upon the proceeds of the other one, after suddenly marrying, to everyone's surprise, an old maid, his music mistress, who played Wagner to him of an evening. As for Mahoudot, he alleged work as an excuse for not coming, and indeed he was beginning to earn some money, thanks to a bronze manufacturer who employed him to touch up his models. Matters were different with Jory, whom no one saw, since Matilda despotically kept him sequestrated. She had conquered him, and he had fallen into a kind of domesticity comparable to that of a faithful dog, yielding up the keys of his cash-box, and only carrying enough money about him to buy a cigar at a time. It was even said that Matilda, like the devotee she had once been, had thrown him into the arms of the church in order to consolidate her conquest, and that she was constantly talking to him about death, of which he was horribly afraid. Fagerolles alone affected a lively, cordial feeling towards his old friend Claude whenever he happened to meet him. He then always promised to go and see him, but never did so. He was so busy since his great success in such a request, advertised, celebrated, on the road to every imaginable honour and form of fortune, 
and Claude regretted nobody save Dubouche, to whom he still felt attached, from a feeling of affection for the old reminiscences of boyhood, notwithstanding the disagreements which difference of disposition had provoked later on. But Dubouche, it appeared, was not very happy either. No doubt he was gorged with millions, but he led a wretched life, constantly at loggerheads with his father-in-law, who complained of having been deceived with regard to his capabilities as an architect, and obliged to pass his life amidst the medicine bottles of his ailing wife and his two children, who, having been prematurely born, had to be reared virtually in cotton wool. Of all the old friends, therefore, there only remained Sandoz, who still found his way to the Rue Toulac. He came thither for little Jacques, his godson, and for the sorrowing woman also, that Christine whose passionate features amidst all this distress moved him deeply, like a vision of one of the ardently amorous creatures whom he would have liked to embody in his books. But above all, his feeling of artistic brotherliness had increased since he had seen Claude losing ground, foundering amidst the heroic folly of art. At first he had remained utterly astonished at it, for he had believed in his friend more than in himself. Since their college days he had always placed himself second, while setting Claude very high on fame's ladder, on the same rung indeed as the masters who revolutionize a period. Then he had been grievously affected by that bankruptcy of genius. He had become full of bitter, heartfelt pity at the sight of the horrible torture of impotency. Did one ever know who was the madman in art? Every failure touched him to the quick, and the more a picture or a book verged upon aberration, sank to the grotesque and lamentable, the more did Sandoz quiver with compassion, the more did he long to lull to sleep, in the soothing extravagance of their dreams, those who were thus blasted by their own work. On the day when Sandoz called and failed to find Claude at home, he did not go away, but seeing Christine's eyelids red with crying, he said, if you think that he'll be in soon, I'll wait for him. Oh, he surely won't be long. In that case, I'll wait, unless I'm in your way. Never had her demeanour, the crushed look of a neglected woman, her listless movements, her slow speech, her indifference for everything but the passion that was consuming her, moved him so deeply. For the last week, perhaps, she had not put a chair in its place, or dusted a piece of furniture, and left the place to go to rack and ruin, scarcely having the strength to drag herself about, and it was enough to break one's heart to behold that misery, ending in filth beneath the glaring light from the big window, to gaze on that ill-pargeted shanty, so bare and disorderly, where one shivered with melancholy, although it was a bright February afternoon. Christine had slowly sat down beside an iron bedstead, which Sandoz had not noticed when he came in. Allo, he said, is Jacques ill? She was covering up the child, who constantly flung off the bedclothes. Yes, he hasn't been up these three days. We brought his bed in here so that he might be with us. He was never very strong, but he's getting worse and worse. It's distracting. She had a fixed stare in her eyes and spoke in a monotonous tone, and Sandoz felt frightened when he drew up to the bedside. The child's pale head seemed to have grown bigger still, so heavy that he could no longer support it. He lay perfectly still, and one might have thought he was dead, but for the heavy breathing coming from between his discoloured lips. My poor little Jacques, it's I, your godfather. Won't you say how do you do? The child made a fruitless, painful effort to lift his head. His eyelids parted, showing his white eyeballs, then closed again. Have you sent for a doctor? Christine shrugged her shoulders. Oh, doctors, what do they know, she answered. We sent for one. He said that there was nothing to be done. Let us hope that it will pass over again. He is close upon twelve years old now, and maybe he is growing too fast. Sandoz, quite chilled, said nothing for fear of increasing her anxiety, since she did not seem to realize the gravity of the disease. He walked about in silence and stopped in front of the picture. Ho, ho, it's getting on. It's on the right road this time. It's finished. What? Finished? And when she told him that the canvas was to be sent to the salon that next week, 
He looked embarrassed and sat down on the couch, like a man who wishes to judge the work leisurely. The background, the keys, the seine, whence arose the triumphal point of the cité, still remained in a sketchy state. Masterly, however, but as if the painter had been afraid of spoiling the Paris of his dream by giving it greater finish. There was also an excellent group on the left, the lighter men unloading the sacks of plaster, being carefully and powerfully treated. But the boat full of women in the centre transpierced the picture, as it were, with a blaze of flesh tints which were quite out of place, and the brilliancy and hallucinatory proportions of the large nude figure, which Claude had painted in a fever, seemed strangely, disconcertingly false amidst the reality of all the rest. Sandoz, silent, felt despair steal over him as he sat in front of that magnificent failure. But he saw Christine's eyes fixed upon him, and had sufficient strength of mind to say, Astounding! The woman, astounding! At that point Claude came in, and on seeing his old chum he uttered a joyous exclamation and shook his hand vigorously. Then he approached Christine and kissed little Jacques, who had once more thrown off the bedclothes. How is he? Just the same. To be sure, to be sure. He is growing too fast. A few days' rest will set him all right. I told you not to be uneasy. And Claude thereupon sat down beside Sandoz on the couch. They both took their ease, leaning back with their eyes surveying the picture, while Christine, seated by the bed, looked at nothing, and seemingly thought of nothing, in the everlasting desolation of her heart. Night was slowly coming on, the vivid light from the window paled already, losing its sheen amidst the slowly falling crepuscular dimness. So it's settled. Your wife told me that you were going to send it in. Yes. You are right. You had better have done with it once for all. Oh, there are some magnificent bits in it. The key in perspective to the left— the man who shoulders that sack below, but... He hesitated, then finally took the bull by the horns. But it's odd that you have persisted in leaving those women nude. It isn't logical, I assure you. And besides, you promised me you would dress them, don't you remember? You have set your heart upon them very much, then? Yes, Claude answered curtly, with the obstinacy of one mastered by a fixed idea and unwilling to give any explanations. Then he crossed his arms behind his head and began talking of other things, without, however, taking his eyes off his picture, over which the twilight began to cast a slight shadow. "'Do you know where I have just come from?' he asked. "'I have been to Courageau's. You know, the great landscape painter whose Pond of Gagny is at the Luxembourg. You remember, I thought he was dead, and we were told that he lived hereabouts, on the other side of the hill, in the Rue de la Brouvoie. Well, old boy, he worried me, did Courageau. While taking a breath of air now and then up there, I discovered his shanty, and I could no longer pass in front of it without wanting to go inside. Just think, a master, a man who invented our modern landscape school, and who lives there, unknown, done for, like a mole in its hole. You can have no idea of the street or the caboose, a village street full of fowls and bordered by grassy banks, and a caboose like a child's toy, with tiny windows, a tiny door, a tiny garden. Oh, the garden, a mere patch of soil, sloping down abruptly, with a bed where four pear trees stand, and the rest taken up by a fowl house, made out of green boards, old plaster, and wire network, held together with bits of string. His words came slowly. He blinked while he spoke, as if the thought of his picture had returned to him, and was gradually taking possession of him to such a degree as to hamper him in his speech about other matters. Well, as luck would have it, I found Courageaud on his doorstep today, an old man of more than eighty, wrinkled and shrunk to the size of a boy. I should like you to see him, with his clogs, his peasant's jersey, and his coloured handkerchief wound over his head, as if he were an old market woman. I pluckily went up to him, saying, Monsieur Courageaud, I know you very well. You have a picture in the Luxembourg Gallery, which is a masterpiece. Allow a painter to shake hands with you, as he would with his master. And then you should have seen him take fright, draw back and stutter, 
as if I were going to strike him, a regular flight. However, I followed him, and gradually he recovered his composure, and showed me his hens, his ducks, his rabbits and dogs, an extraordinary collection of birds and beasts. There was even a raven among them. He lives in the midst of them all. He speaks to no one but his animals. As for the view, it's simply magnificent. You see the whole of the Saint-Denis plain for miles upon miles. Rivers and towns, smoking factory chimneys, and puffing railway engines. In short, the place is a real hermitage on a hill, with its back turned to Paris, and its eyes fixed on the boundless country. As a matter of course, I came back to his picture. Oh, Monsieur Courageot, I said, what talent you showed! If you only knew how much we all admire you! You are one of our illustrious men. You'll remain the ancestor of us all. But his lips began to tremble again. He looked at me with an air of terror-stricken stupidity. I am sure he would not have waved me back with a more imploring gesture if I had unearthed under his very eyes the corpse of some forgotten comrade of his youth. He kept chewing disconnected words between his toothless gums. It was the mumbling of an old man who had sunk into second childhood, and whom it's impossible to understand. Don't know. So long ago. Too old. Don't care a rap. To make a long story short, he showed me the door. I heard him hurriedly turn the key in the lock, barricading himself and his birds and animals against the admiration of the outside world. Ah, my good fellow, the idea of it. That great man ending his life like a retired grocer. That voluntary relapse into nothingness, even before death. Ah, the glory, the glory for which we others are ready to die. Claude's voice, which had sunk lower and lower, died away at last in a melancholy sigh. Darkness was still coming on. After gradually collecting in the corners, it rose like a slow, inexorable tide, first submerging the legs of the chairs and the table, all the confusion of things that littered the tiled floor. The lower part of the picture was already growing dim, and Claude, with his eyes still desperately fixed on it, seemed to be watching the ascent of the darkness, as if he had at last judged his work in the expiring light and no sound was heard save the stertorous breathing of the sick child, near whom there still loomed the dark silhouette of the motionless mother. Then Sandoz spoke in his turn, his hands also crossed behind his head, and his back resting against one of the cushions of the couch. Does one ever know? Would it not be better, perhaps, to live and die unknown? What a cell it would be if artistic glory existed, no more than the paradise which is talked about in catechisms, and which even children nowadays make fun of. We who no longer believe in the divinity still believe in our own immortality. What a farce it all is! Then, affected to melancholy himself by the mournfulness of the twilight, and stirred by all the human suffering he beheld around him, he began to speak of his own torments. Look here, old man, I, whom you envy, perhaps, yes, I, who am beginning to get on in the world, as middle-class people say, I, who publish books and earn a little money, well, I am being killed by it all. I have often already told you this, but you don't believe me, because, as you only turn out work with a great deal of trouble, and cannot bring yourself to public notice, happiness in your eyes could naturally consist in producing a great deal, in being seen, and praised or slated. Well, get admitted to the next salon, get into the thick of the battle, paint other pictures, and then tell me whether that suffices, and whether you are happy at last. Listen, work has taken up the whole of my existence. Little by little it has robbed me of my mother, of my wife, of everything I love. It is like a germ thrown into the cranium, which feeds on the brain, finds its way into the trunk and limbs, and gnaws up the whole of the body. The moment I jump out of bed of a morning, work clutches hold of me, rivets me to my desk without leaving me time to get a breath of fresh air. Then it pursues me at luncheon. I audibly chew my sentences with my bread. Next it accompanies me when I go out, comes back with me and dines off the same plate as myself, 
lies down with me on my pillow, so utterly pitiless that I am never able to set the book in hand on one side. Indeed, its growth continues even in the depth of my sleep, and nothing outside of it exists for me. True, I go upstairs to embrace my mother, but in so absent-minded a way that ten minutes after leaving her I ask myself whether I have really been to wish her good morning. My poor wife has no husband. I am not with her even when our hands touch. Sometimes I have an acute feeling that I am making their lives very sad, and I feel very remorseful, for happiness is solely composed of kindness, frankness, and gaiety in one's home. But how can I escape from the claws of the monster? I at once relapse into the somnambulism of my working hours, into the indifference and moroseness of my fixed idea. If the pages I have written during the morning have been worked off all right, so much the better. If one of them has remained in distress, so much the worse. The household will laugh or cry according to the whim of that all-devouring monster, work. No, no, I have nothing that I can call my own. In my days of poverty I dreamt of rest in the country, of travel in distant lands, and now that I might make those dreams reality, the work that has begun keeps me shut up. There is no chance of a walk in the morning sun, no chance of running round to a friend's house, or of a mad bout of idleness. My strength of will has gone with the rest. All this has become a habit. I have locked the door of the world behind me and thrown the key out the window. There is no longer anything in my den but work and myself and work will devour me, and then there will be nothing left, nothing at all. He paused, and silence reigned once more in the deepening gloom. Then he began again with an effort. And if one were only satisfied, if one only got some enjoyment out of such a nigger's life, oh, I should like to know how those fellows manage who smoke cigarettes and complacently stroke their beards while they are at work. Yes, it appears to me that there are some who find production an easy pleasure, to be set aside or taken up without the least excitement. They are delighted. They admire themselves. They cannot write a couple of lines, but they find those lines of a rare, distinguished, matchless quality. Well, as for myself, I bring forth in anguish, and my offspring seems a horror to me. How can a man be sufficiently wanting in self-doubt as to believe in himself? It absolutely amazes me to see men who furiously deny talent to everybody else lose all critical acumen, all common sense, when it becomes a question of their own bastard creations. Why, a book is always very ugly. To like it one mustn't have had a hand in the cooking of it. I say nothing of the jugs full of insults that are showered upon one. Instead of annoying, they rather encourage me. I see men who are upset by attacks, who feel a humiliating craving to win sympathy. It is a simple question of temperament. Some women would die if they failed to please. But to my thinking, insult is a very good medicine to take. Unpopularity is a very manly school to be brought up in. Nothing keeps one in such good health and strength as the hooting of a crowd of imbeciles. It suffices that a man can say that he has given his life's blood to his work, that he expects neither immediate justice nor serious attention, that he works without hope of any kind, and simply because the love of work beats beneath his skin like his heart, irrespective of any will of his own. If he can do all this, he may die in the effort with the consoling illusion that he will be appreciated one day or other. Ah, if the others only knew how jauntily I bear the weight of their anger. Only there is my own collar, which overwhelms me. I fret that I cannot live for a moment happy. What hours of misery I spend, great heavens, from the very day I begin a novel. During the first chapters there isn't so much trouble, I have plenty of room before me in which to display genius, but afterwards I become distracted, and am never satisfied with the daily task, 
I condemn the book before it is finished, judging it inferior to its elders, and I torture myself about certain pages, about certain sentences, certain words, so that at last the very commas assume an ugly look from which I suffer. And when it is finished, ah, when it is finished, what a relief! Not the enjoyment of the gentleman who exalts himself in the worship of his offspring, but the curse of the labourer who throws down the burden that has been breaking his back. Then, later on, with another book, it all begins afresh. It will always begin afresh, and I shall die under it, furious with myself, exasperated at not having had more talent, enraged at not leaving a work more complete, of greater dimensions, books upon books, a pile of mountain height, and at my death I shall feel horrible doubts about the task I may have accomplished, asking myself whether I ought not to have gone to the left when I went to the right. And my last word, my last gasp, will be to recommence the whole over again. He was thoroughly moved. The words stuck in his throat. He was obliged to draw breath for a moment before delivering himself of this passionate cry in which all his impenitent lyricism took wing. Ah, life! A second span of life! Who shall give it to me that work may rob me of it again, that I may die of it once more? It had now become quite dark. The mother's rigid silhouette was no longer visible. The hoarse breathing of the child sounded amidst the obscurity like a terrible and distant signal of distress, uprising from the streets. In the whole studio, which had become lugubriously black, the big canvas only showed a glimpse of pallidity, a last vestige of the waning daylight. The nude figure, similar to an agonizing vision, seemed to be floating about, without definite shape, the legs having already vanished, one arm being already submerged, and the only part at all distinct being the trunk, which shone like a silvery moon. After a protracted pause, Sandoz inquired, "'Shall I go with you when you take your picture?' Getting no answer from Claude, he fancied he could hear him crying. Was it with the same infinite sadness, the despair in which he himself had been stirred just now? He waited for a moment, then repeated his question, and at last the painter, after choking down a sob, stammered, "'Thanks. The picture will remain here. I shan't send it.' "'What? Why, you had made up your mind?' "'Yes, yes, I had made up my mind, but I had not seen it as I saw it just now in the waning daylight. I have failed with it, failed with it again. It struck my eyes like a blow.' It went to my very heart. His tears now flowed slow and scalding in the gloom that hid him from sight. He had been restraining himself, and now the silent anguish which had consumed him burst forth despite all his efforts. My dear friend, said Sandoz, quite upset, it is hard to tell you so, but all the same you are right, perhaps, in delaying matters, to finish certain parts rather more. Still, I am angry with myself, for I shall imagine that it was I who discouraged you by my everlasting stupid discontent with things. Claude simply answered, You, what an idea! I was not even listening to you. No, I was looking, and I saw everything go helter-skelter in that confounded canvas. The light was dying away, and all at once, in the greyish dusk, the scales suddenly dropped from my eyes. The background alone is pretty. The nude woman is altogether too loud. What's more, she's out of the perpendicular, and her legs are badly drawn. When I noticed that, oh, it was enough to kill me there and then. I felt life departing from me. Then the gloom kept rising and rising, bringing a whirling sensation, a foundering of everything, the earth rolling into chaos, the end of the world. And soon I only saw the trunk waning like a sickly moon. And look, look, there now remains nothing of her, not a glimpse. She is dead, quite black. In fact, the picture had at last entirely disappeared. 
but the painter had risen and could be heard swearing in the dense obscurity. "'Do you at all? It doesn't matter. I'll set to work at it again.' Then Christine, who had also risen from her chair, against which he stumbled, interrupted him, saying, "'Take care. I'll light the lamp.' She lighted it and came back, looking very pale, casting a glance of hatred and fear at the picture. It was not to go, then. The abomination was to begin once more. "'I'll set to work at it again,' repeated Claude. "'And it shall kill me. It shall kill my wife, my child, the whole lot. But, by heaven, it shall be a masterpiece!' Christine sat down again. They approached Jacques, who had thrown the clothes off once more with his feverish little hands. He was still breathing heavily, lying quite inert, his head buried in the pillow like a weight, with which the bed seemed to creak. When Sandoz was on the point of going, he expressed his uneasiness. The mother appeared stupefied, while the father was already returning to his picture, the masterpiece which awaited creation and the thought of which filled him with such passionate illusions that he gave less heed to the painful reality of the sufferings of his child, the true, living flesh of his flesh. On the following morning, Claude had just finished dressing, when he heard Christine calling in a frightened voice. She also had just woke with a start from the heavy sleep which had benumbed her, while she sat watching the sick child. "'Claude! Claude! Oh, look!' He is dead. The painter rushed forward with heavy eyes, stumbling and apparently failing to understand, for he repeated it with an air of profound amazement. What do you mean by saying he is dead? For a moment they remained staring wildly at the bed. The poor little fellow with his disproportionate head, the head of the progeny of genius, exaggerated as to verge upon cretinism, did not appear to have stirred since the previous night, but no breath came from his mouth, which had widened and become discoloured, and his glassy eyes were open. His father laid his hands upon him and found him icy cold. It is true, he is dead. And their stupor was such that for yet another moment they remained with their eyes dry, simply thunderstruck, as it were, by the abruptness of that death which they considered incredible. Then, her knees bending under her, Christine dropped down in front of the bed, bursting into violent sobs which shook her from head to foot, and wringing her hands whilst her forehead remained pressed against the mattress. In that first moment of horror, her despair was aggravated above all by poignant remorse, the remorse of not having sufficiently cared for the poor child. Former days started up before her in a rapid vision, each bringing with it regretfulness for unkind words, deferred caresses, rough treatment even. And now it was all over. She would never be able to compensate the lad for the affection she had withheld from him. He whom she thought so disobedient had obeyed but too well at last. She had so often told him when at play to be still, and not to disturb his father at his work, that he was quiet at last, and forever. The idea suffocated her. Each sob drew from her a dull moan. Claude had begun walking up and down the studio, unable to remain still. With his features convulsed, he shed a few big tears which he brushed away with the back of his hand. And whenever he passed in front of the little corpse, he could not help glancing at it. The glassy eyes, wide open, seemed to exercise a spell over him. At first he resisted, but a confused idea assumed shape within him, and could not be shaken off. He yielded to it at last, took a small canvas, and began to paint a study of the dead child. For the first few minutes his tears dimmed his sight, wrapping everything in a mist. But he kept wiping them away, and persevered with his work, even though his brush shook. Then the passion for art dried his tears and steadied his hand, and in a little while it was no longer his icy son that lay there, but merely a model, a subject, the strange interest of which stirred him. That huge head, that waxy flesh, those eyes which looked like holes staring into space, 
all excited and thrilled him. He stepped back, seemed to take pleasure in his work, and vaguely smiled at it. When Christine rose from her knees, she found him thus occupied. Then, bursting into tears again, she merely said, "'Ah, you can paint him now. He'll never stir again.' For five hours Claude kept at it, and on the second day, when Sandoz came back with him from the cemetery after the funeral, he shuddered with pity and admiration at the sight of the small canvas. It was one of the fine bits of former days, a masterpiece of limpidity and power, to which was added a note of boundless melancholy, the end of everything, all life ebbing away with the death of that child. But Sandoz, who had burst into exclamations full of praise, was quite taken aback on hearing Claude say to him, "'You are sure you like it? In that case, as the other machine isn't ready, I'll send this to the salon.'" End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten, Part A of His Masterpiece by Emil Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. One morning, as Claude, who had taken the dead child to the Palais de l'Industrie the previous day, was roaming round about the Parc Monceau, he suddenly came upon Fagerolles. What? said the latter cordially. Is it you, old fellow? What's becoming of you? What are you doing? We see so little of each other now. Then, Claude, having mentioned what he had sent to the salon, that little canvas which his mind was full of, Fagerolles added, Ah, you've sent something. Then I'll get it hung for you. You know that I'm a candidate for the hanging committee this year. Indeed, amid the tumult and everlasting discontent of the artists, after attempts at reform, repeated a score of times and then abandoned, the authorities had just invested the exhibitors with the privilege of electing the members of the hanging committee, and this had quite upset the world of painters and sculptors. A perfect electoral fever had set in, with all sorts of ambitious cabals and intrigues, all the low jobbery, indeed, by which politics are dishonoured. "'I'm going to take you with me,' continued Fagerolles. "'You must come and see how I'm settled in my new house, in which you haven't yet set foot, in spite of all your promises. It's here, hard by, at the corner of the Avenue de Villiers.' Claude, whose arm he had gaily taken, was obliged to follow him. He was seized with a fit of cowardice. The idea that his old chum might get his picture hung for him filled him with mingled shame and desire. On reaching the avenue, he stopped in front of the house to look at its frontage, a bit of coquettish, precioso architectural tracery, the exact copy of a Renaissance house at Bourges, with lattice windows, a staircase tower, and a roof decked with leaden ornaments. It looked like the abode of a harlot, and Claude was struck with surprise when, on turning round, he recognized Irma Bacot's regal mansion just over the way. Huge, substantial, almost severe of aspect, it had all the importance of a palace compared to its neighbour, the dwelling of the artist, who was obliged to limit himself to a fanciful knick-knack. "'Ah, that Irma, eh?' said Fagerolles, with just a shade of respect in his tone. "'She has got a cathedral, and no mistake.' but come in. The interior of Fagerolles' house was strangely and magnificently luxurious. Old tapestry, old weapons, a heap of old furniture, Chinese and Japanese curios were displayed even in the very hall. On the left there was a dining room, panelled with lacquer work and having its ceiling draped with a design of a red dragon. Then there was a staircase of carved wood above which banners drooped, whilst tropical plants rose up like plumes. Overhead the studio was a marvel, though rather small and without a picture visible. The walls, indeed, were entirely covered with oriental hangings, while at one end rose up a huge chimney-piece with chimerical monsters supporting the tablet, 
and at the other extremity appeared a vast couch under a tent, the latter quite a monument, with lances upholding the sumptuous drapery above a collection of carpets, furs, and cushions, heaped together almost on a level with the flooring. Claude looked at it all, and there came to his lips a question which he held back. Was all this paid for? Fagerol, who had been decorated with the Legion of Honour the previous year, now asked, it was said, ten thousand francs for painting a mere portrait. Naudet, who, after launching him, duly turned his success to profit in a methodical fashion, never let one of his pictures go for less than twenty, thirty, forty thousand francs. Orders would have fallen on the painter's shoulders as thick as hail, if he had not affected the disdain, the weariness of the man whose slightest sketches are fought for. And yet all this display of luxury smacked of indebtedness. There was only so much paid on account to the upholsterers. All the money, the money won by lucky strokes as on change, slipped through the artist's fingers and was spent without trace of it remaining. Moreover, Fagerol, still in the full flush of his sudden good fortune, did not calculate or worry, being confident that he would always sell his works at higher and higher prices, and feeling glorious at the high position he was acquiring in contemporary art. Eventually, Claude espied a little canvas on an ebony easel, draped with red plush, Excepting a rosewood tube case and box of crayons, forgotten on an article of furniture, nothing reminding one of the artistic profession could be seen lying about. Very finely treated, said Claude, wishing to be amiable, as he stood in front of the little canvas. And is your picture for the salon sent? Ah, oh, yes, thank heavens. What a number of people I had here. A perfect procession which kept me on my legs from morning till evening during a week. I didn't want to exhibit it, as it lowers one to do so, and no day also opposed it. But what would you have done? It was so begged and prayed. All the young fellows want to set me on the committee so that I may defend them. Oh, my picture is simple enough. I call it a picnic. There are a couple of gentlemen and three ladies under some trees, guests at some chateau, who have brought a collation with them and are eating it in a glade. You'll see... It's rather original. He spoke in a hesitating manner, and when his eyes met those of Claude, who was looking at him fixedly, he lost countenance altogether, and joked about the little canvas on the easel. That's a daub Naudet asked me for. Oh, I'm not ignorant of what I lack. A little of what you have too much of, old man. You know that I'm still your friend. Why, I defended you only yesterday with some painters. He tapped Claude on the shoulders, for he had divined his old master's secret contempt, and wished to win him back by his old-time caresses, all the wheedling practices of a hussy. Very sincerely, and with a sort of anxious deference, he again promised Claude that he would do everything in his power to further the hanging of his picture, The Dead Child. However, some people arrived. More than fifteen persons came in and went off in less than an hour fathers bringing young pupils, exhibitors anxious to say a good word on their own behalf, friends who wanted to barter influence, even women who placed their talents under the protection of their charms. And one should have seen the painter play his part as a candidate, shaking hands most lavishly, saying to one visitor, Your picture this year is so pretty, it pleases me so much, then feigning astonishment with another, what, you haven't had a medal yet? And repeating to all of them, Ah, if I belonged to the committee, I'd make them walk straight. He sent every one away delighted, closed the door behind each visitor with an air of extreme amiability, through which, however, there pierced the secret sneer of an ex-lounger on the pavement. You see, eh, he said to Claude at a moment when they happened to be left alone, what a lot of time I lose with those idiots. Then he approached the large window and abruptly opened one of the casements, and on one of the balconies of the house over the way, a woman clad in a lace dressing gown could be distinguished waving her handkerchief. Fagerol on his side waved his hand three times in succession. Then both windows were closed again. Claude had recognized Irma, and amid the silence which fell, 
Fagerolles immediately explained matters. It's convenient, you see, one can correspond. We have a complete system of telegraphy. She wants to speak to me, so I must go. Since he and Irma had resided in the avenue, they met, it was said, on their old footing. It was even asserted that he, so cute, so well acquainted with Parisian humbug, let himself be fleeced by her, bled at every moment of some good round sum which she sent her maid to ask for, now to pay a tradesman, now to satisfy a whim, often for nothing at all, or rather for the sole pleasure of emptying his pockets. And this partly explained his embarrassed circumstances, his indebtedness, which ever increased despite the continuous rise in the quotations of his canvases. Claude had put on his hat again. Fagerolles was shuffling about impatiently, looking nervously at the house over the way. "'I don't send you off, but you see she's waiting for me,' he said. "'Well, it's understood your affair's settled, that is, unless I'm not elected. Come to the Palais de l'Industrie on the evening the voting papers are counted. Oh, there will be a regular crush, quite a rumpus. Still, you will always learn if you can rely on me.' At first Claude inwardly swore that he would not trouble about it. Fagerolles' protection weighed heavily upon him, and yet, in his heart of hearts, he really had but one fear, that the shifty fellow would not keep his promise, but would ultimately be taken with a fit of cowardice at the idea of protecting a defeated man. However, on the day of the vote, Claude could not keep still, but went and roamed about the Champs-Élysées, under the pretense of taking a long walk. He might as well go there as elsewhere, for while waiting for the salon he had altogether ceased work. He himself could not vote, as to do so it was necessary to have been hung on at least one occasion. However, he repeatedly passed before the Palais de l'Industrie. Footnote. This palace, for many years the home of the salon, was built for the first Paris International Exhibition, that of 1855, and demolished in connection with that of 1900. Editor. End of footnote. The foot pavement in front of, which interested him with its bustling aspect, its procession of artist electors, whom men in dirty blouses caught hold of, shouting to them the titles of their lists of candidates, lists some thirty in number emanating from every possible coterie, and representing every possible opinion. There was the list of the studios of the School of Arts, the liberal list, the list of the uncompromising radical painters, the conciliatory list, the young painters list, even the ladies list, and so forth. The scene suggested all the turmoil at the door of an electoral polling booth on the morrow of a riot. At four o'clock in the afternoon, when the voting was over, Claude could not resist a fit of curiosity to go and have a look. The staircase was now free, and whoever chose could enter. Upstairs he came upon the huge gallery overlooking the Champs-Élysées, which was set aside for the hanging committee. A table forty feet long filled the centre of this gallery, and entire trees were burning in the monumental fireplace at one end of it. Some four or five hundred electors, who had remained to see the votes counted, stood there mingled with friends and inquisitive strangers, talking, laughing, and setting quite a storm loose under the lofty ceiling. Around the table, parties of people who had volunteered to count the votes were already settled and at work. There were some fifteen of these parties in all, each comprising a chairman and two scrutineers. Three or four more remained to be organized, and nobody else offered assistance. In fact, everyone turned away in fear of the crushing labor which would rivet the more zealous people to the spot far into the night. It precisely happened that Fagerolles, who had been in the thick of it since the morning, was gesticulating and shouting, trying to make himself heard above the hubbub. "'Come, gentlemen, we need one more man here. Come, some willing person over here.' and at that moment, perceiving Claude, he darted forward and forcibly dragged him off. "'Ah, oh, as for you, you will just oblige me by sitting down there and helping us. It's for the good cause, dash it all.' 
Claude abruptly found himself chairman of one of the counting committees, and began to perform his functions with all the gravity of a timid man, secretly experiencing a good deal of emotion, as if the hanging of his canvas would depend upon the conscientiousness he showed in his work. He called out the names inscribed upon the voting papers, which were passed to him in little packets, while the scrutineers, on sheets of paper prepared for the purpose, noted each successive vote that each candidate obtained. And all this went on amidst a most frightful uproar, twenty and thirty names being called out at the same time by different voices, above the continuous rumbling of the crowd. As Claude could never do anything without throwing passion into it, he waxed excited, became despondent whenever a voting paper did not bear Fagerolles's name, and grew happy as soon as he had to shout out that name once more. Moreover, he often tasted that delight, for his friend had made himself popular, showing himself everywhere, frequenting the cafés where influential groups of artists assembled, even venturing to expound his opinion there, and binding himself to young artists, without neglecting to bow very low to the members of the Institute. Thus there was a general current of sympathy in his favour. Fagerolles was, so to say, everybody's spoilt child. Night came on at about six o'clock that rainy March day. The assistants brought lamps, and some mistrustful artists, who, gloomy and silent, were watching the counting askins, drew nearer. Others began to play jokes, imitating the cries of animals, or attempted a Tyrolienne. But it was only at eight o'clock, when a collation of cold meat and wine was served, that the gaiety reached its climax. The bottles were hastily emptied, the men stuffed themselves with whatever they were lucky enough to get hold of, and there was a free and easy kind of kermesse in that huge hall which the logs in the fireplace lit up with a forge-like glow. Then they all smoked, and the smoke set a kind of mist around the yellow light from the lamps, whilst on the floor trailed all the spoilt voting papers thrown away during the polling. Indeed, quite a layer of dirty paper, together with corks, bread crumbs, and a few broken plates. The heels of those seated at the table disappeared amidst this litter. Reserve was cast aside. A little sculptor with a pale face climbed upon a chair to harangue the assembly, and a painter with stiff moustaches under a hook nose bestrode a chair and galloped, bowing round the table in mimicry of the emperor. Little by little, however, a good many grew tired and went off. At eleven o'clock there were not more than a couple of hundred persons present. Past midnight, however, some more people arrived, loungers in dress coats and white ties who had come from some theatre or soiree, and wished to learn the result of the voting before all Paris knew it. Reporters also appeared, and they could be seen darting one by one out of the room as soon as a partial result was communicated to them. Claude, hoarse by now, still went on calling names. The smoke and the heat became intolerable. A smell like that of a cow-house rose from the muddy litter on the floor. One o'clock, two o'clock in the morning struck, and he was still unfolding voting papers. The conscientiousness which he displayed, delaying him to such a point that the other parties had long since finished their work, while his was still a maze of figures. At last all the additions were centralized, and the definite result proclaimed. Fagerolles was elected, coming fifteenth among forty, or five places ahead of Bongrand, who had been a candidate on the same list, but whose name must have been frequently struck out. And daylight was breaking when Claude reached home in the Rue Tourlac, feeling both worn out and delighted. Then for a couple of weeks he lived in a state of anxiety. A dozen times he had the idea of going to Fagerolles for information, but a feeling of shame restrained him. Besides, as the committee proceeded in alphabetical order, nothing perhaps was yet decided. However, one evening, on the Boulevard de Clichy, he felt his heart thump as he saw two broad shoulders, with whose lolloping motion he was well acquainted coming towards him. They were the shoulders of Bongrand, who seemed embarrassed. He was the first to speak, and said, "'You know, matters aren't progressing very well over yonder, with those brutes. But everything isn't lost. Fagerolles and I are on the watch. Still, you must rely on Fagerolles. As for me, my dear fellow, I am awfully afraid of compromising your chances.' 
To tell the truth, there was constant hostility between Bongrand and the president of the hanging committee, Mazel, a famous master of the school of arts, and the last rampart of the elegant, buttery, conventional style of art. Although they called each other dear colleague and made a great show of shaking hands, their hostility had burst forth the very first day. One of them could never ask for the admission of a picture without the other one voting for its rejection. Fagerol, who had been elected secretary, had, on the contrary, made himself Mazel's amuser, his vice, and Mazel forgave his old pupil's defection, so skilfully did the renegade flatter him. Moreover, the young master, a regular turncoat, as his comrades said, showed even more severity than the members of the institute towards audacious beginners. He only became lenient and sociable when he wanted to get a picture accepted, on those occasions showing himself extremely fertile in devices, intriguing and carrying the vote with all the supple deftness of a conjurer. The committee work was really a hard task, and even Bangran's strong legs grew tired of it. It was cut out every day by the assistants. An endless row of large pictures rested on the ground against the handrails, all along the first-floor galleries, right round the palace and every afternoon at one o'clock precisely the forty committee men headed by their president who was equipped with a bell started off on a promenade until all the letters in the alphabet serving as exhibitors initials had been exhausted they gave their decisions standing and the work was got through as fast as possible the worst canvases being rejected without going to the vote at times however discussions delayed the party there came a ten minutes quarrel, and some picture which caused a dispute was reserved for the evening revision. Two men, holding a cord some thirty feet long, kept it stretched at a distance of four paces from the line of pictures, so as to restrain the committee men, who kept on pushing each other in the heat of their dispute, and whose stomachs, despite everything, were ever pressing against the cord. Behind the committee marched seventy museum keepers in white blouses, executing evolutions under the orders of a brigadier. At each decision communicated to them by the secretaries, they sorted the pictures, the accepted paintings being separated from the rejected ones, which were carried off like corpses after a battle. And the round lasted during two long hours without a moment's respite and without there being a single chair to sit upon. The committee men had to remain on their legs, tramping on in a tired way amid icy draughts which compelled even the least chilly among them to bury their noses in the depths of their fur-lined overcoats. Then the three o'clock snack proved very welcome. There was half an hour's rest at a buffet where claret, chocolate, and sandwiches could be obtained. It was there that the market of mutual concessions was held, that the bartering of influence and votes was carried on in order that nobody might be forgotten amid the hailstorm of applications which fell upon the committee men most of them carried little notebooks which they consulted and they promised to vote for certain exhibitors whom a colleague protected on condition that this colleague voted for the ones in whom they were interested others however taking no part in these intrigues either from austerity or indifference finished the interval in smoking a cigarette and gazing vacantly about them then the work began again, but more agreeably, in a gallery where there were chairs, and even tables with pens and paper and ink. All the pictures whose height did not reach four feet ten inches were judged there, passed on the easel, as the expression goes, being ranged ten or twelve together on a kind of trestle covered with green baize. A good many committeemen then grew absent-minded, several wrote their letters, and the president had to get angry to obtain presentable majorities. Sometimes a gust of passion swept by. They all jostled each other. The votes, usually given by raising the hand, took place amid such feverish excitement that hats and walking sticks were waved in the air above the tumultuous surging of heads. And it was there, on the easel, that the dead child at last made its appearance. During the previous week, Fagerol, whose pocket-book was full of memoranda, had resorted to all kinds of complicated bartering, in order to obtain votes in Claude's favour. 
but it was a difficult business. It did not tally with his other engagements, and he only met with refusals as soon as he mentioned his friend's name. He complained, moreover, that he could get no help from Bongrand, who did not carry a pocket-book, and who was so clumsy, too, that he spoilt the best causes by his outbursts of unseasonable frankness. A score of times already would Fagerolles have forsaken Claude, had it not been for his obstinate desire to try his power over his colleagues by asking for the admittance of a work by Lantier, who was a reputed impossibility. However, people should see if he wasn't yet strong enough to force the committee into compliance with his wishes. Moreover, perhaps from the depths of his conscience, there came a cry for justice, an unconfessed feeling of respect for the man whose ideas he had stolen. As it happened, Mazelle was in a frightfully bad humour that day. At the outset of the sitting, the brigadier had come to him, saying, "'There was a mistake yesterday, Monsieur Mazel." an or concour footnote a painting by one of those artists who from the fact that they had obtained medals at previous salons had the right to go on exhibiting as long as they lived the committee being debarred from rejecting their work however bad it might be editor and a footnote an or concour picture was rejected you know number two five two zero a nude woman under a tree in fact, on the day before, this painting had been consigned to the grave amid unanimous contempt, nobody having noticed that it was the work of an old classical painter, highly respected by the Institute. And the brigadier's fright and the amusing circumstance of a picture having thus been condemned by mistake enlivened the younger members of the committee and made them sneer in a provoking manner. Mazel, who detested such mishaps, which he rightly felt were disastrous for the authority of the School of Arts, made an angry gesture and dryly said, "'Well, fish it out again and put it among the admitted pictures. It isn't so surprising there was an intolerable noise yesterday. How can one judge anything like that at a gallop, when one can't even obtain silence?' He rang his bell furiously and added, "'Come, gentlemen, everything is ready. A little good will, if you please.' Unluckily, a fresh misfortune occurred as soon as the first paintings were set on the trestle. One canvas, among others, attracted Mazel's attention. So bad did he consider it, so sharp in tone as to make one's very teeth grate. As his sight was failing him, he leant forward to look at the signature, muttering the while, "'Who's the pig?' but he quickly drew himself up, quite shocked at having read the name of one of his friends, an artist who, like himself, was a rampart of healthy principles. Hoping that he had not been overheard, he thereupon called out, "'Superb! Number one, eh, gentlemen?' Number one was granted, the formula of admission which entitled the picture to be hung on the line. Only some of the committee men laughed and nudged each other, at which Mazelle felt very hurt and became very fierce. Moreover, they all made such blunders at times. A great many of them eased their feelings at the first glance and then recalled their words as soon as they had deciphered the signature. This ended by making them cautious, and so, with furtive glances, they made sure of the artist's name before expressing any opinion." Besides, whenever a colleague's work, some fellow committeeman's suspicious-looking canvas, was brought forward, they took the precaution to warn each other by making signs behind the painter's back, as if to say, "'Take care. No mistake, mind. It's his picture.'" Fagerolles, despite his colleague's fidgety nerves, carried the day on a first occasion. It was a question of admitting a frightful portrait painted by one of his pupils, whose family, a very wealthy one, received him on a footing of intimacy. To achieve this he had taken Mazel on one side in order to try to move him with a sentimental story about an unfortunate father with three daughters who were starving. But the President let himself be entreated for a long while, saying that a man shouldn't waste his time painting when he was dying for lack of food, and that he ought to have a little more consideration for his three daughters. However, in the result, Mazel raised his hand, alone with Fagerolles. 
some of the others then angrily protested and even two members of the institute seemed disgusted whereupon fagerolles whispered to them in a low key it's for mazelle he begged me to vote the painter's a relative of his i think at all events he greatly wants the picture to be accepted at this the two academicians promptly raised their hands and a large majority declared itself in favour of the portrait but all at once laughter witticisms and indignant cries rang out the dead child had just been placed on the trestle were they to have the morgue sent to them now said some and while the old men drew back in alarm the younger ones scoffed at the child's big head which was plainly that of a monkey who had died from trying to swallow a gourd fagerolles at once understood that the game was lost at first he tried to spirit the vote away by a joke in accordance with his skilful tactics come gentlemen an old combatant but furious exclamations cut him short oh no not that one they knew him that old combatant a madman who had been persevering in his obstinacy for fifteen years past a proud stuck-up fellow who posed for being a genius and who had talked about demolishing the salon without even sending a picture that it was possible to accept all their hatred of independent originality of the competition of the shop over the way which frightened them of that invincible power which triumphs even when it is seemingly defeated resounded in their voices no no away with it then fagerolles himself made the mistake of getting irritated yielding to the anger he felt at finding what little real influence he possessed you are unjust at least be impartial he said thereupon the tumult reached a climax he was surrounded and jostled arms waved about him in threatening fashion and angry words were shot out at him like bullets you dishonour the committee monsieur if you defend that thing it's simply to get your name in the newspapers you aren't competent to speak on the subject then fagerolles beside himself losing even the pliancy of his bantering disposition retorted i'm as competent as you are shut up resumed a comrade a very irascible little painter with a fair complexion you surely don't want to make us swallow such a turnip as that yes yes a turnip they all repeated the word in tones of conviction that word which they usually cast at the very worst smudges at the pale cold glary painting of daubers all right at last said fagerolles clenching his teeth i demand the vote since the discussion had become envenomed mazelle had been ringing his bell extremely flushed at finding his authority ignored gentlemen come gentlemen it's extraordinary that one can't settle matters without shouting i beg of you gentlemen at last he obtained a little silence in reality he was not a bad-hearted man why should not they admit that little picture although he himself thought it execrable they admitted so many others come gentlemen the vote is asked for he himself was perhaps about to raise his hand when bongrand who had hitherto remained silent with the blood rising in his cheeks in the anger he was trying to restrain abruptly went off like a pop-gun most unreasonably giving vent to the protestations of his rebellious conscience but curse it all there are not four among us capable of turning out such a piece of work some grunts sped around but the sledgehammer blow had come upon them with such force that nobody answered gentlemen the vote is asked for curtly repeated mazel who had turned pale his tone sufficed to explain everything it expressed all his latent hatred of bongrand the fierce rivalry that lay hidden under their seemingly good-natured handshakes things rarely came to such a pass as this they almost always arranged matters but in the depths of their ravaged pride there were wounds which always bled they secretly waged duels which tortured them with agony despite the smile upon their lips bongrand and fagerolles alone raised their hands and the dead child being rejected could only perhaps be rescued at the general revision 
This general revision was the terrible part of the task, although, after twenty days' continuous toil, the committee allowed itself forty-eight hours' rest, so as to enable the keepers to prepare the final work, it could not help shuddering on the afternoon when it came from the assemblage of three thousand rejected paintings, from among which it had to rescue as many canvases as were necessary for the then regulation total of two thousand five hundred admitted works to be complete ah those three thousand pictures placed one after the other alongside the walls of all the galleries including the outer one deposited also even on the floors and lying there like stagnant pools between which the attendants devised little paths they were like an inundation a deluge which rose up streamed over the whole palais de l'industrie and submerged it beneath the murky flow of all the mediocrity and madness to be found in the river of art and but a single afternoon sitting was held from one till seven o'clock six hours of wild galloping through a maze at first they held out against fatigue and strove to keep their vision clear but the forced march soon made their legs give way their eyesight was irritated by all the dancing colours and yet it was still necessary to march on to look and judge even until they broke down with fatigue by four o'clock the march was like a rout the scattering of a defeated army some committeemen out of breath dragged themselves along very far in the rear others isolated lost amid the frames followed the narrow paths renouncing all prospect of emerging from them turning round and round without any hope of ever getting to the end how could they be just and impartial good heavens what could they select from amid that heap of horrors without clearly distinguishing a landscape from a portrait they made up the number they required in potluck fashion two hundred two hundred and forty another eight they still wanted eight more that one no that other as you like seven eight it was over at last they had got to the end and they hobbled away saved free in one gallery a fresh scene drew them once more round the dead child lying on the floor among other waifs but this time they jested a joker pretended to stumble and set his foot in the middle of the canvas while others trotted along the surrounding little paths as if trying to find out which was the picture's top and which its bottom, and declaring that it looked much better topsy-turvy. Fagerolles himself also began to joke. "'Come, a little courage, gentlemen. Go the round, examine it. You'll be repaid for your trouble. Really, now, gentlemen, be kind. Rescue it. Pray do that good action.' They all grew merry in listening to him, but with cruel laughter they refused more harshly than ever. No, no, never. Will you take it for your charity, cried a comrade. This was a custom. The committee men had a right to a charity. Each of them could select a canvas among the lot, no matter how execrable it might be, and it was thereupon admitted without examination. As a rule, the bounty of this admission was bestowed upon poor artists. The forty paintings thus rescued at the eleventh hour were those of the beggars at the door, those whom one allowed to glide with empty stomachs to the far end of the table. "'For my charity,' repeated Fagerolles, feeling very much embarrassed, "'the fact is, I meant to take another painting for my charity. Yes, some flowers by a lady.' He was interrupted by loud jeers. Was she pretty? In front of the women's paintings, the gentlemen were particularly prone to sneer, never displaying the least gallantry, and Fagerolles remained perplexed, for the lady in question was a person whom Irma took an interest in. He trembled at the idea of the terrible scene which would ensue should he fail to keep his promise. An expedient occurred to him. Well, and you, Bongrand, you might very well take this funny little dead child for your charity. Bongrand, wounded to the heart, indignant at all the bartering, waved his long arms. What, I? I insult a real painter in that fashion? Let him be prouder, dash it, and never send anything to the salon. 
Then, as the others still went on sneering, Fagerolles, desirous that victory should remain to him, made up his mind with a proud air, like a man who is conscious of his strength and does not fear being compromised. All right, I'll take it for my charity, he said. The others shouted bravo and gave him a bantering ovation with a series of profound bows and numerous handshakes. All honour to the brave fellow who had the courage of his opinions. And an attendant carried away in his arms the poor, derided, jolted, soiled canvas. And thus it was that a picture by the painter of In the Open Air was at last accepted by the hanging committee of the Salon. End of chapter 10, part A Chapter 10, Part B of His Masterpiece by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. On the very next morning, a note from Fagerolles apprised Claude, in a couple of lines, that he had succeeded in getting the dead child admitted, but that it had not been managed without trouble. Claude, despite the gladness of the tidings, felt a pang at his heart. The note was so brief, and was written in such a protecting, pitying style, that all the humiliating features of the business were apparent to him. For a moment he felt sorry over this victory, so much so that he would have liked to take his work back and hide it. Then his delicacy of feeling, his artistic pride again gave way. So much did protracted waiting for success make his wretched heart bleed. Ah, to be seen, to make his way despite everything. He had reached the point when conscience capitulates. He once more began to long for the opening of the salon with all the feverish impatience of a beginner, again living in a state of illusion, which showed him a crowd, a press of moving heads acclaiming his canvas. By degrees Paris had made it the fashion to patronize varnishing day, the day formerly set aside for painters only to come and finish the toilettes of their pictures. Now, however, it was like a feast of early fruit, one of those solemnities which set the city agog and attract a tremendous crowd. For a week past the newspaper press, the streets, and the public had belonged to the artists. They held Paris in their grasp. The only matters talked of were themselves, their exhibits, their sayings or doings, in fact, everything connected with them. It was one of those infatuations which at last draw bands of country folk, common soldiers, and even nursemaids to the galleries on days of gratuitous admission, in such wise that fifty thousand visitors are recorded on some fine Sundays, an entire army, all the rear battalions of the ignorant lower orders, following society and marching with dilated eyes through that vast picture-shop. That famous varnishing day at first frightened Claude, who was intimidated by the thought of all the fine people whom the newspapers spoke about, and he resolved to wait for the more democratic day of the real inauguration. He even refused to accompany Sandoz. But he was consumed by such a fever that after all he started off abruptly at eight o'clock in the morning, barely taking time to eat a bit of bread and cheese beforehand. Christine, who lacked the courage to go with him, kissed him again and again, feeling anxious and moved. "'Mind, my dear, don't worry, whatever happens,' said she. Claude felt somewhat oppressed as he entered the gallery of honour. His heart was beating fast from the swiftness with which he had climbed the grand staircase. There was a limpid May sky out of doors, and through the linen awnings, stretched under the glazed roof, there filtered a bright white light, while the open doorways, communicating with the garden gallery, admitted moist gusts of quivering freshness. For a moment Claude drew breath in that atmosphere which was already tainted with a vague smell of varnish, and the odour of the musk with which the women present perfumed themselves. At a glance he took stock of the pictures on the walls, a huge massacre scene in front of him, streaming with carmine, a colossal pallid religious picture on his left, a government order, the commonplace delineations of some official festivity on the right, and then a variety of portraits, landscapes, and indoor scenes, 
all glaring sharply amid the fresh gilding of their frames. However, the fear which he retained of the folks usually present at this solemnity led him to direct his glances upon the gradually increasing crowd. On a circular settee in the centre of the gallery, from which sprang a sheaf of tropical foliage, there sat three ladies, three monstrously fat creatures, attired in an abominable fashion, who had settled there to indulge in the whole day's backbiting. Behind him he heard somebody crushing harsh syllables in a hoarse voice. It was an Englishman, in a check pattern jacket, explaining the massacre scene to a yellow woman buried in the depths of a travelling Ulster. There were some vacant spaces. Groups of people formed, scattered and formed again further on. All heads were raised. The men carried walking sticks, and had overcoats on their arms. The women strolled about slowly, showing distant profiles as they stopped before the pictures. And Claude's artistic eye was caught by the flowers in their hats and bonnets, which seemed very loud in tint amid the dark waves of the men's silk hats. He perceived three priests, two common soldiers who had found their way there no one knew whence, some endless processions of gentlemen decorated with the ribbon of the Legion of Honour, and troops of girls with their mothers, who constantly impeded the circulation. However, a good many of these people knew each other. There were smiles and bows from afar, at times a rapid handshake in passing, and conversation was carried on in a discreet tone of voice, above which rose the continuous tramping of feet. Then Claude began to look for his own picture, he tried to find his way by means of the initial letters inscribed above the entrances of the galleries, but made a mistake, and went through those on the left hand. There was a succession of open entrances, a perspective of old tapestry door hangings with glimpses of the distant pictures. He went as far as the great western gallery, and came back by the parallel suite of smaller galleries, without finding that allotted to the letter L and when he reached the gallery of honour again, the crowd had greatly increased. In fact, it was now scarcely possible for one to move about there. Being unable to advance, he looked around, and recognised a number of painters, that nation of painters which was at home there that day, and was therefore doing the honours of its abode. Claude particularly remarked an old friend of the Boutin studio, a young fellow consumed with the desire to advertise himself, who had been working for a medal, and who was now pouncing upon all the visitors possessed of any influence, and forcibly taking them to see his pictures. Then there was a celebrated and wealthy painter who received his visitors in front of his work, with a smile of triumph on his lips, showing himself compromisingly gallant with the ladies, who formed quite a court around him. And there were all the others— the rivals who execrated one another, although they shouted words of praise in full voices, the savage fellows who covertly watched their comrade's success from the corner of a doorway, the timid ones whom one could not for an empire induce to pass through the gallery where their pictures were hung, the jokers who hid the bitter mortification of their defeat under an amusing witticism the sincere ones who were absorbed in contemplation, trying to understand the various works, and already, in fancy, distributing the medals. And the painter's families were also there. One charming young woman was accompanied by a coquettishly bedecked child. A sour-looking, skinny matron of middle-class birth was flanked by two ugly urchins in black. A fat mother had foundered on a bench amid quite a tribe of dirty brats, and a lady of mature charms, still very good-looking, stood beside her grown-up daughter, quietly watching a hussy pass, this hussy being the father's mistress. And then there were also the models, women who pulled one another by the sleeve, who showed one another their own forms in the various pictorial nudities, talking very loudly the while, and dressed without taste, spoiling their superb figures by such wretched gowns, that they seemed to be humpbacked beside the well-dressed dolls, those Parisiennes who owed their figures entirely to their dressmakers. When Claude got free of the crowd, he enfiladed the line of doorways on the right hand. His letter was on that side, but he searched the galleries marked with an L without finding anything. Perhaps his canvas had gone astray and served to fill up a vacancy elsewhere. 
So, when he had reached the large eastern gallery, he set off along a number of other little ones, a secluded suite visited by very few people, where the pictures seemed to frown with boredom. And there again he found nothing. Bewildered, distracted, he roamed about, went on to the garden gallery, searching among the superabundant exhibits which overflowed there, pallid and shivering in the crude light and eventually after other distant excursions he tumbled into the gallery of honour for the third time there was now quite a crush there all those who in any way create a stir in paris were assembled together the celebrities the wealthy the adored talent money and grace the masters of romance of the drama and of journalism club men racing men and speculators women of every category hussies, actresses, and society bells. And Claude, angered by his vain search, grew amazed at the vulgarity of the faces thus massed together, of the incongruity of the toilettes, but a few of which were elegant, while so many were common-looking, at the lack of majesty which that vaunted society displayed, that the fear which had made him tremble was changed into contempt, were these the people, then, who were going to jeer at his picture, provided it was found again? Two little reporters with fair complexions were completing a list of persons whose names they intended to mention. A critic pretended to take some notes on the margin of his catalogue. Another was holding forth in professor's style in the centre of a party of beginners. A third, all by himself, with his hands behind his back, seemed rooted to one spot, crushing each work beneath his august impassibility. And what especially struck Claude was the jostling, flock-like behaviour of the people. Their banded curiosity, in which there was nothing youthful or passionate, the bitterness of their voices, the weariness to be read on their faces, their general appearance of suffering. Envy was already at work. There was the gentleman who makes himself witty with the ladies, the one who, without a word, looks, gives a terrible shrug of the shoulders, and then goes off. And there were the two who remained for a quarter of an hour leaning over the handrail, with their noses close to a little canvas, whispering very low, and exchanging the knowing glances of conspirators. But Fagerolles had just appeared, and amid the continuous ebb and flow of the groups there seemed to be no one left but him. With his hand outstretched, he seemed to show himself everywhere at the same time, lavishly exerting himself to play the double part of a young master and an influential member of the hanging committee. Overwhelmed with praise, thanks, and complaints, he had an answer ready for everybody without losing aught of his affability. Since early morning he had been resisting the assault of the petty painters of his set who found their pictures badly hung. It was the usual scamper of the first moment, everybody looking for everybody else, rushing to see one another and bursting into recriminations, noisy, interminable fury. Either the picture was too high up, or the light did not fall on it properly, or the paintings near it destroyed its effect. In fact, some talked of unhooking their works and carrying them off. One tall, thin fellow was especially tenacious, going from gallery to gallery in pursuit of Fagerolles, who vainly explained that he was innocent in the matter and could do nothing. Numerical order was followed. The pictures for each wall were deposited on the floor below and then hung up without anybody being favoured. He carried his obligingness so far as to promise his intervention when the galleries were rearranged after the medals had been awarded but even then he did not manage to calm the tall, thin fellow, who still continued pursuing him. Claude, for a moment, elbowed his way through the crowd to go and ask Fagerolles where his picture had been hung. But on seeing his friend so surrounded, pride restrained him. Was there not something absurd and painful about this constant need of another's help? Besides, he suddenly reflected that he must have skipped a whole suite of galleries, on the right-hand side, and indeed there were fresh leagues of painting there. He ended by reaching a gallery where a stifling crowd was massed in front of a large picture which filled the central panel of honour. At first he could not see it. There was such a surging sea of shoulders, 
such a thick wall of heads, such a rampart of hats. People rushed forward with gaping admiration. At length, however, by dint of rising on tiptoe, he perceived the marvel, and recognized the subject by what had been told him. It was Fagerolles' picture, and in that picnic he found his own forgotten work in the open air, the same light key of colour, the same artistic formula, but softened, trickishly rendered, spoilt by skin-deep elegance, everything being arranged with infinite skill to satisfy the low ideal of the public. Fagerolles had not made the mistake of stripping his three women, but, clad in the audacious toilettes of women of society, they showed no little of their persons. As for the two gallant gentlemen in summer jackets beside them, they realized the ideal of everything most distingué. Quite afar off a footman was pulling a hamper off the box of a landau, drawn up behind the trees. The whole of it, the figures, the drapery, the bits of still life of the repast, stood out gaily in the full sunlight against the darkened foliage of the background, and the supreme skill of the painter lay in his pretended audacity, in a mendacious semblance of forcible treatment which just sufficed to send the multitude into ecstasies. It was like a storm in a cream jug. Claude, being unable to approach, listened to the remarks around him. At last there was a man who depicted real truth. He did not press his points like those fools of the new school. He knew how to convey everything without showing anything. Ah, the art of knowing where to draw the line, the art of letting things be guessed. The respect due to the public, the approval of good society, and withal such delicacy, such charm and art. He did not unseasonably deliver himself of passionate things, of exuberant design. No, when he had taken three notes from nature, he gave those three notes nothing more. A newspaper man who arrived went into raptures over the picnic, and coined the expression, a very Parisian style of painting. It was repeated, and people no longer passed without declaring that the picture was very Parisian indeed. All those bent shoulders, all those admiring remarks rising from a sea of spines ended by exasperating Claude, and seized with a longing to see the faces of the folk who created success, he manoeuvred in such a way as to lean his back against the handrail hard by. From that point he had the public in front of him in the grey light filtering through the linen awning, which kept the centre of the gallery in shade whilst the brighter light, gliding from the edges of the blinds, illumined the paintings on the walls with a white flow, in which the gilding of the frames acquired a warm, sunshiny tint. Claude at once recognized the people who had formerly derided him. If these were not the same, they were at least their relatives. Serious, however, and enraptured, their appearance greatly improved by their respectful attention. The evil look, the weariness which he had at first remarked on their faces, as envious bile drew their skin together and dyed it yellow, disappeared here while they enjoyed the treat of an amiable lie. Two fat ladies, open-mouthed, were yawning with satisfaction. Some old gentlemen opened their eyes wide with a knowing air. A husband explained the subject to his young wife, who jogged her chin with a pretty motion of the neck. There was every kind of marvelling, beatifical, astonished, profound, gay, austere, amidst unconscious smiles and languid postures of the head. The men threw back their black silk hats, the flowers in the women's bonnets glided to the napes of their necks, and all the faces, after remaining motionless for a moment, were then drawn aside and replaced by others exactly like them. Then Claude, stupefied by that triumph, virtually forgot everything else. The gallery was becoming too small, fresh bands of people constantly accumulated inside it. There were no more vacant spaces, as there had been early in the morning. No more cool whiffs rose from the garden, amid the ambient smell of varnish. The atmosphere was now becoming hot and bitter with the perfumes scattered by the women's dresses. Before long the predominant odour suggested that of a wet dog. It must have been raining outside. One of those sudden spring showers had no doubt fallen, for the last arrivals brought moisture with them. 
Their clothes hung about them heavily, and seemed to steam as soon as they encountered the heat of the gallery. And indeed patches of darkness had for a moment been passing above the awning of the roof. Claude, who raised his eyes, guessed that large clouds were galloping onward, lashed by the north wind, that driving rain was beating upon the glass panes. Moiré-like shadows darted along the walls, all the paintings became dim. The spectators themselves were blended in obscurity until the cloud was carried away, whereupon the painter saw the heads again emerge from the twilight, ever agape with idiotic rapture. But there was another cup of bitterness in reserve for Claude. On the left-hand panel, facing Fagerolles, he perceived Bongrand's picture, and in front of that painting there was no crush whatever. The visitors walked by with an air of indifference, Yet it was Bongrand's supreme effort, the thrust he had been trying to give for years, a last work conceived in his obstinate craving to prove the virility of his decline. The hatred he harboured against the village wedding, that first masterpiece which had weighed upon all his toilsome afterlife, had impelled him to select a contrasting but corresponding subject, the village funeral the funeral of a young girl with relatives and friends straggling among the fields of rye and oats bongrand had wrestled with himself saying that people should see if he were done for if the experience of his sixty years were not worth all the lucky dash of his youth and now experience was defeated the picture was destined to be a mournful failure like the silent fall of an old man which does not even stay passers-by in their onward course there were still some masterly bits, the choir-boy holding the cross, the group of daughters of the Virgin carrying the bier, whose white dresses and ruddy flesh furnished a pretty contrast with the black Sunday toggery of the rustic mourners, among all the green stuff. Only the priest in his alb, the girl carrying the Virgin's banner, the family following the body, were dryly handled. The whole picture, in fact, was displeasing in its very science and the obstinate stiffness of its treatment. One found in it a fatal, unconscious return to the troubled romanticism which had been the starting point of the painter's career. And the worst of the business was that there was justification for the indifference with which the public treated that art of another period, that cooked and somewhat dull style of painting which no longer stopped one on one's way since great blazes of light had come into vogue. It precisely happened that Bongrand entered the gallery with the hesitating step of a timid beginner, and Claude felt a pang at his heart as he saw him give a glance at his neglected picture and then another at Fagerolles, which was bringing on a riot. At that moment the old painter must have been acutely conscious of his fall. If he had so far been devoured by the fear of slow decline, it was because he still doubted, and now he obtained sudden certainty. He was surviving his reputation, his talent was dead, he would never more give birth to living, palpitating works. He became very pale and was about to turn and flee, when Jean Bouvard, the sculptor, entering the gallery by the other door, followed by his customary train of disciples, called to him without caring a fig for the people present. Ah, you humbug, I catch you at it admiring yourself. He, Jean Bouvard, exhibited that year an execrable reaping woman, one of those stupidly spoilt figures which seemed like hoaxes on his part, so unworthy they were of his powerful hands. But he was none the less radiant, feeling certain that he had turned out yet another masterpiece, and promenading his godlike infallibility through the crowd which he did not hear laughing at him. Bongrand did not answer but looked at him with eyes scorched by fever. "'And my machine downstairs?' continued the sculptor. "'Have you seen it? The little fellows of nowadays may try it on, but we are the only masters. We, old France!' And thereupon he went off, followed by his court, and bowing to the astonished public. "'The brute!' muttered Bongrand, suffocating with grief, as indignant as at the outburst of some low-bred fellow beside a deathbed. He perceived Claude and approached him. Was it not cowardly to flee from this gallery? And he determined to show his courage, his lofty soul, into which envy had never entered. 
"'Our friend Fagerolles has a success and no mistake,' he said. "'I should be a hypocrite if I went into ecstasies over his picture, which I scarcely like. "'But he himself is really a very nice fellow indeed. "'Besides, you know how he exerted himself on your behalf.' Claude was trying to find a word of admiration for the village funeral. "'The little cemetery in the background is so pretty,' he said at last. "'Is it possible that the public—' But Bongrand interrupted him in a rough voice. "'No compliments of condolence, my friend, eh? I see clear enough.' At this moment somebody nodded to them in a familiar way, and Claude recognized Naudet. A Naudet who had grown and expanded— gilded by the success of his colossal strokes of business. Ambition was turning his head. He talked about sinking all the other picture dealers. He had built himself a palace, in which he posed as the king of the market, centralizing masterpieces, and there opening large art shops of the modern style. One heard a jingle of millions on the very threshold of his hall. He held exhibitions there, even ran up other galleries elsewhere and each time that May came round, he awaited the visits of the American amateurs, whom he charged 50,000 francs for a picture which he himself had purchased for 10,000. Moreover, he lived in princely style, with a wife and children, a mistress, a country estate in Picardy, and extensive shooting grounds. His first large profits had come from the rise in value of works left by illustrious artists, now defunct, whose talent had been denied while they lived, such as Courbet, Millet, and Rousseau, and this had ended by making him disdain any picture signed by a still struggling artist. However, ominous rumours were already in circulation. As the number of well-known pictures was limited, and the number of amateurs could barely be increased, a time seemed to be coming when business would prove very difficult. There was talk of a syndicate, of an understanding with certain bankers to keep up the present high prices. The expedient of simulated sales was resorted to at the Hôtel Drouot, pictures being bought in at a big figure by the dealer himself, and bankruptcy seemed to be at the end of all that stock exchange jobbery, a perfect tumble, head over heels, after all the excessive, mendacious agiotage. "'Good day, dear master,' said Naudet, who had drawn near. "'So you have come, like everybody else, to see my Fagerolles, eh?' He no longer treated Bongrand in the wheedling, respectful manner of yore, and he spoke of Fagerolles as of a painter belonging to him, of a workman to whom he paid wages, and whom he often scolded. It was he who had settled the young artist in the Avenue de Villiers, compelling him to have a little mansion of his own, furnishing it as he would have furnished a place for a hussy, running him into debt with supplies of carpets and knick-knacks, so that he might afterwards hold him at his mercy. And now he began to accuse him of lacking orderliness and seriousness, of compromising himself like a feather-brain. Take that picture, for instance. A serious painter would never have sent it to the salon. It made a stir, no doubt, and people even talked of its obtaining the Medal of Honour. But nothing could have a worse effect on high prices. When a man wanted to get hold of the Yankees, he ought to know how to remain at home, like an idol in the depths of his tabernacle. "'You may believe me or not, my dear fellow,' he said to Bongrand, "'but I would have given twenty thousand francs out of my pocket to prevent those stupid newspapers from making all this row about my Fagerolles this year.' Bongrand, who despite his sufferings was listening bravely, smiled. "'In point of fact,' he said, they are perhaps carrying indiscretion too far. I read an article yesterday in which I learnt that Fagerolles ate two boiled eggs every morning. He laughed over the coarse puffery which, after a first article on the young master's picture, as yet seen by nobody, had for a week past kept all Paris occupied about him. The whole fraternity of reporters had been campaigning, stripping Fagerolles to the skin, telling their readers all about his father, the artistic zinc manufacturer, his education, the house in which he resided, how he lived, even revealing the colour of his socks, and mentioning a habit he had of pinching his nose. And he was the passion of the hour, the young master, according to the tastes of the day, one who had been lucky enough to miss the Prix de Rome, 
and break off with the school of arts, whose principles, however, he retained. After all, the success of that style of painting, which aims merely at approximating reality, not at rendering it in all its truth, was the fortune of a season which the wind brings and blows away again, a mere whim on the part of the great lunatic city. The stir it caused was like that occasioned by some accident which upsets the crowd in the morning and is forgotten by night amidst general indifference. However, Naudet noticed the village funeral. Hallo, that's your picture, eh? he said. So you wanted to give a companion to the wedding. Well, I should have tried to dissuade you. Ah, the wedding, the wedding. Bongrand still listened to him without ceasing to smile. Barely a twinge of pain passed over his trembling lips. He forgot his masterpieces, the certainty of leaving an immortal name. He was only cognizant of the vogue which that youngster, unworthy of cleaning his palate, had so suddenly and easily acquired. That vogue which seemed to be pushing him, Bongrand, into oblivion. He who had struggled for ten years before he had succeeded in making himself known, Ah, when the new generations bury a man, if they only knew what tears of blood they make him shed in death. However, as he had remained silent, he was seized with the fear that he might have let his suffering be divined. Was he falling to the baseness of envy? Anger with himself made him raise his head. A man should die erect, and instead of giving the violent answer which was rising to his lips, he said in a familiar way, you are right, no day. I should have done better if I had gone to bed on the day when the idea of that picture occurred to me. Ah, there he is. Excuse me, cried the dealer, making off. It was Fagerolles showing himself at the entrance of the gallery. He discreetly stood there without entering, carrying his good fortune with the ease of a man who knows what he is about. Besides, he was looking for somebody. He made a sign to a young man and gave him an answer, a favourable one, no doubt, for the other brimmed over with gratitude. Then two other persons sprang forward to congratulate him. A woman detained him, showing him with a martyr's gesture a bit of still life hung in a dark corner, and finally he disappeared after casting but one glance at the people in raptures before his picture. Claude, who had looked and listened, was overwhelmed with sadness. The crush was still increasing. He now had naught before him but faces gaping and sweating in the heat, which had become intolerable. Above the nearer shoulders rose others, and so on and so on as far as the door, whence those who could see nothing pointed out the painting to each other with the tips of their umbrellas from which dripped the water left by the showers outside. And Bongrand remained there out of pride, erect in defeat, firmly planted on his legs, those of an old combatant, and gazing with limpid eyes upon ungrateful Paris. He wished to finish like a brave man, whose kindness of heart is boundless. Claude, who spoke to him without receiving any answer, saw very well that there was nothing behind that calm, gay face. The mind was absent. It had flown away in mourning, bleeding with frightful torture and thereupon, full of alarm and respect, he did not insist, but went off, and Bongrand, with his vacant eyes, did not even notice his departure. A new idea had just impelled Claude onward through the crowd. He was lost in wonderment at not having been able to discover his picture, but nothing could be more simple. Was there not some gallery where people grinned, some corner full of noise and banter, some gathering of jesting spectators insulting a picture, that picture would assuredly be his. He could still hear the laughter of the bygone Salon of the Rejected, and now at the door of each gallery he listened to ascertain if it were there that he was being hissed. However, as he found himself once more in the Eastern Gallery, that hall where great art agonizes, that depository where vast, cold, and gloomy historical and religious compositions are accumulated, he started, and remained motionless with his eyes turned upward. He had passed through that gallery twice already, and yet that was certainly his picture up yonder, so high up that he hesitated about recognizing it. 
It looked, indeed, so little, poised like a swallow at the corner of a frame, the monumental frame of an immense painting five and thirty feet long, representing the deluge, a swarming of yellow figures turning topsy-turvy in water of the hue of wine lees. On the left, moreover, there was a pitiable ashen portrait of a general, on the right a colossal nymph in a moonlit landscape, the bloodless corpse of a murdered woman rotting away on some grass. And everywhere around there were mournful, violet-shaded things, mixed up with a comic scene of some bibulous monks, and an opening of the Chamber of Deputies, with a whole page of writing on a gilded cartouche bearing the heads of the better-known deputies, drawn in outline, together with their names. And high up, high up amid those livid neighbours, the little canvas, over course in treatment, glared ferociously with the painful grimace of a monster. Ah, oh, the dead child! At that distance the wretched little creature was but a confused lump of flesh, the lifeless carcass of some shapeless animal. Was that swollen, whitened head a skull or a stomach? and those poor hands twisted among the bedclothes like the bent claws of a bird killed by cold, and the bed itself, that pallidity of the sheets below the pallidity of the limbs, all that white looking so sad, those tints fading away as if typical of the supreme end. Afterwards, however, one distinguished the light eyes, staring fixedly, one recognised a child's head, and it all seemed to suggest some disease of the brain, profoundly and frightfully pitiful. Claude approached, and then drew back to see the better. The light was so bad that refractions darted from all points across the canvas. How they had hung his little Jacques, no doubt out of disdain, or perhaps from shame, so as to get rid of the child's lugubrious ugliness but Claude evoked the little fellow such as he had once been, and beheld him again over yonder in the country, so fresh and pinky as he rolled about in the grass, and then in the Rue de Douai, growing pale and stupid by degrees, and then in the Rue Tourlac, no longer able to carry his head, and dying one night, all alone, while his mother was asleep. And he beheld her also, that mother, the sad woman who had stopped at home, to weep there, no doubt, as she was now in the habit of doing for entire days. No matter, she had done right in not coming. T'was too mournful, their little Jacques, already cold in his bed, cast on one side like a pariah, and so brutalized by the dancing light that his face seemed to be laughing, distorted by an abominable grin. But Claude suffered still more from the loneliness of his work. Astonishment and disappointment made him look for the crowd, the rush which he had anticipated. Why was he not hooted? Ah, the insults of yore, the mocking, the indignation that had rent his heart, but made him live. No, nothing more, not even a passing expectoration. This was death. The visitors filed rapidly through the long gallery, seized with boredom. There were merely some people in front of the opening of the chamber, where they collected to read the inscriptions and show each other the deputies' heads. At last, hearing some laughter behind him, he turned. But nobody was jeering. Some visitors were simply making merry over the tipsy monks, the comic success of the salon which some gentlemen explained to some ladies, declaring that it was brilliantly witty. And all these people passed beneath little Jacques, and not a head was raised, not a soul even knew that he was up there. However, the painter had a gleam of hope. On the central settee, two personages, one of them fat and the other thin, and both of them decorated with the Legion of Honour, sat talking, reclining against the velvet and looking at the pictures in front of them. Claude drew near them and listened. And I followed them, said the fat fellow. They went along the Rue Saint-Honoré, the Rue Saint-Roche, the Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin, the Rue Lafayette. And you spoke to them? asked the thin man, who appeared to be deeply interested. No, I was afraid of getting in a rage. 
Claude went off and returned on three occasions, his heart beating fast each time that some visitor stopped short and glanced slowly from the line to the ceiling. He felt an unhealthy longing to hear one word, but one. Why exhibit? How fathom public opinion? Anything rather than such torturing silence. And he almost suffocated when he saw a young married couple approach, the husband a good-looking fellow with little fair moustaches, the wife charming with the delicate slim figure of a shepherdess in Dresden, China. She had perceived the picture, and asked what the subject was, stupefied that she could make nothing of it. And when her husband, turning over the leaves of the catalogue, had found the title, The Dead Child, she dragged him away, shuddering, and raising this cry of affright, Oh, the horror! The police oughtn't to allow such horrors! Then Claude remained there, erect, unconscious, and haunted, his eyes raised on high amid the continuous flow of the crowd, which passed on, quite indifferent, without one glance for that unique, sacred thing, visible to him alone. And it was there that Sandoz came upon him, amid the jostling. The novelist, who had been strolling about alone, his wife having remained at home beside his ailing mother, had just stopped short, heart-rent, below the little canvas, which he had espied by chance. Oh, how disgusted he felt with life! He abruptly lived the days of his youth over again. He recalled the college of Plaisant, his freaks with Claude on the banks of the Viorne, their long excursions under the burning sun, and all the flaming of their early ambition. And later on, when they had lived side by side, he remembered their efforts, their certainty of coming glory, that fine, irresistible, immoderate appetite that had made them talk of swallowing Paris at one bite. How many times, at that period, had he seen in Claude a great man, whose unbridled genius would leave the talent of all others far behind in the rear. First had come the studio of the Impasse des Bourdonnais, later the studio of the Quai de Bourbon, with dreams of vast compositions, projects big enough to make the Louvre burst. And meanwhile the struggle was incessant. The painter laboured ten hours a day, devoting his whole being to his work. And then what? After twenty years of that passionate life, he ended thus. He finished with that poor, sinister little thing, which nobody noticed, which looked so distressfully sad in its leper-like solitude. So much hope and torture, a lifetime spent in the toil of creating, to come to that, to that, good God! Sandoz recognized Claude standing by, and fraternal emotion made his voice quake as he said to him, "'What, so you came? Why did you refuse to call for me, then?' The painter did not even apologize. He seemed very tired, overcome with somniferous stupor. "'Well, don't stay here,' added Sandoz. "'It's past twelve o'clock, and you must lunch with me.' Some people were to wait for me at Le Doyen's, but I shall give them the go-by. Let's go down to the buffet. We shall pick up our spirits there, eh, old fellow? And then Sandoz led him away, holding his arm, pressing it, warming it, and trying to draw him from his mournful silence. Come, dash it all, you mustn't give way like that. Although they have hung your picture badly, it is all the same superb, a real bit of genuine painting. Oh, I know that you dreamt of something else, but you are not dead yet, it will be for later on. And just look, you ought to be proud, for it's you who really triumph at the Salon this year. Fagerolles isn't the only one who pillages you. They all imitate you now. You have revolutionized them since your open air, which they laughed so much about. Look, look, there's an open air effect, and there's another, and there's another. And here, and there, they all do it. He waved his hand towards the pictures as he and Claude passed along the galleries. In point of fact, the dash of clear light, introduced by degrees into contemporary painting, had fully burst forth at last. The dingy salons of yore, with their pitchy canvases, had made way for a salon full of sunshine, gay as spring itself. It was the dawn, the aurora which had first gleamed at the Salon of the Rejected, 
and which was now rising and rejuvenating art with a fine diffuse light full of infinite shades on all sides you found claude's famous bluey tinge even in the portraits and the genre scenes which had acquired the dimensions and the serious character of historical paintings the old academical subjects had disappeared with the cooked juices of tradition as if the condemned doctrine had carried its people of shadows away with it rare were the works of pure imagination the cadaverous nudities of mythology and catholicism the legendary subjects painted without faith the anecdotic bits destitute of life in fact all the bric-a-brac of the school of arts used up by generations of tricksters and fools and the influence of the new principle was evident even among those artists who lingered over the antique recipes even among the former masters who had now grown old the flash of sunlight had penetrated to their studios from afar at every step you took you saw a painting transpierce the wall and form as it were a window open upon nature soon the walls themselves would fall and nature would walk in for the breach was a broad one and the assault had driven routine away in that gay battle waged by audacity and youth ah your lot is a fine one all the same old fellow continued sandoz the art of to-morrow will be yours you have made them all claude thereupon opened his mouth and with an air of gloomy brutality said in a low voice what do i care if i have made them all when i haven't made myself see here it's too big an affair for me and that's what stifles me he made a gesture to finish expressing his thought his consciousness of his inability to prove the genius of the formula he had brought with him the torture he felt at being merely a precursor the one who sows the idea without reaping the glory his grief at seeing himself pillaged devoured by men who turned out hasty work by a whole flight of fellows who scattered their efforts and lowered the new form of art before he or another had found strength enough to produce the masterpiece which would make the end of the century a date in art but sandoz protested the future lay open then to divert claude he stopped him while crossing the gallery of honour and said just look at that lady in blue before that portrait what a slap nature does give to painting you remember when we used to look at the dresses and the animation of the galleries in former times not a painting then withstood the shock and yet now there are some which don't suffer over much i even noticed over there a landscape the general yellowish tinge of which completely eclipsed all the women who approached it claude was quivering with unutterable suffering pray let's go he said take me away i can't stand it any longer End of chapter 10, part B. Chapter 10, part C of His Masterpiece by Emil Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. They had all the trouble in the world to find a free table in the refreshment room. People were pressed together in that big shady retreat, girt round with brown serge drapery under the girders of the lofty iron flooring of the upstairs galleries. In the background, and but partially visible in the darkness, stood three dressers displaying dishes of preserved fruit symmetrically ranged on shelves, while nearer at hand, at counters placed on the right and left, two ladies, a dark one and a fair one, watched the crowd with a military air, and from the dim depths of this seeming cavern rose a sea of little marble tables, a tide of chairs, serried, entangled, surging, swelling, overflowing and spreading into the garden, under the broad, pallid light which fell from the glass roof. At last Sandoz saw some people rise. He darted forward and conquered the vacant table, by sheer struggling with the mob. "'Ah, oh, dash it, we are here at all events. What will you have to eat?' Claude made a gesture of indifference. The lunch was execrable. There were some trout softened by overboiling, some undercut of beef dried up in the oven, some asparagus smelling of moist linen, 
and in addition one had to fight to get served, for the hustled waiters, losing their heads, remained in distress in the narrow passages which the chairs were constantly blocking. Behind the hangings on the left one could hear a racket of saucepans and crockery, the kitchen being installed there on the sand, like one of those kermesse cook-shops set up by the roadside in the open air. Sandoz and Claude had to eat, seated obliquely and half-strangled between two parties of people, whose elbows almost ended by getting into their plates, and each time that a waiter passed he gave their chairs a shake with his hips. However, the inconvenience, like the abominable cookery, made one gay. People jested about the dishes, different tables fraternized together, common misfortune brought about a kind of pleasure party. Strangers ended by sympathizing. Friends kept up conversations, although they were seated three rows distant from one another, and were obliged to turn their heads and gesticulate over their neighbors' shoulders. The women particularly became animated, at first rather anxious as to the crush, and then ungloving their hands, catching up their skirts, and laughing at the first thimbleful of neat wine they drank. However, Sandoz, who had renounced finishing his meat, raised his voice amid the terrible hubbub caused by the chatter and the serving. A bit of cheese, eh? And let's try to get some coffee. Claude, whose eyes looked dreamy, did not hear. He was gazing into the garden. From his seat he could see the central clump of verdure, some lofty palms which stood in relief against the grey hangings with which the garden was decorated all around. A circle of statues was set out there, and you could see the back of a fawn, the profile of a young girl with full cheeks, the face of a bronze gall, a colossal bit of romanticism which irritated one by its stupid assumption of patriotism the trunk of a woman hanging by the wrists, some Andromeda of the Place Pigalle, and others still following the bends of the pathways, rows of shoulders and hips, heads, breasts, legs and arms, all mingling and growing indistinct in the distance. On the left stretched a line of busts, such delightful ones, furnishing a most comical and uncommon suite of noses. There was the huge pointed nose of a priest, the tip-tilted nose of a soubrette, the handsome classical nose of a fifteenth-century Italian woman, the mere fancy nose of a sailor. In fact, every kind of nose, both the magistrates and the manufacturers, and the nose of the gentleman decorated with the Legion of Honour, all of them motionless and ranged in endless succession. However, Claude saw nothing of them, to him they were but grey spots in the hazy greenish light. His stupor still lasted, and he was only conscious of one thing, the luxuriousness of the women's dresses, of which he had formed a wrong estimate amid the pushing in the galleries, and which were here freely displayed, as if the wearers had been promenading over the gravel in the conservatory of some chateau. All the elegance of Paris passed by, the women who had come to show themselves, in dresses thoughtfully combined and destined to be described in the morrow's newspapers. People stared a great deal at an actress, who walked about with a queen-like tread, on the arm of a gentleman who assumed the complacent airs of a prince consort. The women of society looked like so many hussies, and they all of them took stock of one another with that slow glance which estimates the value of silk and the length of lace, and which ferrets everywhere from the tips of the boots to the feathers upon bonnets. This was neutral ground, so to say. Some ladies who were seated had drawn their chairs together after the fashion in the garden of the Tuileries, and occupied themselves exclusively with criticising those of their own sex who passed by. Two female friends quickened their pace, laughing. Another woman, all alone, walked up and down, mute, with a black look in her eyes. Some others, who had lost one another, met again, and began ejaculating about the adventure. And meantime, the dark, moving mass of men came to a standstill, then set off again till it stopped short before a bit of marble, or eddied back to a bit of bronze. And among the mere bourgeois, who were few in number, though all of them looked out of their element there, moved men with celebrated names, all the illustrations of Paris. A name of resounding glory re-echoed as a fat, ill-clad gentleman passed by. 
The winged name of a poet followed as a pale man with a flat, common face approached. A living wave was rising from this crowd in the even, colourless light, when suddenly a flash of sunshine, from behind the clouds of a final shower, set the glass panes on high aflame, making the stained window on the western side resplendent, and raining down in golden particles through the still atmosphere. And then everything became warm. The snowy statues amid the shiny green stuff, the soft lawns parted by the yellow sand of the pathways, the rich dresses with their glossy satin and bright beads, even the very voices, whose hilarious murmur seemed to crackle like a bright fire of vine shoots. Some gardeners, completing the arrangements of the flowering beds, turned on the taps of the standpipes and promenaded about with their pots, the showers squirting from which came forth again in tepid steam from the drenched grass. And meanwhile a plucky sparrow who had descended from the iron girders, despite the number of people, dipped his beak in the sand in front of the buffet, eating some crumbs which a young woman threw him by way of amusement. Of all the tumult, however, Claude only heard the ocean-like din afar, the rumbling of the people rolling onwards in the galleries. And a recollection came to him. He remembered that noise which had burst forth like a hurricane in front of his picture at the Salon of the Rejected. But nowadays people no longer laughed at him. Upstairs the giant roar of Paris was acclaiming Fagerolles. It so happened that Sandoz, who had turned round, said to Claude, Hallo, there's Fagerolles. And indeed, Fagerolles and Jory had just laid hands on a table nearby, without noticing their friends, and the journalist, continuing in his gruff voice a conversation which had previously begun, remarked, Yes, I saw his dead child. Ah, the poor devil, what an ending! But Fagerolles nudged Jory, and the latter, having caught sight of his two old comrades, immediately added, Ah, oh, that dear old Claude! How goes it, eh? You know that I haven't yet seen your picture, but I'm told that it's superb. Superb, declared Fagerolles, who then began to express his surprise. So you lunched here. What an idea. Everything is so awfully bad. We two have just come from the Doyens. Oh, such a crowd and such hustling, such mirth. Bring your table nearer and let us chat a bit. They joined the two tables together but flatterers and petitioners were already after the triumphant young master. Three friends rose up and noisily saluted him from afar. A lady became smilingly contemplative when her husband had whispered his name in her ear. And the tall, thin fellow, the artist whose picture had been badly hung, and who had pursued him since the morning, as enraged as ever, left a table where he was seated at the further end of the buffet, and again hurried forward to complain, imperatively demanding the line at once. "'Oh, go to the deuce!' at last cried Fagerolles, his patience and amiability exhausted. And he added, when the other had gone off, mumbling some indistinct threats, "'It's true, a fellow does all he can to be obliging, but those chaps would drive one mad. All of them on the line, a league of line, then.' Ah, oh, what a business it is to be a committee man! One wears out one's legs, and one only reaps hatred as reward. Claude, who was looking at him with his oppressed air, seemed to wake up for a moment and murmured, I wrote to you. I wanted to go and see you, to thank you. Bongrand told me about all the trouble you had, so thanks again. But Fagerol hastily broke in. Tut, tut, I certainly owed that much to our old friendship. It's I who am delighted to have given you any pleasure. He showed the embarrassment, which always came upon him in presence of the acknowledged master of his youth, that kind of humility which filled him perforce when he was with the man whose mute disdain, even at this moment, sufficed to spoil all his triumph. Your picture is very good, slowly added Claude, who wished to be kind-hearted and generous. This simple praise made Fagerolles' heart swell with exaggerated, irresistible emotion, springing he knew not whence. And this rascal, who believed in nothing, who was usually so proficient in humbug, answered in a shaky voice, "'Oh, my dear fellow, oh, it's very kind of you to tell me that!' Sandoz had at last obtained two cups of coffee, 
and as the waiter had forgotten to bring any sugar, he had to content himself with some pieces which a party had left on an adjoining table. A few tables, indeed, had now become vacant, but the general freedom had increased, and one woman's laughter rang out so loudly that every head turned round. The men were smoking, and a bluish cloud slowly rose above the straggling tablecloths, stained by wine and littered with dirty plates and dishes. When Fagerolles, on his side, succeeded in obtaining two glasses of chartreuse for himself and Jory, he began to talk to Sandoz, whom he treated with a certain amount of deference, divining that the novelist might become a power. And Jory thereupon appropriated Claude, who had again become mournful and silent. "'You know, my dear fellow,' said the journalist, "'I didn't send you any announcement of my marriage. "'On account of our position we managed it on the quiet, "'without inviting any guests. "'All the same, I should have liked to let you know. "'You will excuse me, won't you?' "'He showed himself expansive, gave particulars, "'full of the happiness of life, "'and egotistically delighted to feel fat and victorious "'in front of that poor, vanquished fellow. "'He succeeded with everything,' he said. He had given up leader-writing, feeling the necessity of settling down seriously, and he had risen to the editorship of a prominent art review, on which, so it was asserted, he made thirty thousand francs a year, without mentioning certain profits realized by shady trafficking in the sale of art collections. The middle-class rapacity, which he had inherited from his mother, the hereditary passion for profit which had secretly impelled him to embark in petty speculations as soon as he had gained a few coppers, now openly displayed itself, and ended by making him a terrible customer who bled all the artists and amateurs who came under his clutches. It was amidst this good luck of his that Mathilde, now all-powerful, had brought him to the point of begging her, with tears in his eyes, to become his wife, a request which she had proudly refused during six long months. "'When folks are destined to live together,' he continued, "'the best course is to set everything square. "'You experienced it yourself, my dear fellow. "'You know something about it, eh? "'And if I told you that she wouldn't consent at first, "'yes, it's a fact, for fear of being misjudged and of doing me harm. "'Oh, she has such grandeur, such delicacy of mind. "'No, nobody can have any idea of that woman's qualities.' devoted, taking all possible care of one, economical, and acute, too, and such a good adviser. Ah, oh, it was a lucky chance that I met her. I no longer do anything without consulting her. I let her do as she likes. She manages everything upon my word. The truth was that Mathilde had finished by reducing him to the frightened obedience of a little boy. The once dissolute she-ghoul had become a dictatorial spouse, eager for respect, and consumed with ambition and love of money. She showed, too, every form of sourish virtue. It was said that they had been taking the Holy Communion together at Notre-Dame-de-Lorette. They kissed one another before other people and called each other by endearing nicknames. Only of an evening he had to relate how he had spent his time during the day, and if the employment of a single hour remained suspicious— if he did not bring home all the money he had received, down to the odd coppers, she led him the most abominable life imaginable. This, of course, Jory left unmentioned. By way of conclusion, he exclaimed, And so we waited for my father's death, and then I married her. Claude, whose mind had so far been wandering, and who had merely nodded without listening, was struck by that last sentence. What? You married her? "'Married Mathilde?' "'That exclamation summed up all the astonishment "'that the affair caused in him, "'all the recollections that occurred to him of Maudot's shop. "'That jory, why, he could still hear him "'talking about Mathilde in an abominable manner, "'and yet he had married her. "'It was really stupid for a fellow to speak badly of a woman, "'for he never knew if he might not end up "'by marrying her some day or other. "'However, jory was perfectly serene.' His memory was dead, he never allowed himself an allusion to the past, never showed the slightest embarrassment when his comrades' eyes were turned on him. Besides, Matilda seemed to be a newcomer. He introduced her to them as if they knew nothing whatever about her. Sandoz, who had lent an ear to the conversation, greatly interested by this fine business, called out as soon as Jory and Claude became silent, 
Let's be off, eh? My legs are getting numbed. But at that moment, Irma Bacot appeared and stopped in front of the buffet. With her hair freshly gilded, she had put on her best looks, all the tricky sheen of a tawny hussy who seemed to have just stepped out of some old Renaissance frame, and she wore a train of light blue brocaded silk with a satin skirt covered with Alençon lace of such richness that quite an escort of gentlemen followed her in admiration. On perceiving Claude among the others, she hesitated for a moment, seized as it were with cowardly shame in front of that ill-clad, ugly, derided devil. Then, becoming valiant as it were, it was his hand that she shook, the first amid all those well-dressed men, who opened their eyes in amazement. She laughed with an affectionate air, and spoke to him in a friendly, bantering way. Fagerolles, however, was already paying for the two chartreuses he had ordered, and at last he went off with Irma, whom Jory also decided to follow. Claude watched them walk away together, she between the two men, moving on in regal fashion, greatly admired and repeatedly bowed to by people in the crowd. "'One can see very well that Matilda isn't here,' quietly remarked Sandoz. "'Oh, my friend, what clouts Jory would receive on getting home!' The novelist now asked for the bill. All the tables were becoming vacant. There only remained a litter of bones and crusts. A couple of waiters were wiping the marble slabs with sponges, whilst a third raked up the soiled sand. Behind the brown serge hangings, the staff of the establishment was lunching. One could hear a grinding of jaws and husky laughter, a rumpus akin to that of a camp of gypsies devouring the contents of their saucepans. Claude and Sandoz went round the garden, where they discovered a statue by Mahoudot, very badly placed in a corner near the eastern vestibule. It was the bathing girl at last, standing erect, but of diminutive proportions, being scarcely as tall as a girl ten years old, but charmingly delicate, with slim hips and a tiny bosom, displaying all the exquisite hesitancy of a sprouting bud. The figure seemed to exhale a perfume, that grace which nothing can give, but which flowers where it lists, stubborn, invincible, perennial grace, springing still and ever from Mahoudot's thick fingers, which were so ignorant of their special aptitude, that they had long treated this very grace with derision. Sandoz could not help smiling. And to think that this fellow has done everything he could to warp his talent— if his figure were better placed, it would meet with great success. Yes, great success, repeated Claude. It is very pretty. Precisely at that moment they perceived Mahoudot, already in the vestibule and going towards the staircase. They called him, ran after him, and then all three remained talking together for a few minutes. The ground-floor gallery stretched away, empty, with its sanded pavement and the pale light streaming through its large round windows. One might have fancied oneself under a railway bridge. Strong pillars supported the metallic framework, and an icy chillness blew from above, moistening the sand in which one's feet sank. In the distance, behind a torn curtain, one could see rows of statues, the rejected sculptural exhibits, the casts which poor sculptors did not even remove, gathered together in a livid kind of morgue, in a state of lamentable abandonment. But what surprised one on raising one's head was the continuous din, the mighty tramp of the public over the flooring of the upper galleries. One was deafened by it. It rolled on without a pause, as if interminable trains, going at full speed, were ever and ever shaking the iron girders. When Mahoudot had been complimented, he told Claude that he had searched for his picture in vain. In the depths of what hole could they have put it? Then, in a fit of affectionate remembrance for the past, he asked anxiously, after Gagnière and Dubouche, where were the salons of yore which they had all reached in a band, the mad excursions through the galleries, as in an enemy's country, the violent disdain they had felt on going away? the discussions which had made their tongues swell and emptied their brains. Nobody now saw Dubouche. Two or three times a month, Gagnière came from Merlin, in a state of bewilderment, to attend some concert. 
and he now took such little interest in painting that he had not even looked in at the salon, although he exhibited his usual landscape, the same view of the banks of the Seine which he had been sending for the last fifteen years, a picture of a pretty greyish tint, so conscientious and quiet that the public had never remarked it. "'I was going upstairs,' resumed Maudot. "'Will you come with me?' Claude, pale with suffering, raised his eyes every second. Ah, that terrible rumbling, that devouring gallop of the monster overhead, the shock of which he felt in his very limbs. He held out his hand without speaking. What, are you going to leave us? exclaimed Sandoz. Take just another turn with us and we'll go away together. Then, on seeing Claude so weary, a feeling of pity made his heart contract. He divined that the poor fellow's courage was exhausted, that he was desirous of solitude, seized with a desire to fly off alone and hide his wound. Then good-bye, old man. I'll call and see you to-morrow. Staggering, and as if pursued by the tempest upstairs, Claude disappeared behind the clumps of shrubbery in the garden. But two hours later, Sandoz, who, after losing Maudot, had just found him again with Jory and Fagerolles, perceived the unhappy painter again standing in front of his picture, at the same spot where he had met him the first time. At the moment of going off, the wretched fellow had come up there again, harassed and attracted, despite himself. There was now the usual five o'clock crush. The crowd, weary of winding round the galleries, became distracted and pushed and shoved without ever finding its way out. Since the coolness of the morning, the heat of all the human bodies, the odour of all the breath exhaled there had made the atmosphere heavy, and the dust of the floors, flying about, rose up in a fine mist. People still took each other to see certain pictures, the subjects of which alone struck the attracted crowd. Some went off, came back, and walked about unceasingly. The women were particularly obstinate in not retiring. They seemed determined to remain there till the attendants should push them out when six o'clock began to strike. Some fat ladies had foundered. Others, who had failed to find even the tiniest place to sit down, leaned heavily on their parasols, sinking, but still obstinate. Every eye was turned anxiously and supplicatingly towards the settees laden with people, and all that those thousands of sightseers were now conscious of was that last fatigue of theirs which made their legs totter, drew their features together, and tortured them with headache, that headache peculiar to fine art shows, which is caused by the constant straining of one's neck and the blinding dance of colours. Alone on the little settee, where at noon already they had been talking about their private affairs, the two decorated gentlemen were still chatting quietly, with their minds a hundred leagues away from the place. Perhaps they had returned thither. Perhaps they had not even stirred from the spot. "'And so,' said the fat one, "'you went in, pretending not to understand?' "'Quite so,' replied the thin one. "'I looked at them and took off my hat. It was clear, eh?' "'Astonishing! You really astonish me, my dear friend!' Claude, however, only heard the low beating of his heart, and only beheld the dead child up there in the air near the ceiling. He did not take his eyes off it, a prey to a fascination which held him there, quite independent of his will. The crowd turned round him, people's feet trod on his own, he was pushed and carried away, and like some inert object he abandoned himself, waved about, and ultimately found himself again at the same spot as before, without having once lowered his head, quite ignorant of what was occurring below, all his life being concentrated up yonder beside his work, his little Jacques, swollen in death. Two big tears which stood motionless between his eyelids prevented him from seeing clearly, and it seemed to him as if he would never have time to see enough. Then Sandoz, in his deep compassion, pretended he did not perceive his old friend. It was as if he wished to leave him there, beside the tomb of his wrecked life. Their comrades once more went past in a band. Fagerolles and Jory darted on ahead, and Maudot, having asked Sandoz where Claude's picture was hung, the novelist told a lie, drew him aside and took him off. 
all of them went away. In the evening, Christine only managed to draw curt words from Claude. Everything was going on all right, said he. The public showed no ill humour. The picture had a good effect, though it was hung perhaps rather high up. However, despite this semblance of cold tranquillity, he seemed so strange that she became frightened. After dinner, as she returned from carrying the dirty plates into the kitchen, she no longer found him near the table. He had opened a window which overlooked some waste ground, and he stood there, leaning out to such a degree that she could scarcely see him. At this she sprang forward, terrified, and pulled him violently by his jacket. "'Claude, Claude, what are you doing?' He turned round, with his face as white as a sheet, and his eyes haggard. "'I'm looking,' he said. But she closed the window with trembling hands, and after that significant incident, such anguish clung to her that she no longer slept at night-time. End of chapter 10《ラプターイレブン》パート A。of his masterpiece by Emil Zola。translated by Ernest Alfred Vizetelli。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。read by Lisa Reichert。Claude set to work again on the very next day。and months elapsed。indeed the whole summer went by in heavy quietude。He had found a job, some little paintings of flowers for England, the proceeds of which sufficed for their daily bread. All his available time was again devoted to his large canvas, and he no longer went into the same fits of anger over it, but seemed to resign himself to that eternal task, evincing obstinate, hopeless industry. However, his eyes retained their crazy expression. One could see the death of light, as it were, in them. When they gazed upon the failure of his existence. About this period, Sandoz also experienced great grief. His mother died. His whole life was upset. That life of three together, so homely in its character and shared merely by a few friends. He began to hate the pavilion of the Rue Nollet, and moreover, success suddenly declared itself with respect to his books, which hitherto had sold but moderately well. So, prompted by the advent of comparative wealth, he rented in the Rue de Londres a spacious flat, the arrangements of which occupied him and his wife for several months. Sandoz's grief had drawn him closer to Claude again, both being disgusted with everything. After the terrible blow of the salon, the novelist had felt very anxious about his old chum, divining that something had irreparably snapped within him, that there was some wound by which life ebbed away unseen. Then, however, finding Claude so cold and quiet, he ended by growing somewhat reassured. Sandoz often walked up to the Rue Tourlac, and whenever he found only Christine at home, he questioned her, realizing that she also lived in apprehension of a calamity of which she never spoke. Her face bore a look of worry, and now and again she started nervously, like a mother who watches over her child, and trembles at the slightest sound, with the fear that death may be entering the chamber. One July morning Sandoz asked her, "'Well, are you pleased?' Claude's quiet, he works a great deal. She gave the large picture her usual glance, a side glance full of terror and hatred. Yes, yes, he works, she said. He wants to finish everything else before taking up the woman again. And without confessing the fear that harassed her, she added in a lower tone, But his eyes, have you noticed his eyes? They always have the same wild expression. I know very well that he lies, despite his pretense of taking things so easily. Pray come and see him and take him out with you, so as to change the current of his thoughts. He only has you left. Help me, do help me. After that, Sandoz diligently devised motives for various walks, arriving at Claude's early in the morning and carrying him away from his work perforce. It was almost always necessary to drag him from his steps, on which he habitually sat, even when he was not painting. 
A feeling of weariness stopped him. A kind of torpor benumbed him for long minutes, during which he did not give a single stroke with the brush. In those moments of mute contemplation, his gaze reverted with pious fervour to the woman's figure, which he no longer touched. It was like a hesitating desire, combined with sacred awe, a passion which he refused to satisfy, as he felt certain that it would cost him his life. When he set to work again at the other figures and the background of the picture, he well knew that the woman's figure was still there, and his gaze wavered whenever he espied it. He felt that he would only remain master of himself as long as he did not touch it again. One evening, Christine, who now visited at Sandoz's and never missed a single Thursday there, in the hope of seeing her big sick child of an artist brighten up in the society of his friends, took the novelist aside and begged him to drop in at their place on the morrow. And on the next day, Sandoz, who, as it happened, wanted to take some notes for a novel on the other side of Montmartre, went in search of Claude, carried him off, and kept him idling about until night-time. On this occasion they went as far as the gate of Grignancourt, where a perpetual fair was held, with merry-go-rounds, shooting galleries, and taverns. And on reaching the spot they were stupefied to find themselves face to face with Shane, who was enthroned in a large and stylish booth. It was a kind of chapel, highly ornamented, there were four circular revolving stands set in a row and loaded with articles in china and glass, all sorts of ornaments and knick-knacks, whose gilding and polish shone amid an harmonica-like tinkling whenever the hand of a gamester set the stand in motion. It then spun round, grating against a feather, which on the rotary movement ceasing, indicated what article, if any, had been won. The big prize was a live rabbit, adorned with pink favours, which waltzed and revolved unceasingly, intoxicated with fright. And all this display was set in red hangings, scalloped at the top. And between the curtains one saw three pictures, hanging at the rear of the booth, as in the sanctuary of some tabernacle. They were Shane's three masterpieces, which now followed him from fair to fair, from one end of Paris to the other. The woman taken in adultery in the centre, the copy of the Montaigne on the left, and Maudot's stove on the right. Of an evening, when the petroleum lamps flamed, and the revolving stands glowed and radiated like planets, Nothing seemed finer than those pictures, hanging amid the blood-tinged purple of the hangings, and a gaping crowd often flocked to view them. The sight was such that it wrung an exclamation from Claude. Oh, good heavens! But those paintings look very well. They were surely intended for this. The Montaigne, so naively harsh in treatment, looked like some faded coloured print nailed there for the delectation of simple-minded folk, whilst the minutely painted stove, all awry, hanging beside the gingerbread Christ absolving the adulterous woman, assumed an unexpectedly gay aspect. However, Shane, who had just perceived the two friends, held out his hand to them as if he had left them merely the day before. He was calm, neither proud nor ashamed of his booth, and he had not aged, having still a leathery aspect, though, on the other hand, his nose had completely vanished between his cheeks, whilst his mouth, clammy with prolonged silence, was buried in his moustache and beard. "'Hallo, so we meet again,' said Sandoz gaily. "'Do you know your paintings have a lot of effect?' "'The old humbug,' added Claude, why, he has his little salon all to himself. That's very cute indeed. Shane's face became radiant, and he dropped the remark, Of course. Then, as his artistic pride roused, he, from whom people barely wrung anything but growls, gave utterance to a whole sentence. Ah, it's quite certain that if I had had any money, like you fellows, I should have made my way, just as you have done, in spite of everything. That was his conviction. He had never doubted of his talent. He had simply forsaken the profession because it did not feed him. When he visited the Louvre, 
at sight of the masterpieces hanging there he felt convinced that time alone was necessary to turn out similar work ah me said claude who had become gloomy again don't regret what you've done you alone have succeeded business is brisk eh but shane muttered bitter words no no there was nothing doing not even in his line people wouldn't play for prizes all the money found its way to the wine shops in spite of buying paltry odds and ends and striking the table with the palm of one's hand so that the feather might not indicate one of the big prizes a fellow barely had water to drink nowadays then as some people had drawn near he stopped short in his explanation to call out walk up walk up at every turn you win in a gruff voice which the two others had never known him to possess and which fairly stupefied them a workman who was carrying a sickly little girl with large covetous eyes let her play two turns the revolving stands grated and the knick-knacks danced round in dazzling fashion while the live rabbit with his ears lowered revolved and revolved so rapidly that the outline of his body vanished and he became nothing but a whitish circle there was a moment of great emotion for the little girl had narrowly missed winning him then after shaking hands with shane who was still trembling with the fright this had given him the two friends walked away he's happy said claude after they had gone some fifty paces in silence he cried sandoz why he believes he has missed becoming a member of the institute and it's killing him shortly after this meeting and towards the middle of august sandoz devised a real excursion which would take up a whole day he had met dubouche dubouche careworn and mournful who had shown himself plaintive and affectionate raking up the past and inviting his two old chums to lunch at la richaudiere where he should be alone with his two children for another fortnight why shouldn't they go and surprise him there since he seemed so desirous of renewing the old intimacy but in vain did sandoz repeat that he had promised dubouche on oath to bring claude with him the painter obstinately refused to go as if he were frightened at the idea of again beholding bencourt the seine the islands all the stretch of country where his happy years lay dead and buried it was necessary for christine to interfere and he finished by giving way although full of repugnance to the trip it precisely happened that on the day prior to the appointment he had worked at his painting until very late being taken with the old fever again and so the next morning it was sunday being devoured with a longing to paint he went off most reluctantly tearing himself away from his picture with a pang what was the use of returning to bincourt all that was dead it no longer existed paris alone remained and even in paris there was but one view the point of the cite that vision which haunted him always and everywhere that one corner where he ever left his heart sandoz finding him nervous in the railway carriage and seeing that his eyes remained fixed on the window as if he had been leaving the city which had gradually grown smaller and seemed shrouded in mist for years did all he could to divert his mind telling him for instance what he knew about dubouche's real position at the outset old marguelin glorifying in his bemedalled son-in-law had trotted him about and introduced him everywhere as his partner and successor there was a fellow who could conduct business briskly who would build houses more cheaply and in finer style than ever for hadn't he grown pale over books but dubouche's first idea proved disastrous on some land belonging to his father-in-law in burgundy he established a brickyard in so unfavorable a situation and after so defective a plan that the venture resulted in the sheer loss of two hundred thousand francs then he turned his attention to erecting houses insisting upon bringing personal ideas into execution a certain general scheme of his which would revolutionize the building art these ideas were the old theories he held from the revolutionary chums of his youth everything that he had promised he would realize when he was free 
but he had not properly reduced the theories to method, and he applied them unreasonably, with the awkwardness of a pupil lacking the sacred fire. He experimented with terracotta and pottery ornamentation, large bay windows, and especially with the employment of iron, iron girders, iron staircases, and iron roofings. And as the employment of these materials increased the outlay, he again ended with a catastrophe which was all the greater as he was a pitiful manager, and had lost his head since he had become rich, rendered the more obtuse it seemed by money, quite spoilt and at sea, unable even to revert to his old habits of industry. This time Marguelon grew angry. He for thirty years had been buying ground, building and selling again, estimating at a glance the cost and return of house property. So many yards of building at so much the foot having to yield so many suites of rooms at so much rent. He wouldn't have anything more to do with a fellow who blundered about lime, bricks, millstones, and in fact everything, who employed oak when deal would have suited, and who could not bring himself to cut up a story, like a consecrated wafer, into as many little squares as was necessary. No, no, none of that. He rebelled against art, after having been ambitious to introduce a little of it into his routine, in order to satisfy a long-standing worry about his own ignorance. And after that, matters had gone from bad to worse. Terrible quarrels had arisen between son-in-law and father-in-law, the former disdainful, entrenching himself behind his science, and the latter shouting that the commonest labourer knew more than an architect did. The millions were in danger, and one fine day Marguelon turned de Bouche out of his offices, forbidding him ever to set foot in them again, since he did not even know how to direct a building yard where only four men worked. It was a disaster, a lamentable failure the school of arts collapsing, derided by a mason. At this point of Sandoz's story, Claude, who had begun to listen to his friend, inquired, Then what is Dubouche doing now? I don't know, nothing probably, answered Sandoz. He told me that he was anxious about his children's health, and he was taking care of them. That pale woman, Madame Marguelin, as slender as the knife of a blade, had died of tubercular consumption which was plainly the hereditary disease, the source of the family's degeneracy, for her daughter, Regine, had been coughing ever since her marriage. She was now drinking the waters at Mont d'Or, whither she had not dared to take her children, as they had been very poorly the year before, after a season spent in that part, where the air was too keen for them. This explained the scattering of the family, the mother over yonder with her maid, the grandfather in Paris, where he had resumed his great building enterprises, battling amid his four hundred workmen, and crushing the idle and the incapable beneath his contempt, and the father in exile at La Rouchaudière, set to watch over his son and daughter, shut up there after the very first struggle, as if it had broken him down for life. In a moment of effusion, de Bouche had even let Sandoz understand that as his wife was so extremely delicate, he now lived with her merely on friendly terms. A nice marriage, said Sandoz simply, by way of conclusion. It was ten o'clock when the two friends rang at the iron gate of La Rue Chaudière. The estate with which they were not acquainted amazed them. There was a superb park, a garden laid out in the French style, with balustrades and steps spreading away in regal fashion, three huge conservatories and a colossal cascade, quite a piece of folly with its rocks brought from afar, and the quantity of cement and the number of conduits that had been employed in arranging it. Indeed, the owner had sunk a fortune in it, out of sheer vanity. But what struck the friend still more was the melancholy, deserted aspect of the domain. The gravel of the avenues carefully raked with never a trace of footsteps, the distant expanses quite deserted save that now and then a solitary gardener passed by, and the house looking lifeless with all its windows closed, excepting two which were barely set ajar. However, a valet who had decided to show himself began to question them, and when he learnt that they wished to see Monsieur, 
he became insolent and replied that monsieur was behind the house in the gymnasium and then he went indoors again sandoz and claude followed a path which led them towards a lawn and what they saw there made them pause dubuche who stood in front of a trapeze was raising his arms to support his son gaston a poor sickly boy who at ten years of age still had the slight soft limbs of early childhood while the girl alice sat in a perambulator awaiting her turn she was so imperfectly developed that although she was six years old she could not yet walk the father absorbed in his task continued exercising the slim limbs of his little boy swinging him backwards and forwards and vainly trying to make him raise himself up by his wrists then as this slight effort sufficed to bring on perspiration he removed the little fellow from the trapeze and rolled him in a rug and all this was done amid complete silence alone under the far expanse of sky his face wearing a look of distressful pity as he knelt there in that splendid park however as he rose up he perceived the two friends what it's you on a sunday and without warning me he had made a gesture of annoyance and at once explained that the maid the only woman to whom he could trust the children went to paris on sundays and that it was consequently impossible for him to leave gaston and alice for a minute i'll wager that you came to lunch he added as claude gave sandoz an imploring glance the novelist made haste to answer no no as it happens we only have time enough to shake hands with you Claude had to come down here on a business matter. He lived at Bencourt, you know, and as I accompanied him, we took it into our heads to walk as far as here. But there are people waiting for us, so don't disturb yourself in the least. Thereupon, Dubouche, who felt relieved, made a show of detaining them. They certainly had an hour to spend, dash it all, and they all three began to talk. Claude looked at Dubouche, astonished to find him so aged. His flabby face had become wrinkled, it was a yellowish hue and streaked with red as if bile had splashed his skin whilst his hair and his moustaches were already growing grey in addition his figure appeared to have become more compact a bitter weariness made each of his gestures seem an effort were defeats in money matters as hard to bear then as defeats in art everything about this vanquished man his voice his glance proclaimed the shameful dependency in which he had to live the bankruptcy of his future which was cast in his teeth with the accusation of having allowed a talent he did not possess to be set down as an asset in the marriage contract then there was the family money which he nowadays stole the money spent on what he ate the clothes he wore and the pocket money he needed in fact the perpetual alms which were bestowed upon him just as they might have been bestowed upon some vulgar swindler whom one unluckily could not get rid of wait a bit resumed dubuche i have to stop here five minutes longer with one of my poor duckies and afterwards we'll go indoors gently and with infinite motherly precautions he removed little alice from the perambulator and lifted her to the trapeze then stammering coaxing words and smiling he encouraged her and left her hanging for a couple of minutes so as to develop her muscles but he remained with open arms watching each movement with the fear of seeing her smashed to pieces should her weak little wax-like hands relax their hold she did not say anything but obeyed him in spite of the terror that this exercise caused her and she was so pitifully light in weight that she did not even fully stretch the ropes being like one of those poor scraggy little birds which falls from a young tree without as much as bending it at this moment dubuche having given gaston a glance became distracted on remarking that the rug had slipped and that the child's legs were uncovered good heavens good heavens why he'll catch cold on this grass and i who can't move gaston my little dear it's the same thing every day you wait till i'm occupied with your sister sandoz pray cover him over oh thanks pull the rug up more don't be afraid so this was the outcome of his splendid marriage those two poor weak little beings whom the least breath from the sky threatened to kill like flies of the fortune he had married all that remained to him was the constant grief of beholding those woeful children stricken by the final degeneracy of scrofula and thesis
However, this big egotistical fellow showed himself an admirable father. The only energy that remained to him consisted in a determination to make his children live, and he struggled on hour after hour, saving them every morning and dreading to lose them every night. They alone existed now amid his finished existence, amid the bitterness of his father-in-law's insulting reproaches, the coldness of his sorry, ailing wife. And he kept to his task in desperation. He finished bringing those children into the world, as it were, by dint of unremitting tenderness. "'There, my darling, that's enough, isn't it?' he said. "'You'll soon see how big and pretty you'll become.' Then he placed Alice in the perambulator again, took Gaston, who was still wrapped up, on one of his arms, and when his friends wished to help him, he declined their offer, pushing the little girl's vehicle along with his right hand, which had remained free. "'Thanks,' he said. "'I'm accustomed to it. Ah, oh, the poor darlings are not heavy. And besides, with servants, one can never be sure of anything.' On entering the house, Sandoz and Claude again saw the valet who had been so insolent, and they noticed that Dubouche trembled before him. The kitchen and the hall shared the contempt of the father-in-law, who paid for everything, and treated Madame's husband like a beggar whose presence was merely tolerated out of charity. Each time that a shirt was got ready for him, each time that he asked for some more bread, the servant's impolite gestures made him feel that he was receiving alms. "'Well, good-bye, we must leave you,' said Sandoz, who suffered at the sight of it all. "'No, no, wait a bit. The children are going to breakfast, and afterwards I'll accompany you with them. They must go for their outing.' Each day was regulated hour by hour. Of a morning came the baths and the gymnastics, then the breakfast, which was quite an affair, as the children needed special food, which was duly discussed and weighed, and matters were carried to such a point that even their wine and water was slightly warmed, for fear that too chilly a drop might give them a cold. On this occasion they each partook of the yolk of an egg, diluted in some broth, and a mutton cutlet, which the father cut up into tiny morsels. Then, prior to the siesta, came the promenade. Sandoz and Claude found themselves once more out of doors, walking down the broad avenues with Dubouche, who again propelled Alice's perambulator, whilst Gaston walked beside him. They talked about the estate as they went towards the gate. The master glanced over the park with timid, nervous eyes, as if he did not feel at home. Besides, he did not know anything— he did not occupy himself about anything. He appeared even to have forgotten the profession which he was said to be ignorant of, and seemed to have gone astray, to be bowed down by sheer inaction. "'And your parents, how are they?' asked Sandoz. A spark was once more kindled in Dubouche's dim eyes. "'Oh, my parents are happy,' he said. "'I bought them a little house where they live on the annuity which I had specified in my marriage contract.' Well, you see, Mamma had advanced enough money for my education, and I had to return it to her as I had promised, eh? Yes, I can at least say that my parents have nothing to reproach me with. Having reached the gate, they tarried there for a few minutes. At last, still looking crushed, Dubouche shook hands with his two old comrades, and retaining Claude's hand in his, he concluded, as if making a simple statement of fact quite devoid of anger, Goodbye. Try to get out of worry. As for me, I've spoilt my life. And they watched him walk back towards the house, pushing the perambulator and supporting Gaston, who was already stumbling with fatigue. He, Dubouche, himself, having his back bent and the heavy tread of an old man. One o'clock was striking, and they both hurried down towards Bencourt, saddened and ravenous. But mournfulness awaited them there as well. A murderous blast had swept over the place. Both for sure, husband and wife, and old Porette were all dead, and the inn, having fallen into the hands of that goose Mely, was becoming repugnant with its filth and coarseness. An abominable repast was served them, an omelette with hairs in it, and cutlets, smelling of grease, in the centre of the common room to which an open window admitted the pestilential odour of a dung-heap, 
while the place was so full of flies that they positively blackened the tables. The heat of the burning afternoon came in with the stench, and Claude and Sandoz did not even feel the courage to order any coffee. They fled. "'And you used to extol old Mother Faucheur's almonds,' said Sandoz. "'The place is done for. We are going for a turn, eh?' Claude was inclined to refuse. Ever since the morning he had had but one idea, that of walking on as fast as possible, as if each step would shorten the disagreeable task and bring him back to Paris. His heart, his head, his whole being had remained there. He looked neither to right nor to left. He glided along without distinguishing aught of the fields or trees, having but one fixed idea in his brain, a prey to such hallucinations that at certain moments he fancied the point of the cité rose up and called to him from amid the vast expanse of stubble. However, Sandoz's proposal aroused memories in his mind, and, softening somewhat, he replied, Yes, that's it. We'll have a look. But as they advanced along the river bank, he became indignant and grieved. He could scarcely recognize the place. A bridge had been built to connect Bencourt with Bonnières, a bridge, good heavens, in the place of the old ferry boat grating against its chain, the old black boat which, cutting athwart the current, had been so full of interest to the artistic eye. Moreover, a dam established downstream at Porviers had raised the level of the river, most of the islands of yore were now submerged, and the little armlets of the streams had become broader. There were no more pretty nooks, no more rippling alleys amid which one could lose oneself. It was a disaster that inclined one to strangle all the river engineers. "'Why, that clump of pollards, still emerging from the water on the left,' cried Claude, "'was the Barou Island, where we used to chat together lying on the grass. You remember, don't you? Ah, oh, the scoundrels!' Sandoz, who could never see a tree felled without shaking his fist at the woodcutter, turned pale with anger, and felt exasperated that the authorities had thus dared to mutilate nature. Then, as Claude approached his old home, he became silent and his teeth clenched. The house had been sold to some middle-class folk, and now there was an iron gate against which he pressed his face. The rose-bushes were all dead, the apricot-trees were dead also. The garden, which looked very trim with its little pathways and its square-cut beds of flowers and vegetables, bordered with box, was reflected in a large ball of plated glass set upon a stand in the very centre of it all. And the house, newly whitewashed and painted at the corners and round the doors and windows in a manner to imitate freestone, suggested some clownish parvenu awkwardly arrayed in his Sunday toggery. The sight fairly enraged the painter. No, no, nothing of himself, nothing of Christine, nothing of the great love of their youth remained there. He wished to look still further. He turned round behind the house and sought for the wood of oak trees where they had left the living quiver of their embraces. But the wood was dead, dead like all the rest, failed, sold, and burnt. Then he made a gesture of anathema in which he cast all his grief to that stretch of country which was now so changed that he could not find in it one single token of his past life. And so a few years sufficed to efface the spot where one had laboured, loved, and suffered. What was the use of man's vain agitation, if the wind behind him swept and carried away all the traces of his footsteps? He had rightly realised that he ought not to return thither, for the past is simply the cemetery of our illusions, where our feet for ever stumble against tombstones. "'Let us go!' he cried. "'Let us go at once! It's stupid to torture one's heart like this!' When they were on the new bridge, Sandoz tried to calm him by showing him the view which had not formerly existed, the widened bed of the Seine, full to the brim, as it were, and the water flowing onward proudly and slowly. But this water failed to interest Claude, until he reflected that it was the same water which, as it passed through Paris, had bathed the old quay walls of the Cité. And then he felt touched. He leant over the parapet of the bridge for a moment, and thought that he could distinguish glorious reflections in it, the towers of Notre-Dame, and the needle-like spire of the Saint-Chapelle, 
carried along by the current towards the sea. The two friends missed the three o'clock train, and it was real torture to have to spend two long hours more in that region, where everything weighed so heavily on their shoulders. Fortunately they had forewarned Christine and Madame Sandoz that they might return by a night train if they were detained, so they resolved upon a bachelor dinner at a restaurant on the Place du Havre, hoping to set themselves all right again by a good chat at dessert, as in former times. Eight o'clock was about to strike when they sat down to table. Claude, on leaving the terminus with his feet once more on the Paris pavement, had lost his nervous agitation, like a man who at last finds himself once more at home. And with the cold, absent-minded air which he now usually displayed, he listened to Sandoz trying to enliven him. The novelist treated his friend like a mistress whose head he wished to turn. They partook of delicate, highly spiced dishes and heady wines. But mirth was rebellious, and Sandoz himself ended by becoming gloomy. All his hopes of immortality were shaken by his excursion to that ungrateful country village. That Bencour, so loved and so forgetful, where he and Claude had not found a single stone retaining any recollection of them. If things which are eternal forget so soon, how can one place any reliance for one hour on the memory of man? Do you know, old fellow, said the novelist, it's that which sometimes sends me into a cold sweat. Have you ever reflected that posterity may not be the faultless dispenser of justice that we dream of? One consoles oneself for being insulted and denied by relying on the equity of the centuries to come just as the faithful endure all the abominations of this earth in the firm belief of another life in which each will be rewarded according to his deserts. But suppose paradise exists no more for the artist than it does for the Catholic. Suppose that future generations prolong the misunderstanding and prefer amiable little trifles to vigorous works. Oh, what a sell it would be, eh, to have led a convict's life to have screwed oneself down to one's work, all for a mere delusion. Please notice that it's quite possible after all. There are some consecrated reputations which I wouldn't give a rap for. Classical education has deformed everything, and has imposed upon us as geniuses men of correct, facile talent who follow the beaten track. To them one may prefer men of free tendencies, whose work is at times unequal, but these are only known to a few people of real culture, so that it looks as if immortality might really go merely to the middle-class average talent, to the men whose names are forced into our brains at school, when we are not strong enough to defend ourselves. But no, no, one mustn't say those things. They make me shudder. Should I have the courage to go on with my task, should I be able to remain erect amid all the jeering around me, if I hadn't the consoling illusion that I shall some day be appreciated? Claude had listened with his dolorous expression, and he now made a gesture of indifference tinged with bitterness. Bah! What does it matter? Well, there's nothing hereafter. We are even madder than the fools who kill themselves for a woman. When the earth splits to pieces in space like a dry walnut, our works won't add one atom to its dust. That's quite true, summed up Sandoz, who was very pale. What's the use of trying to fill up the void of space? And to think that we know it, and that our pride still battles all the same. They left the restaurant, roamed about the streets, and foundered again in the depths of a café, where they philosophized. They had come by degrees to raking up the memories of their childhood, and this ended by filling their hearts with sadness. One o'clock in the morning struck when they decided to go home. However, Sandoz talked of seeing Claude as far as the Rue Tourlac. That August night was a superb one. The air was warm, the sky studded with stars, and as they went the round by way of the Quartier de l'Europe, they passed before the old Café Bolliquin on the Boulevard de Batignolles. It had changed hands three times. It was no longer arranged inside in the same manner as formerly. There were now a couple of billiard tables on the right hand, 
and several strata of customers had followed each other thither, one covering the other, so that the old frequenters had disappeared like buried nations. However, curiosity, the emotion they had derived from all the past things they had been raking up together, induced them to cross the boulevard and to glance into the café through the open doorway. They wanted to see their table of yore, on the left hand, right at the back of the room. "'Oh, look!' said Sandoz, stupefied. Gagnier, muttered Claude. "'It was indeed Gagnier, seated all alone at that table at the end of the empty café. He must have come from Malin for one of the Sunday concerts to which he treated himself, and then in the evening, while astray in Paris, an old habit of his legs had led him to the Café Baudequin. Not one of the comrades ever set foot there now, and he, who had beheld another age, obstinately remained there alone. He had not yet touched his glass of beer. He was looking at it, so absorbed in thought that he did not even stir when the waiters began piling the chairs on the tables, in order that everything might be ready for the morrow's sweeping. The two friends hurried off, upset by the sight of that dim figure, seized as it were with a childish fear of ghosts. They parted in the Rue Tourlac. Ah, oh, that poor devil Dubouche, said Sandoz, as he pressed Claude's hand. He spoilt our day for us. End of chapter 11, part A Chapter 11, Part B of His Masterpiece by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. As soon as November had come round, and when all the old friends were back in Paris again, Sandoz thought of gathering them together at one of those Thursday dinners which had remained a habit with him. They were always his greatest delight. The sale of his books was increasing, and he was growing rich. The flat in the Rue de Londres was becoming quite luxurious compared with the little house at Batignolles. But he himself remained immutable. On this occasion he was anxious, in his good nature, to procure real enjoyment for Claude by organizing one of the dear evenings of their youth. So he saw to the invitations. Claude and Christine naturally must come. Next, Jory and his wife, the latter of whom it had been necessary to receive since her marriage. Then Dubouche, who always came alone, with Fagerolles, Mahoudot, and finally Gagnier. There would be ten of them, all the men comrades of their old band, without a single outsider, in order that the good understanding and jollity might be complete. Henriette, who was more mistrustful than her husband, hesitated when this list of guests was decided upon. Oh, Fagerolles? You believe in having Fagerolles with the others? They hardly like him, nor Claude either. I fancied I noticed a coolness, but he interrupted her, bent on not admitting it. What, a coolness? It's really funny, but women can't understand that fellows chaff each other. All that doesn't prevent them from having their hearts in the right place. Henriette took special care in preparing the menu for that Thursday dinner. She now had quite a little staff to overlook, a cook, a man-servant, and so on, and if she no longer prepared any of the dishes herself, she still saw that very delicate fare was provided, out of affection for her husband, whose sole vice was gluttony. She went to market with the cook, and called in person on the tradespeople. She and her husband had a taste for gastronomic curiosities from the four corners of the world. On this occasion they decided to have some oxtail soup, grilled mullet, undercut of beef with mushrooms, raviolis in the Italian fashion, hazel hens from Russia, and a salad of truffles without counting caviar and kilkis as side dishes, and a glass proline and a little emerald-coloured Hungarian cheese, with fruit and pastry. As wine, some old Bordeaux claret in decanters, chambertin with the roast, and sparkling moselle at dessert in lieu of champagne, which was voted commonplace. 
At seven o'clock, Sandoz and Henriette were waiting for their guests, he simply wearing a jacket, and she looking very elegant in a plain dress of black satin. People dined at their house in frock coats without any fuss. The drawing-room, the arrangements of which they were now completing, was becoming crowded with old furniture, old tapestry, knick-knacks of all countries and all times. A rising and now overflowing stream of things which had taken source at Batignolles, with an old pot of Rouen ware, which Henriette had given her husband on one of his fete days. They ran about to the curiosity shops together. A joyful passion for buying possessed them. Sandoz satisfied the longings of his youth, the romanticist ambitions which the first books he had read had given birth to. Thus this writer, so fiercely modern, lived amid the worm-eaten Middle Ages, which he had dreamt of when he was a lad of fifteen. As an excuse, he laughingly declared that handsome modern furniture cost too much, whilst with old things, even common ones, you immediately obtained something with effect and colour. There was nothing of the collector about him. He was entirely concerned as to decoration and broad effects. And to tell the truth, the drawing-room, lighted by two lamps of old Delftware, had quite a soft, warm tint, with the dull gold of the dalmaticus used for upholstering the seats, the yellowish incrustations of the Italian cabinets and Dutch showcases, the faded hues of the oriental door hangings, the hundred little notes of the ivory, crockery, and enamel work, pale with age, which showed against the dull red hangings of the room. Claude and Christine were the first to arrive. The latter had put on her only silk dress, an old worn-out garment which she preserved with special care for such occasions. Henriette at once took hold of both her hands and drew her to a sofa. She was very fond of her and questioned her, seeing her so strange, touchingly pale and with anxious eyes. What was the matter? Did she feel poorly? No, no, she answered that she was very gay and very pleased to come. But while she spoke, she kept on glancing at Claude, as if to study him, and then looking away. He seemed excited, evincing a feverishness in his words and gestures which he had not shown for a month past. At intervals, however, his agitation subsided, and he remained silent, with his eyes wide open, gazing vacantly into space at something which he fancied was calling him. "'Ah, old man,' he said to Sandoz, "'I finished reading your book last night. "'It's deucedly clever. "'You have shut up their mouths this time.' "'They both talked standing in front of the chimney-piece, "'where some logs were blazing. "'Sandoz had indeed just published a new novel, "'and although his critics did not disarm, "'there was at last that stir of success "'which establishes a man's reputation "'despite the persistent attacks of his adversaries. "'Besides, he had no illusions.' He knew very well that the battle, even if it were won, would begin again at each fresh book he wrote. The great work of his life was advancing, that series of novels which he launched forth in volumes one after another, in stubborn, regular fashion, marching towards the goal he had selected, without letting anything, obstacles, insults, or fatigue, conquer him. "'It's true,' he gaily replied. "'They are weakening this time.' There's even one who's been foolish enough to admit that I'm an honest man. See how everything degenerates. Well, they'll make up for it, never fear. I know some of them whose nuts are too much unlike my own to let them accept my literary formula, my boldness of language, and my philosophical characters acting under the influence of circumstances. And I refer to brother writers who possess self-respect. I leave the fools and the scoundrels on one side." For a man to be able to work on pluckily, it is best for him to expect neither good faith nor justice. To be in the right, he must begin by dying. At this, Claude's eyes abruptly turned towards a corner of the drawing-room, as if to pierce the wall and go far away yonder, whither something had summoned him. Then they became hazy and returned from their journey, whilst he exclaimed, "'Oh, you speak for yourself. I should do wrong to kick the bucket.' No matter, your book set me into a deuced fever. I wanted to paint today, but I couldn't. Oh, it's lucky that I can't get jealous of you, else you would make me too unhappy. However, the door had opened, and Mathilde came in, followed by Jory. 
She was richly attired in a tunic of nasturtium-hued velvet and a skirt of straw-coloured satin, with diamonds in her ears and a large bouquet of roses on her bosom. What astonished Claude the most was that he did not recognise her, for she had become plump, round and fair-skinned, instead of thin and sunburnt, as he had known her. Her disturbing ugliness had departed in a swelling of the face. Her mouth, once noted for its black voids, now displayed teeth which looked over-white whenever she condescended to smile, with a disdainful curling of the upper lip. You could guess that she had become immoderately respectable. Her five-and-forty summers gave her weight beside her husband, who was younger than herself and seemed to be her nephew. The only thing of yore that clung to her was a violent perfume. She drenched herself with the strongest essences, as if she had been anxious to wash from her skin the smell of all the aromatic simples with which she had been impregnated by her herbalist business. However, the sharpness of rhubarb, the bitterness of elder seed, and the warmth of peppermint clung to her, and as soon as she crossed the drawing-room it was filled with an undefinable smell like that of a chemist's shop, relieved by an acute odour of musk. Henriette, who had risen, made her sit down beside Christine, saying, "'You know each other, don't you? You have already met here.' Matilda gave but a cold glance at the modest attire of that woman who had lived for a long time with a man, so it was said, before being married to him. She herself was exceedingly rigid respecting such matters, since the tolerance prevailing in literary and artistic circles had admitted her to a few drawing-rooms. Henriette hated her, however, and after the customary exchange of courtesies, not to be dispensed with, resumed her conversation with Christine. Jory had shaken hands with Claude and Sandoz, and standing near them in front of the fireplace, he apologized for an article slashing the novelist's new book, which had appeared that very morning in his review. "'As you know very well, my dear fellow, one is never the master in one's own house.' I ought to see to everything, but I have so little time. I hadn't even read that article. I relied on what had been told me about it. So you will understand how enraged I was when I read it this afternoon. I'm dreadfully grieved, dreadfully grieved. Oh, let it be. It's the natural order of things, replied Sandoz quietly. Now that my enemies are beginning to praise me, it's only proper that my friends should attack me. The door again opened, and Gagnier glided in softly, like a will-o'-the-wisp. He had come straight from Melon, and was quite alone, for he never showed his wife to anybody. When he thus came to dinner, he brought the country dust with him on his boots, and carried it back with him the same night on taking the last train. On the other hand, he did not alter, or rather, age seemed to rejuvenate him. His complexion became fairer as he grew old. "'Allo! Why, Gagnère's here!' exclaimed Sandoz. Then, just as Gagnère was making up his mind to bow to the ladies, Maudot entered. He had already grown grey, with a sunken, fierce-looking face and childish, blinking eyes. He still wore trousers which were a good deal too short for him, and a frock coat which creased in the back, in spite of the money which he now earned. For the bronze manufacturer for whom he worked— had brought out some charming statuettes of his, which one began to see on middle-class mantel-shelves and consoles. Sandoz and Claude had turned round, inquisitive to witness the meeting between Maudot and Mathilde. However, matters passed off very quietly. The sculptor bowed to her respectfully, while Jory, the husband, with his air of serene unconsciousness, thought fit to introduce her to him, for the twentieth time, perhaps, "'Hey, it's my wife, old fellow. Shake hands together.' Thereupon, both very grave, like people of society who are forced somewhat over-promptly into familiarity, Mathilde and Maudot shook hands. Only as soon as the latter had got rid of the job and had found Gagnière in a corner of the drawing-room, they both began sneering and recalling in terrible language all the abominations of yore. Dubouche was expected that evening, for he formally promised to come. Yes, explained Henriette, there will only be nine of us. 
Fagerol wrote this morning to apologize. He is forced to go to some official dinner, but he hopes to escape and will join us at about eleven o'clock. At that moment, however, a servant came in with a telegram. It was from Dubouche, who wired, Impossible to stir. Alice has an alarming cough. Well, we shall only be eight, then, returned Henriette, with the somewhat peevish resignation of a hostess disappointed by her guests. And the servant, having opened the dining-room door and announced that dinner was ready, she added, We are all here. Claude, offer me your arm. Sandoz took Mathilde's, Jory charged himself with Christine, while Mahoudeau and Gagnière brought up the rear, still joking coarsely, about what they called the beautiful herbalist's padding. The dining-room which they now entered was very spacious, and the light was gaily bright after the subdued illumination of the drawing-room. The walls, covered with specimens of old earthenware, displayed a gay medley of colours, reminding one of cheap coloured prints. Two sideboards, one laden with glass and the other with silver plate, sparkled like jewellers' showcases, and in the centre of the room, under the big hanging lamp girt round with tapers, the table glistened like a catafalque with the whiteness of its cloth, laid in perfect style with decorated plates, cut glass decanters white with water or ruddy with wine, and symmetrical side dishes, all set out around the centerpiece, a silver basket full of purple roses. They sat down, Henriette between Claude and Mahoudeau, Sandoz with Mathilde and Christine beside him, Jory and Gagnière at either end, and the servant had barely finished serving the soup when Madame Jory made a most unfortunate remark. Wishing to show herself amiable, and not having heard her husband's apologies, she said to the master of the house, "'Well, were you pleased with the article in this morning's number? Edouard personally revised the proofs with the greatest care.' On hearing this, Jory became very much confused and stammered, "'No, no, you are mistaken. It was a very bad article indeed, and you know very well that it was passed the other evening while I was away.' By the silent embarrassment which ensued, she guessed her blunder. But she made matters still worse, for, giving her husband a sharp glance, she retorted in a very loud voice, so as to crush him, as it were, and disengage her own responsibility. "'Another of your lies! I repeat what you told me. I won't allow you to make me ridiculous, do you hear?' This threw a chill over the beginning of the dinner. Henriette recommended the Kilkis, but Christine alone found them very nice. When the grilled mullet appeared, Sandoz, who was amused by Jory's embarrassment, gaily reminded him of a lunch they had had together, at Marseille in the old days. Ah, Marseille, the only city where people know how to eat. Claude, who for a little while had been absorbed in thought, now seemed to awaken from a dream, and without any transition he asked, is it decided? Have they selected the artists for the new decorations of the Hôtel de Ville? No, said Mahoudeau, they are going to do so. I shan't get anything, for I don't know anybody. Fagerolles himself is very anxious. If he isn't here tonight, it's because matters are not going smoothly. Ah, he has had his bite at the cherry. All that painting for millions is cracking to bits." There was a laugh, expressive of spite, finally satisfied, and even Gagnière at the other end of the table joined in the sneering. Then they eased their feelings in malicious words, and rejoiced over the sudden fall of prices which had thrown the world of young masters into consternation. It was inevitable, the predicted time was coming, the exaggerated rise was about to finish in a catastrophe. Since the amateurs had been panic-stricken, seized with consternation like that of speculators when a slump sweeps over a stock exchange, prices were giving way day by day, and nothing more was sold. It was a sight to see the famous Naudet amid the rout. He had held out at first, he had invented the Dodge of the Yankee, the unique picture hidden deep in some gallery, in solitude like an idol the picture of which he would not name the price, being contemptuously certain that he could never find a man rich enough to purchase it, but which he finally sold for two or three hundred thousand francs to some pig-dealer of Chicago, who felt glorious at carrying off the most expensive canvas of the year. 
but those fine strokes of business were not to be renewed at present, and no day, whose expenditure had increased with his gains, drawn on and swallowed up in the mad craze which was his own work, could now hear his regal mansion crumbling beneath him, and was reduced to defend it against the assault of creditors. "'Won't you take some more mushrooms, Maudot?' obligingly interrupted Henriette. The servant was now handing round the undercut. They ate and emptied the decanters, but their bitterness was so great that the best things were offered without being tasted, which distressed the master and mistress of the house. "'Mushrooms, eh?' the sculptor ended by repeating. "'No, thanks.' And he added, "'The funny part of it all is that Naudet is suing Fagerolles. Oh, quite so. He's going to distrain on him. Oh, it makes me laugh. We shall see a pretty scouring in the Avenue de Villiers, among all those petty painters with mansions of their own. House property will go for nothing next spring. Well, Naudet, who had compelled Fagerolles to build a house, and who furnished it for him as he would have furnished a place for a hussy, wanted to get hold of his knick-knacks and hangings again. But Fagerolles had borrowed money on them, so it seems. You can imagine the state of affairs. The dealer accuses the artist of having spoiled his game by exhibiting with the vanity of a giddy fool, while the painter replies that he doesn't mean to be robbed any longer. And they'll end by devouring each other. At least I hope so. Gagnier raised his voice the gentle but inexorable voice of a dreamer just awakened. Fagerolles is done for. Besides, he never had any success. The others protested. Well, what about the hundred thousand francs worth of pictures he had sold a year, and his medals and his cross of the Legion of Honour? But Gagnier, still obstinate, smiled with a mysterious air, as if facts could not prevail against his inner conviction. He wagged his head and, full of disdain, replied, let me be. He never knew anything about chiaroscuro. Jory was about to defend the talent of Fagerolles, whom he considered to be his own creation, when Henriette solicited a little attention for the raviolis. There was a short slackening of the quarrel amid the crystalline clinking of the glasses and the light clatter of the forks. The table, laid with such fine symmetry, was already in confusion, and seemed to sparkle still more amid the ardent fire of the quarrel, and Sandoz, growing anxious, felt astonished. What was the matter with them all that they attacked Fagerol so harshly? Hadn't they all begun together, and were they not all to reach the goal in the same victory? For the first time a feeling of uneasiness disturbed his dream of eternity, that delight in his Thursdays, which he had pictured following one upon another, all alike, all of them happy ones, into the far distance of the future. But the feeling was as yet only skin deep, and he laughingly exclaimed, "'Husband your strength, Claude, here are the hazel hens. Eh, Claude, where are you?' Since silence had prevailed, Claude had relapsed into his dream, gazing about him vacantly, and taking a second helping of raviolis without knowing what he was about. Christine, who said nothing, but sat there looking sad and charming, did not take her eyes off him. He started when Sandoz spoke, and chose a leg from amid the bits of hazel hen now being served, the strong fumes of which filled the room with a resinous smell. "'Do you smell that?' exclaimed Sandoz, amused. "'One would think one were swallowing all the forests of Russia.' But Claude returned to the matter which worried him. "'Then you say that Fagerol will be entrusted with the paintings of the Municipal Council's assembly room?' And this remark sufficed. Maudot and Gagnier, set on the track, at once started off again. Ah, a nice wishy-washy smearing it would be if that assembly room were allotted to him. And he was doing plenty of dirty things to get it. He who had formerly pretended to spit on orders for work like a great artist surrounded by amateurs, was basely cringing to the officials, now that his pictures no longer sold. Could anything more despicable be imagined than a painter soliciting a functionary, bowing and scraping, showing all kinds of cowardice and making all kinds of concessions? It was shameful that art should be dependent upon a minister's idiotic good pleasure— Fagerolles, at that official dinner he had gone to, was no doubt conscientiously licking the boots of some chief clerk, some idiot, who was only fit to be made a guy of. Well, said Jory, 
he affects his purpose, and he's quite right. You won't pay his debts. Debts? Have I any debts? I, who have always starved? Answered Maudot in a roughly arrogant tone. Ought a fellow to build himself a palace and spend money on creatures like that Irma Bayco, who's running Fagerolles? At this, Jory grew angry while the others jested, and Irma's name went flying over the table. But Mathilde, who had so far remained reserved and silent by way of making a show of good breeding, became intensely indignant. "'Oh, gentlemen, oh, gentlemen!' she exclaimed. "'To talk before us about that creature. No, not that creature. I implore you!' After that, Henriette and Sandoz, who were in consternation, witnessed the rout of their menu. The truffle salad, the ice, the dessert, everything was swallowed without being at all appreciated amidst the rising anger of the quarrel, and the chambertin and sparkling moselle were imbibed as if they had merely been water. In vain did Henriette smile, while Sandoz good-naturedly tried to calm them by making allowances for human weakness. Not one of them retreated from his position. A single word made them spring upon each other. There was none of the vague boredom, the somniferous satiety, which at times had saddened their old gatherings. At present there was real ferocity in the struggle, a longing to destroy one another. The tapers of the hanging lamp flared up. The painted flowers of the earthenware on the walls bloomed. The table seemed to have caught fire amid the upsetting of its symmetrical arrangements and the violence of the talk, that demolished onslaught of chatter which had filled them with fever for a couple of hours past. And amid the racket, when Henriette made up her mind to rise so as to silence them, Claude at length remarked, Ah, if I only had the Hôtel de Ville work, and if I could... It used to be my dream to cover all the walls of Paris. They returned to the drawing-room, where the little chandelier and the bracket candelabra had just been lighted. It seemed almost cold there in comparison with the kind of hothouse which had just been left, and for a moment the coffee calmed the guests. Nobody beyond Fagerolles was expected. The house was not an open one by any means. The Sandozes did not recruit literary dependents or muzzle the press by dint of invitations. The wife detested society, and the husband said with a laugh that he needed ten years to take a liking to anybody, and then he must like him always. But was not that real happiness seldom realized? A few sound relationships had a nook full of family affection. No music was ever played there and nobody had ever read a page of his composition aloud. On that particular Thursday the evening seemed a long one, on account of the persistent irritation of the men. The ladies had begun to chat before the smouldering fire, and when the servant, after clearing the table, reopened the door of the dining-room, they were left alone, the men repairing to the adjoining apartment to smoke and sip some beer. Sandoz and Claude, who were not smokers, soon returned, however, and sat down side by side on a sofa near the doorway. The former, who was glad to see his old friend excited and talkative, recalled the memories of Plasson, apropos of a bit of news he had learnt the previous day. Pouillard, the old jester of their dormitory, who had become so grave a lawyer, was now in trouble over some adventure with a woman. Ah, that brute of a Pouillard! But Claude did not answer, for, having heard his name mentioned in the dining-room, he listened attentively, trying to understand. Jory, Maudot, and Gagnard, unsatiated and eager for another bite, had started at the massacre again. Their voices, at first mere whispers, gradually grew louder, till at last they began to shout. "'Oh, the man! I abandon the man to you,' says Jory, who was speaking of Fagerolles. He isn't worth much, and he outgeneraled you, it's true. Ah, how he did get the better of you fellows by breaking off from you and carving success for himself on your backs. You were certainly not at all cute. Maudot, waxing furious, replied, Of course, it sufficed for us to be with Claude, to be turned away everywhere. It was Claude who did for us, so Gagnier squarely asserted. 
and thus they went on, relinquishing Fagerolles, whom they reproached for toadying the newspapers, for allying himself with their enemies, and wheedling sexagenarian baronesses, to fall upon Claude, who now became the great culprit. Well, after all, the other was only a hussy, one of the many found in the artistic fraternity, fellows who accost the public at street corners, leave their comrades in the lurch, and victimize them so as to get the bourgeois into their studios. But Claude, that abortive great artist, that impotent fellow who couldn't set a figure on its legs in spite of all his pride, hadn't he utterly compromised them? Hadn't he let them in altogether? Ah, yes, success might have been won by breaking off. If they had been able to begin over again, they wouldn't have been idiots enough to cling obstinately to impossible principles. And they accused Claude of having paralyzed them, of having traded on them, yes, traded on them, but in so clumsy and dull-witted a manner that he himself had not derived any benefit by it. Why, as for me, resumed Maudot, didn't he make me quite idiotic at one moment? When I think of it, I sound myself and remain wondering why I ever joined his band. Am I at all like him? Was there ever any one thing in common between us, eh? Well, it's exasperating to find the truth out so late in the day. And as for myself, said Gagnière, he robbed me of my originality. Do you think it has amused me each time I have exhibited a painting during the last fifteen years to hear people saying behind me, That's a Claude. Oh, I've had enough of it. I prefer not to paint any more. All the same, if I had seen clearly in former times, I shouldn't have associated with him. It was a stampede, the snapping of the last ties in their stupefaction at suddenly finding that they were strangers and enemies, after a long youth of fraternity together. Life had disbanded them on the road, and the great dissimilarity of their characters stood revealed. All that remained in them was the bitterness left by the old enthusiastic dream, that erstwhile hope of battle and victory to be won side by side, which now increased their spite. The fact is, sneered Jory, that Fagerol did not let himself be pillaged like a simpleton. But Maudot, feeling vexed, became angry. You do wrong to laugh, he said, for you are a nice backslider yourself. Yes, you always told us that you would give us a lift up when you had a paper of your own. Ah, allow me, allow me. Gagnière, however, united with Maudot. That's quite true, he said. You can't say any more that what you write about us is cut out, for you are the master now. And yet never a word. You didn't even name us in your articles on the last salon. Then Jory, embarrassed and stammering, in his turn flew into a rage. Ah, well, it's the fault of that cursed Claude. I don't care to lose my subscribers simply to please you fellows. It's impossible to do anything for you. There, do you understand? You, Maudot, may wear yourself out in producing pretty little things. You, Gagnier, may even never do anything more. But you each have a label on the back, and you'll need ten years' effort before you'll be able to get it off. In fact, there have been some labels that would never come off. The public is amused by it, you know. There were only you fellows to believe in the genius of that big ridiculous lunatic who will be locked up in a madhouse one of these fine mornings. Then the dispute became terrible. They all three spoke at once, coming at last to abominable reproaches, with such outbursts and such furious motion of the jaw that they seemed to be biting one another. Sandoz, seated on the sofa and disturbed in the gay memories he was recalling, was at last obliged to lend an ear to the tumult, which reached him through the open doorway. "'You hear them?' whispered Claude with a dolorous smile. "'They are giving it me nicely. No, no, stay here. I won't let you stop them. I deserve it since I have failed to succeed.' And Sandoz, turning pale, remained there, listening to that bitter quarrelling, the outcome of the struggle for life, that grappling of conflicting personalities, which bore all his chimera of everlasting friendship away. Henriette, fortunately, became anxious on hearing the violent shouting. She rose and went to shame the smokers for thus forsaking the ladies to go and quarrel together. They then returned to the drawing-room, perspiring, breathing hard, and still shaken by their anger. 
and as Harriet, with her eyes on the clock, remarked that they certainly would not see Fagerolles that evening, they began to sneer again, exchanging glances. Ah, he had a fine scent, and no mistake. He wouldn't be caught associating with old friends who had become troublesome and whom he hated. In fact, Fagerolles did not come. The evening finished laboriously. They once more went back to the dining-room, where the tea was served on a Russian tablecloth embroidered with a stag-hunt in red thread, and under the tapers a plain cake was displayed, with plates full of sweet stuff and pastry, and a barbarous collection of liqueurs and spirits, whisky, hollands, shioreki, and kumel. The servant also brought some punch, and bestirred himself round the table while the mistress of the house filled the teapot from the samovar boiling in front of her. But all the comfort, all the feast for the eyes and the fine perfume of the tea, did not move their hearts. The conversation again turned on the success that some men achieved, and the ill luck that befell others. For instance, was it not shameful that art should be dishonoured by all those medals, all those crosses, all those rewards which were so badly distributed to boot? Were artists always to remain like little boys at school? All the universal platitude came from the docility and cowardice which were shown, as in the presence of ushers, so as to obtain good marks. They had repaired to the drawing-room once more, and Sandoz, who was greatly distressed, had begun to wish that they would take themselves off, when he noticed Mathilde and Gagnière seated side by side on a sofa, and talking laughingly of music, while the others remained exhausted, lacking saliva and power of speech. Gagnère philosophized and poetized in a state of ecstasy, while Mathilde rolled up her eyes and went into raptures, as if titillated by some invisible wing. They had caught sight of each other on the previous Sunday at the concert at the Cirque, and they apprised each other of their enjoyment in alternate, far-soaring sentences. "'Ah, that Meyer beer, monsieur! The overture of Struensi! That funeral strain! And then that peasant dance!' so full of dash and colour, and then the mournful burden which returns, the duo of the violoncellos. Ah, oh, monsieur, the violoncellos, the violoncellos! And Berlioz, madame, the festival air in Romeo. Oh, the solo of the clarinets, the beloved women with the harp accompaniment. Something enrapturing, something white as snow which ascends. The festival bursts upon you like a picture by Paul Veronese, with the tumultuous magnificence of the marriage of Cana. And then the love song begins again. Ah, oh, how softly! Oh, always higher, higher still! Did you notice, monsieur, in Beethoven's Symphony in A, that knell which ever and ever comes back and beats upon your heart? Yes, I see very well you feel as I do. Music is a communion. Beethoven, ah me, how sad and sweet it is to be too to understand him and give way. And Schumann, madame, and Wagner, madame. Schumann's reverie, nothing but the stringed instruments, a warm shower falling on scacia leaves, a sunray which dries them, barely a tear in space. Wagner, ah, Wagner, the overture of the Flying Dutchman, are you not fond of it? Tell me you are fond of it. As for myself, it overcomes me. There is nothing left, nothing left. One expires. Their voices died away. They did not even look at each other, but sat there elbow to elbow with their faces turned upward, quite overcome. Sandoz, who was surprised, asked himself where Matilda could have picked up that jargon, in some article of Jory's, perhaps. Besides, he had remarked that women talk music very well, even without knowing a note of it, and he, whom the bitterness of the others had only grieved, became exasperated at sight of Matilda's languishing attitude. No, no, that was quite enough. The men tore each other to bits. Still, that might pass, after all. But what an end to the evening it was, that feminine fraud, cooing and titillating herself with thoughts of Beethoven's and Schumann's music. Fortunately, Gagnière suddenly rose. He knew what o'clock it was even in the depths of his ecstasy, 
and he had only just time left him to catch his last train. So, after exchanging nerveless and silent handshakes with the others, he went off to sleep at Melun. "'What a failure he is!' muttered Maudo. "'Music has killed painting. He'll never do anything.' He himself had to leave, and the door had scarcely closed behind his back when Jory declared, "'Have you seen his last paperweight? He'll end by sculpturing sleeve-links. There's a fellow who has missed his mark. To think he prided himself on being vigorous!' But Mathilde was already afoot, taking leave of Christine with a curt little inclination of the head, affecting social familiarity with Henriette, and carrying off her husband, who helped her on with her cloak in the ante-room, humble and terrified at the severe glance she gave him, for she had an account to settle. Then, the door having closed behind them, Sandoz, beside himself, cried out, "'That's the end! The journalist was bound to call the others abortions. Yes, the journalist, who, after patching up articles, has fallen to trading upon public credulity.' Ah, luckily there's Mathilde the Avengeress. Of the guests, Christine and Claude alone were left. The latter, since the drawing-room had been growing empty, had remained ensconced in the depths of an armchair, no longer speaking, but overcome by that species of magnetic slumber which stiffened him and fixed his eyes on something far away beyond the walls. He protruded his face. A convulsive kind of attention seemed to carry it forward. He certainly beheld something invisible, and heard a summons in the silence. Christine, having risen in her turn, and apologized for being the last to leave, Henriette took hold of her hands, repeated how fond she was of her, begged her to come and see her frequently, and to dispose of her in all things as she would with a sister. But Claude's sorrowful wife, looking so sadly charming in her black dress, shook her head with a pale smile. Come, said Sandoz in her ear, after giving a glance at Claude, you mustn't distress yourself like that. He has talked a great deal. He has been gayer this evening. He's all right. But in a terrified voice she answered, No, no, look at his eyes. I shall tremble as long as he has eyes like that. You have done all you could, thanks. What you haven't done, no one will do. Oh, how I suffer at being unable to hope, at being unable to do anything. Then, in a loud tone, she asked, Are you coming, Claude? She had to repeat her question twice, for at first he did not hear her. He ended by starting, however, and rose to his feet, saying, as if he had answered the summons from the horizon afar, Yes, I'm coming, I'm coming. When Sandoz and his wife at last found themselves alone in the drawing-room, where the atmosphere now was stifling, heated by the lights and heavy as it were, with melancholy silence after all the outbursts of the quarrelling, they looked at one another and let their arms fall, quite heart-rent by the unfortunate issue of their dinner-party. Henriette tried to laugh it off, however, murmuring, "'I warned you. I quite understood.' but he interrupted her with a despairing gesture. What? Was that then the end of his long illusion, that dream of eternity which had made him set happiness in a few friendships formed in childhood and shared until extreme old age? Ah, oh, what a wretched band! What a final rending! What a terrible balance sheet to weep over after that bankruptcy of the human heart! and he grew astonished on thinking of the friends who had fallen off by the roadside, of the great affections lost on the way, of the others unceasingly changing around himself, in whom he found no change. His poor Thursdays filled him with pity. So many memories were in mourning. It was the slow death of all that one loves. Would his wife and himself have to resign themselves to live as in a desert, to cloister themselves in utter hatred of the world? Ought they rather to throw their doors wide open to a throng of strangers and indifferent folk? By degrees a certainty dawned in the depths of his grief. Everything ended and nothing began again in life. He seemed to yield to evidence, and heaving a big sigh, exclaimed, You were right. We won't invite them to dinner again. 
they would devour one another. As soon as Claude and Christine reached the Place de la Trinité on their way home, the painter let go of his wife's arm, and, stammering that he had to go somewhere, he begged her to return to the Rue Tourlac without him. She had felt him shuddering, and she remained quite scared with surprise and fear. Somewhere to go at that hour, past midnight. Where had he to go, and what for? He had turned round and was making off, when she overtook him, and, pretending that she was frightened, begged that he would not leave her to climb up to Montmartre alone at that time of night. This consideration alone brought him back. He took her arm again. They ascended the Rue Blanche and the Rue Lépique, and at last found themselves in the Rue Tourlac. And on reaching their door he rang the bell, and then again left her. "'Here you are,' he said. "'I'm going.' He was already hastening away, taking long strides, and gesticulating like a madman. Without even closing the door which had been opened, she darted off, bent on following him. In the Rue Le Pique she drew near, but for fear of exciting him still more she contented herself with keeping him in sight, walking some thirty yards in the rear, without his knowing that she was behind him. On reaching the end of the Rue Le Pique, he went down the Rue Blanche again, and then proceeded by way of the Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin and the Rue de Dix Décembre, as far as the Rue de Richelieu. When she saw him turn into the last-named thoroughfare, a mortal chill came over her. He was going towards the Seine. It was the realization of the frightful fear which kept her of a night awake, full of anguish. And what could she do, good Lord? Go with him, hang upon his neck over yonder? She was now only able to stagger along, and as each step brought them nearer to the river, she felt life ebbing from her limbs. Yes, he was going straight there. He crossed the Place du Théâtre Français, then the Carousel, and finally reached the Pont des Saint-Pères. After taking a few steps along the bridge, he approached the railing overlooking the water, and at the thought that he was about to jump over, a loud cry was stifled in her contracted throat. But no, he remained motionless. Was it then only the Cité over yonder that haunted him, that heart of Paris which pursued him everywhere, which he conjured up with his fixed eyes, even through walls, and which, when he was leagues away, cried out the constant summons heard by him alone? She did not yet dare to hope. She had stopped short in the rear, watching him with giddy anxiety, ever fancying that she saw him take the terrible leap, but resisting her longing to draw nearer, for fear lest she might precipitate the catastrophe by showing herself. Oh, God, to think that she was there with her devouring passion, her bleeding motherly heart, that she was there beholding everything, without daring to risk one movement to hold him back. He stood erect, looking very tall, quite motionless, and gazing into the night. It was a winter's night, with a misty sky of sooty blackness, and was rendered extremely cold by a sharp wind blowing from the west. Paris, lighted up, had gone to sleep, showing no signs of life save such as attached to the gas-jets, those specks which scintillated and grew smaller and smaller in the distance, till they seemed but so much starry dust. The keys stretched away, showing double rows of those luminous beads, whose reverberation glimmered on the nearer frontages. On the left were the houses of the Quai du Louvre, on the right the two wings of the Institute, confused masses of monuments and buildings which became lost to view in the darkening gloom, studded with sparks. Then, between those cordons of burners, extending as far as the eye could reach, the bridges stretched bars of lights ever slighter and slighter, each formed of a train of spangles, grouped together and seemingly hanging in mid-air. And in the Seine there shone the nocturnal splendour of the animated water of cities. Each gas-jet there cast a reflection of its flame, like the nucleus of a comet extending into a tail. The nearer ones, mingling together, set the current on fire with broad, regular, symmetrical fans of light, glowing like live embers, while the more distant ones, seen under the bridges, were but little motionless sparks of fire. But the large burning tails appeared to be animated. They waggled as they spread out, all black and gold, 
with a constant twirling of scales in which one divined the flow of the water. The whole Seine was lighted up by them, as if some fete were being given in its depths, some mysterious fairy-like entertainment at which couples were waltzing beneath the river's red flashing window-panes. High above those fires, above the starry keys, the sky, in which not a planet was visible, showed a ruddy mass of vapour, that warm, phosphorescent exhalation which every night, above the sleep of the city, seems to set the crater of a volcano. The wind blew hard, and Christine, shivering, her eyes full of tears, felt the bridge move under her, as if it were bearing her away amid a smash-up of the whole scene. Had not Claude moved? Was he not climbing over the rail? No, everything became motionless again, and she saw him still on the same spot, obstinately stiff, with his eyes turned towards the point of the Cité, which he could not see. It had summoned him, and he had come, and yet he could not see it in the depths of the darkness. He could only distinguish the bridges with their light framework standing out blackly against the sparkling water. But farther off everything became confused. The island had disappeared. He could not even have told its exact situation if some belated cabs had not passed from time to time over the Pont Neuf, with their lamps showing like those shooting sparks which dart at times through embers. A red lantern, on a level with the dam of the mint, cast a streamlet of blood, as it were, into the water. Something huge and lugubrious, some drifting form, no doubt a lighter which had become unmoored, slowly descended the stream amid the reflections. Espied for a moment, it was immediately afterwards lost in the darkness. Where had the triumphal island sunk? In the depths of that flow of water? Claude still gazed, gradually fascinated by the great rushing of the river in the night. He leant over its broad bed, chilly like an abyss in which the mysterious flames were dancing, and the loud, sad wail of the current attracted him, and he listened to its call, despairing unto death. By a shooting pain at her heart, Christine this time realized that the terrible thought had just occurred to him. She held out her quivering hands which the wind was lashing, but Claude remained there, struggling against the sweetness of death. Indeed, he did not move for another hour. He lingered there, unconscious of the lapse of time, with his eyes still turned in the direction of the Cité, as if by a miracle of power they were about to create light and conjure up the island so that he might behold it. When Claude at last left the bridge, with stumbling steps, Christine had to pass in front and run in order to be home in the Rue Tourlac before him. End of chapter 11